Live coverage through the night here on BBC One, Hugh Edwards brings us the 2022 local election results. In all four nations of the United Kingdom, the polling stations have been relatively busy and soon we'll have the voters' verdict. It's the biggest test of public opinion before the next general election, so stay with us for the results. Boris Johnson voting in Westminster today with the family dog Dylan has had a testing time with Partygate. The war in Ukraine, of course, the Covid crisis. Does he still have the voters' trust? Does he still have that winning touch? Sakia Starmer voting in North London today became Labour leader by promising to rebuild the party after the Corbyn years. Last year's council elections were disappointing for Labour, so he needs a stronger showing this year. First Minister of Scotland voting in Glasgow today. The votes will be counted tomorrow in local elections in Scotland and Wales, and the results should be a valuable guide to the state of the parties there. Tomorrow, too, will bring the verdict of voters in Northern Ireland, where Sinn Féin are hoping to top the poll for the first time in history giving them the power to nominate a First Minister at Stormont. All that is tomorrow, as I said. Tonight, we have thousands of council seats being fought in England, and dozens of local authorities. And the counting is already underway, and we have reporters at all the key contests. And we'll be looking in more detail at the results with my colleague, Rita Chakrabarti. And I'm here at the touch screen, bringing you all the numbers and results that matter and what they mean. Election night would not be complete without our night with the numbers. Professor Sir John Curtis who will be ready as ever with his analysis of the results as they come in. And here in the studio, the BBC's Laura Kinsberg to help us understand what the results mean for the party leaders and their teams. We also have the good company of guests from the political parties here in the studio uh, and at counting centres throughout the UK. We're all standing by for the voters' verdict. So stay with us for election night 2022 on the BBC. Yes, good evening from the BBC's election studio here at uh, New Broadcasting House in London. This will be our base overnight and for much of tomorrow indeed, uh, as we keep tabs on the results coming in from counting centres in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Tonight's results, as I said, all from England. We'll be asking what's been on voters' minds, maybe the cost of living crisis, on a day when the Bank of England raised interest rates again and warned of a possible recession. Maybe it's the Partygate controversy. And to what extent has Sir Keir Starmer turned around Labour's fortunes? Stakes are high for all the party leaders. Laura is here with me, Laura Ginsberg. What's at stake? Well, a huge amount and different things in different parts of the country and different challenges for the different party leaders. There's no question about that. And we should say from the outset as well, an election night like this is a real patchwork. And because they're local elections, not a big general election, we have to be careful and cautious about drawing massive conclusions from it. But there are two central tests in the big tussle between our two big political parties, the Conservatives and Labour. First off, for the governing party, the Conservatives, it's the first time that voters have a chance to have their say, a real say, not just focus groups or polling, but a real say on their faith in the Prime Minister after months of allegations about what happened in Downing Street in, during the pandemic. Whether tonight you're watching and you think that's trivial or frippery or silly or not, or whether you think it's very serious, tonight is important because it represents the first real test of that. But in a much bigger sense, the whether or not people in the country show faith in the government to cope with something much more serious, that mm. cost of living crisis that you referenced, inflation perhaps moving to 10%, warnings of recession from the Bank of England today, these big, big troubling backdrop that is going to be with us sadly in our politics for a long time. Second then turning to Keir Starmer, Labour's been ahead in the polls fairly consistently, but does that theoretical lead actually translate into a big leap forward for him, not just piling up votes in urban parts of the country, but in parts, particularly of England, as we'll see overnight, where Labour has to look like they're making big strides forward to be competitive at a general election. And there are some of Keir Starmer's critics inside the Labour Party 
and plenty of them outside the Labour Party who would say in his time in charge, yes, he's shown progress. Yes, he's done a lot to try to repair the Labour Party since Jeremy Corbyn and that terrible election defeat of 2019. But has he shown the country that he could be a really transformative leader with the capability to overturn a Tory majority that is so huge? He's got to be able to climb a mountain. And tonight will be a bit of a verdict about whether or not he's really got the kind of secret sauce to make that kind of transformation. But just remember, people watching tonight are voting on all sorts of things. The bins, the quality of care for the elderly, they're not just giving their thoughts on what's happening in the big, big political picture at Westminster. Let's hold those thoughts and we'll bring our guests in in a second, because uh, I think it's useful for all of us and certainly for all of us watching. Um, to just to remind ourselves of the context, uh, you know, what is at stake in terms of councils and seats? So let's join Rita to explain a little more about that. Hugh, this is how the main parties are starting the night. These are the seats that they are defending. And a quick look at this shows you that Labour is defending half as many seats more than the Conservatives. And that is because these elections are being fought in very Labour-y areas. Uh, a lot of the seats up tonight are in London, um, where they're having all-out elections. All 32 boroughs are having elections. But there are also elections in Leeds, in Manchester, in Birmingham, in the big cities uh, which are which is where Labour is strong. So that is why you are seeing a higher figure here for Labour than the Conservatives. Uh, the Liberal Democrats defending over 600 seats, uh, the Scottish National Party and Plaid, uh, several hundred seats between them. And there are all out elections in Scotland and in Wales too. And the Greens also defending 72 seats. There's one other screen I'd like to show you, which is useful right at the beginning of the night. Now, this is the projected national share. So that is what we have projected would have happened in each of these election years if the whole country had been voting. So you can see last year in 2021, Labour came seven points behind the Conservatives. Uh, they had a pretty poor night of it. But we're actually more interested, for the sake of England, in 2018, because that's when the seats that are up tonight were last voted on. And there you can see that Labour and the Conservatives were neck and neck. Now in Scotland and Wales, the seats were last voted on in 2017 and a much bigger gap there between Labour and the Conservatives. What does this mean? Well, it means that Labour has to have a much stronger performance in England in order to show that it's going forward than it does in Scotland or in Wales. Rita, many thanks. We'll be back for some more detail with uh, Rita in a moment. We're going to be talking about lots of key contests, clearly. One of them is in Sunderland, uh, what, where is a, you know, we're seeing a bit of an interesting challenge there for Labour in terms of the challenges faced from the Conservatives and the Lib Dems there locally. And Richard Moss uh, is our correspondent uh, in uh, Sunderland. Richard, I know there are some wards in already, but what can you tell us about the state of play? We can hear a big cheer down there where the Liberal Democrats have just gained a seat from Labour in a ward here. Uh, and that was the first time that the seats changed. We've got eight seats in now. I think we're just about to get a ninth declared. And Labour have held five. Conservatives have held two. But Liberal Democrats have just taken one from Labour. Now, the situation for Labour here is fragile. If they lose six seats, they lose control of a council they've had control of since 1974. And on previous results in the last few years, that could easily happen. But they were hoping this year that they would uh, stop hemorrhaging seats here effectively and perhaps even begin to claw some back. But the results have been okay so far for them, but obviously that loss to the Liberal Democrats is worrying and they also failed to take back a seat from the Conservatives. The Conservative group leader here won his seat and if they were having a good night Labour, they might have hoped to take that. So at the moment it's a kind of mixed picture here. Uh, the key seats may well be in Washington South, where the Labour leader of the council, Graham Miller, is up. The Conservatives have targeted that even Boris Johnson came to campaign in that ward on Bank Holiday Monday. That's the one the Conservatives have thrown everything at. And even if they can't remove control from Labour tonight, if Labour lo don't lose overall control, they'd be hoping they can at least take the leader out. Crucial council, I suppose, because, of course, Labour have struggled in the North East in the last few elections. The sort of contagion has spread down from Teesside, or spread up rather, from Teesside through County Durham and into Sunderland a bit, and they were hoping to stop that tonight. At the moment, they've done okay, but that loss of the seat to the Liberal Democrats will worry them. Just in terms of what they're saying to you uh, tonight, uh, Richard, what have you picked up from the parties in terms of their own instincts? 
But I don't think they know, to be quite honest at the moment. There's been a few worried Labour faces, particularly around the Washington South desks where the votes are being counted for their leader Graham Miller because the, the feeling is the Conservatives have really pushed hard there. They maybe don't think they've got a chance of gaining many seats but they think that one would be a really high profile one to get rid of the Labour Council leader. Um, so I think Labour are feeling perhaps that you know it's, the Conservative vote certainly hasn't collapsed here which was the fear the Conservative group here had a few weeks ago when Partygate, the, the Conservative group leader Anthony Mullen who held his seat in the end you know, he called for Boris Johnson's resignation and you know, that was part of real concern that you know, what had happened at Westminster would spread into somewhere like Sunderland and Conservative voters would stay away or switch. Well that doesn't seem to have happened in huge numbers at the moment uh, and that will worry Labour because obviously there are, there are other seats where they could lose to the Conservatives, there are seats where they could lose to the Liberal Democrats and that fragile majority could be under threat. But they will hope they can do enough tonight to at least hold control of this council. It is possible if things are bad that we might not know tonight because there is one ward that isn't going to be counted this evening because the, the it's been postponed effectively the election because the UKIP candidate, the one UKIP candidate in the city, died after nominations were closed. So that will have to be counted at a later date. Labour will be hoping they won't have to rely on that recount to hold control of this council. Richard, thanks very much again. Um, good to have that. Uh early intelligence there from Sunderland, Richard Moss uh, at the count there for us. Um, well, with its low council tax, Wandsworth in London has been a bit of a flagship Conservative borough, well, since 1978. Now, back in 1990, the Conservative Party chairman at that time, Kenneth Baker, famously dismissed a poor local election performance by singling out what happened in Wandsworth. He used Wandsworth, if you like, as a kind of symbol for success where there hadn't been a lot of success elsewhere. Um, I can remember it because uh, I was there. Can I just confirm before I say anything else that the final result here is through. Um, it's 48-13 to the Conservatives, uh, a trouncing for Labour, a very, very disappointing night for them. 30-31 to 31 was the, the old council, it's now 48-13, to 13, a majority of 35 to the Conservatives. Um, the Conservatives have gained 17 seats, Labour have lost the 17. What uh, you are also seeing uh, are some quite spectacular Conservative gains. There's been a Conservative landslide in Wandsworth and uh, in London we're picking up seats in Brent. I gather that of all the ones that have been announced so far we've won them. Uh, and in other parts in London where the message very clearly has got home that Conservative councils cost you less and Labour councils cost you more, we're doing well. Kenneth Baker, who later Lord Baker, who was the party chairman at the time, who, by the way, and this is a good sobering thought for lots of people if they're getting excited about that clip, um, he used that as well as, as a kind of proof, he said, that the poll tax was uh, not half as unpopular as people said it was, and we know how that uh, turned out. Um, so um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, Wandsworth is a very important result in symbolic terms, whatever it is. Um, because, of course, the Conservatives have really made a big issue of lower council tax while they say maintaining services. So that's been the kind of, they say, winning formula for them. Uh, Charlotte Rose is our correspondent at Wandsworth, um, which looks rather familiar. It hasn't changed at all, actually, Charlotte, if I see the, uh, the hall there. Um, so tell us what's the latest state of play there. Hi, Hugh. Well, I think they might have given it a, a little lick of paint since 1990, but maybe not much more than that. As you can see behind me, counting is well underway already here, and it's a very busy and noisy council hall. And if you look just right over into the corner over there, that is Nine Elms Ward. It is the newest and smallest of all of the wards here because it was a development of 20,000 new homes spearheaded by this Conservative Council. We expect that ward to declare in around an hour's time. But what of the rest of the council because as you say this is a top Labour target in London uh, and that is for both pragmatic and also the symbolic reasons that you mentioned. The pragmatic reasons are that when this election was last fought back in 2018 the Conservatives had a majority of six seats but since then there's been a boundary change which has taken that down to a majority of only around three seats so Labour think they could do well here. They also won the popular vote in the 2018 election and 
and they also hold all three of the parliamentary seats in this borough. Uh, but what of their performance in this campaign? We were being told earlier by both sides that they thought turnout was low and it could be on a knife edge. But in the past few minutes, the BBC has heard from a, conserv a senior Conservative source in Wandsworth saying that they believe they have lost control of the council tonight. They say they think that their voters have not come out uh, to these polls and that Labour's have. They say that there is quite a lot of unhappiness and that's both to do with Partygate and the national picture. They say it's a general sense of the mid-term blues. So we're hearing that in the last few minutes but clearly we are very early on in the night and it's too close to call anything. But it's interesting to look at what's been happening during this campaign because both sides have been sending some of their big hitters here. Nadim Zahawi, the Education Secretary, was here campaigning this morning. Angela Rayner, the Deputy Labour Leader, has also been here to today. Um, interesting to look at some of the literature which has been going through people's letterboxes. The Conservatives have been branding themselves as the local Conservatives and they've been using green leaflets rather than the traditional blue ones and um, perhaps to try and distance themselves from some of that baggage of the National Party despite the fact that of course we are only five miles away from Westminster here so it's difficult to create that much dis distance. We also know from Labour's perspective that they did have concerns about how the vote was going earlier today. They put out a call to all of their activists around London saying, if you're free, please, can you come and help in Wandsworth and in another borough uh, in Croydon? Because they said you could help tip the balance. Um, so that's where we are at the moment, with both sides sort of playing down expectations, but a senior Conservative source now saying that they are concerned that they have lost control of the council here. Very interesting. Uh, Charlotte, thanks very much. Um, and uh, we'll be back to you, of course, if there's uh, another set of uh, results which uh, gives us a more powerful signal of what's going on there. Um, I'm going to bring in my studio guests in a second. You're being very patient, OK, both of you. Um, but I want to bring in uh, Brandon Lewis, who's the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, who's waiting for us uh, there in Belfast, uh, former party chairman for the Conservatives. Um, uh, Secretary of State, thanks for, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, what would it mean for you if... Wandsworth is lost to the Conservatives? Well, losing any council, losing any councillors. As you say, I was, uh, I've been chairman of the party. I've also been a councillor and a council leader. And losing any councillor from the family who has worked hard for the community is, is a loss. And it's something we all feel. And I'm sure uh, opposition parties will say the same about their councillors. But as, you're, um, as was just outlined in the piece, I just heard the piece uh, that, that you were running just now, uh, the reality in, in Wandsworth is it is actually quite a tight majority in terms of seats. There's less than 200 votes, roughly, in who controls Wandsworth and obviously the MPs in that area are Labour. So it is a tough area, particularly for this set of elections. Um, bear in mind the backdrop of coming into these elections where Labour have been consistently ahead in the polls and expecting to have huge gains across London and actually more generally as well. Um, Mr Lewis, uh, Laura wants to come in here. Um, but Mr Lewis, I mean, Theresa May managed to hold Wandsworth at her very lowest ebb in 2018. Um, there's suggestions tonight from Conservative sources that you're also on course to lose Barnet, another London council. There are doubts as well even about Westminster Council. I've been told there are heavy losses in Kensington and Chelsea. I mean, in the big picture, and we're very early in the night, but how concerned are you about losing a lot in London and the South East? Well, actually, a couple of things I'd say, Tad, or you're, you're absolutely, I was chairman in those two, as I said, in 2018. So I would slightly contest whether that was the lowest ebb uh, in terms of where we were. We're actually, I think, in a, a reasonable place in polling at that point. Uh, quite different to where we are now with Labour having a consistent lead um, in the polls as we came into these elections. And as I say, we've also got to be very clear that Labour expecting and the pollsters have been predicting Labour being winning 800 plus seats. Uh, Ed Miliband won over 800 seats before the 2015 uh, general election as well. So uh, London is going to be a difficult set of elections for us. We, we, we know that. We've got councils like Barnet, which we have held in the past by just one. I remember when we sort of took it back from Labour after a brief uh, change over to Labour because of a councillor uh, leaving the council um, by just one seat. And as the same ones with, there's less than 200 votes between us or Labour being in control even last time it was up. So there are very tight margins in some of these seats and this is a difficult set of elections for us. There's no getting away from that. When you saw the uh, leaflet there, which was uh, in Wandsworth, uh, most of it in green, uh, saying local Conservatives, a clear attempt to 
uh, distance the party from uh, the kind of Westminster setup. Um, is that for you a comment on the leadership? And do you take that to be a rather bad sign from experienced local campaigners who know exactly what's going to damage them locally? And for that reason, they don't want Boris Johnson anywhere near that leaflet. Is that how you read it? Well, first of all, actually, I can't see the leaflet. I can't see you, you guys in the studio. So um, I, I, I'm going to what you've described. But look, I, I have to say, Wandsworth is a council that I think has been known. And I think everybody's very clear it's a Conservative council. I don't think anybody's getting away from it. It's a council we've been proud of because it has delivered such good services for people at very, very low council tax. And very prominent Conservative ministers and activists have been in Wandsworth campaigning as we do across the country. So I don't think anybody's uh, going to be under any misapprehension that that is and has been a Conservative council. It's one that like every council we control, it's one we're very proud of and the councillors who work there. I have to say, look, I've been around the country over the last few weeks campaigning in a whole range of different areas uh, from the, from London and the South East and East Anglia right the way through the Midlands, North East, North West. Uh, people have been very focused on local issues and I have to say, I've seen some really positive reactions on the doorsteps. I do think we'll see some differentials around the country in terms of, uh, of the results we'll see and I think we may well see some new Conservative councillors as well as um, councils where we will lose some very, very good colleagues that we're all going to miss. But just to spell out the obvious, Brandon, Partygate, for example, will not be playing well for lots of your campaigners. They've told us that over the last few weeks. Now, do you expect that to be a telling factor or not? Oh, well, I've got to, I can only go on what I've seen on the doorstep. And I have to say, Hugh, quite genuinely on the doorstep, that's not been an issue that's come up time and again for me, actually very, very rarely. Uh, just last week, I will say, particularly when I was in the North East, actually, on a few doorsteps, people were getting really frustrated uh, with what they were seeing around Keir Starmer's positioning and failing to be able to really answer what was going on in that situation in Durham. But actually on doorsteps, I've got to say, most people were focused on uh, their local issues and, and in particular areas I was at that point, looking to actually have Conservatives replacing Labour councillors. So uh, that's what I found on the doorsteps. And I, as I say, I think we will see, as we often do in elections, particularly in midterm elections, some differentials across the country. But we're 12 years into a Conservative government in the middle of a parliament at a difficult period where Labour have had a lead in the polls. So uh, this, is this is a difficult time for us and a difficult set of elections. If you even just look at the councils that are up this year, they're ones where Labour generally tends to do better anyway. And on a day when the Bank of England is raising interest rates, inflation heading for 10 percent, possible recession around the corner, you must have been coming across people who were extremely concerned about the direction of the economy as well. And one of the messages that we've been, I think it's been important for us to outline to people is the package of work that we've been able to put in, the package of support that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have been able to put in place for people because of the decisions we've been able to make and the work we've done for the economy to allow us to put that £22 billion pound package of support in place and recognising that there are challenges that we want to help people with and grow the economy so we can deal with these challenges in the future. And we're in a good place comparatively economically with other countries around the world. Uh, but we, we, these are issues that we are alert to. We want to deal with them and explaining that to residents on doorsteps. And I, that is something you're quite right. That I think people are very focused on in terms of wanting to know they've got a good government that can take us through that period in a positive way. And that's what we've got with a Conservative government led by Boris Johnson. Um, I, I know you need to go, Secretary of State. I just want one more question, which clearly is to do with your own duties as Secretary of State. Uh, the votes will be counted in Northern Ireland tomorrow. It's clearly a very, very important election. Uh, not least in terms of the future stewardship of the assembly there and the administration. Um, what's at stake? Well, we'll probably have the results on Saturday, probably Saturday afternoon, because the transferable vote system, counting, as you say, who does start tomorrow, but it'll take some time. So we'll go through to Saturday, I would imagine, at the very least. Uh, look, the reality is here, whoever is in a position to be first and deputy first minister. I look forward to working with them. We as a government want to work with them for the executive. Uh, all parties who are in that position should be nominating and we will be encouraging them to do so. I've been talking to party leaders this week and obviously will be over the next few days. We want to see the executive fully up and running. Obviously the assembly continues and the ministers can take their places because of the changes that were agreed with the parties in the new decade, new approach deal that brought Stormont back a, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but actually, we want to get that first and deputy first minister nominated. The people in Northern Ireland voted. We're Democrats. We have to respect that decision. Um, and whoever it is in, as first and deputy first minister, I look forward to working with them to deliver for people in Northern Ireland. Uh, Brandon Lewis, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, maybe we'll talk again uh, tomorrow when uh, the picture's a bit clearer. But thanks very much indeed. Uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland there.
Um, well, David Lamy has been very patient, and uh, so has uh, Michelle Donnellan, who's the university's minister for the Conservatives. Um, Labour, the test for Labour tonight is what, David? We've got to do considerably better than we did in 2019, when we had a disastrous election. Uh, not really since the war have we seen Labour falling so low. The Tories, of course, have a massive majority. We'll be looking by this time, uh, well, tomorrow afternoon, to see what our share of the vote is compared to that 2019 figure. It's important to recognise that in 2018, Theresa May was at ha her lowest point, really, after losing a general election at a very low ebb in Brexit negotiations. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn what is it, what is it, was at his highest point uh, at that point uh, in the cycle, and we did very well. We've got 50% of the, of the seats up today. So any progress for us is making gains tonight. I expect we will make gains tonight. I've been knocking on doors today right across London. The feeling was good. I've got to say there were a lot of undecided voters that seem to be coming over to us. So I think the picture is good in London, but of course we'll be looking right across the country, seats in the south and of course in the north to get the overall picture. All right. Yeah, I think Labour's going to have to be doing better than just a few gains. I know that's not quite what you said, but you're going to have to be gaining staggering amounts, potentially you know, 800, like Electoral Calculus said, uh, for it even to be it's credible for Keir's leadership. 800 would be quite an earthquake. Well, 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 you say that. Ed Miliband won mm -hmm. 800. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Thatcher, in between uh, landslide elections, lost, thousand, uh, lost over 1,000. Tony Blair lost over 1,000 in between landslide elections. So if this is Labour's comeback, they should be winning just like those kinds of amounts. And to, to downplay it like David is doing um, makes me question. That, that, if, if, if you end up losing a council like Wandsworth or even Barnet or Westminster, what will that say about your position? Well, I think losing any council will those be... those particularly? Yeah, well, well, I think losing any council mm. will be very worrying. You know, we have some excellent councillors, including in those councils mm -hmm. that you've, you've referenced. We know that Wandsworth deliver more for less. So, of course, we want to keep that. I'm hopeful that we will keep that. We'll see what happens as the night progresses. But I do think we can overplay the importance of individual councils for the national picture. Every councillor works really hard for their local area, especially the Conservative ones, and we want to retain as many as possible tonight. I've got to tell you that if we made gains of 200, it would be the best results for Labour for over a decade. I don't know where the 800 figures come from, but it's total hogwash. No one expects gains like that tonight, not on the backdrop where we've got 50% of the seats already. Well, that would indeed be a very surprising result. There's no question about that. That was very much the outside of polling expectation for Labour. But I think, David Lammy, though, it's very important for our viewers to understand the last time these seats were contested in 2018, that is really the benchmark that we're looking looking at. Now, I understand, well, I think we're going to hear this a lot from Labour politicians in the next 24 hours, that you want to make the comparison between the share in 2019, which was an electoral disaster for the Labour Party. Don't you have to be showing more progress than that? If that's your aspiration, that's a very low bar, isn't it? Look, uh, Keir Starmer has turned around our party. I, I was knocking on doors in Barnet today and there were Jewish voters coming back to Labour. That's a demonstration of the leadership we've seen from Keir Starmer. Of course, the 2018 barometer is hugely important, but so is what happened after 2018, which is that we fell through the floor. And today is the turnaround moment for the Labour Party. It's the moment where people can look and see demonstrable progress. That is where we'll be, I predict. And you by said 200 this, by the would be something tomorrow. you would want. No, no, I said, I said there on the 800 figure. That's, yeah, but that's, then you mentioned 200. Is that any what you're gain, you are Any, any gain tonight would be progress. If we, if we had 200 <laughs> seats, Ten, that would be the best we've had for ten we're years. In we're in ten between years. two general ten elections. Years. Every and it, you're it, set every to lose governing. Wandsworth, Barnet. You're you're set for a very bad night, and you know that cost of living uh, and party gate were coming up on the doorstep time after time. This is well, not they, well, they weren't. That wasn't my own experience. That's but, my experience. Well, but we are in government, and we are in between two general elections. Mid-term go incumbent governments typically don't do that well. So you're saying that just to make some gains would be a good thing? Clearly. Well, the we, expectation is very low then uh, for the Labour Party. Clearly, clearly. Given that we have 
50% of the seats and we did so well in 2018. Any gains for us is progress. Uh, and I think that by tomorrow afternoon, we will see a picture across the country and certainly here in London where Labour are back. And that is the turnaround election. It's us being back in the game. The country haven't forgiven us for a very sorry performance in 2019. Interestingly, um, when we talk about Labour's performance, uh, Labour's performance in London has been traditionally very strong uh, and the challenge has been seen to be outside London. Mm -hmm. So would it not be more fair for us to be saying to viewers tonight, well, you need to be focusing probably on Labour's performance outside in those areas where you lost traditional areas to the Conservatives, certainly at the last general election. Those are the real test areas for you not the big London councils where, you know, London is seen to be a Labour city anyway. Well, look, it's true. A, a lion's share of the seats up tonight are in London. But of course, we've got to look at the picture across the country. Uh, and that's actually not just in the tr traditional so-called Red Wall areas. It's also in the South and the South East. Uh, and I'll be looking to see what those results look like in places like Worthing. Mm. And the North. And the north. Well, that's the red wall. That's what we said. <laughs> yeah. So let's yeah. see. But this is going to be one of the interesting dynamics, isn't it? Because in a sense, both of these big parties are fighting in two directions. So the Tories want to try to keep their what's sometimes called the blue wall. They're more affluent voters in the southeast and parts of the southwest. It looks like they might have a challenge there from the Lib Dems in some parts. Mm -hmm. And some Conservative MPs are very, very nervous about that. But it, their vote might be stickier in parts of the north of England, and they, they almost have, you almost have the opposite problems from each other. <laughs> we'll bring in uh, um, the, the Liberal Democrats in a second, um, because we want their perspective at this uh, early stage of the night as well. We talked to a colleague in Sunderland, first of all, uh, earlier tonight, and we were talking there about the uh, ability of Labour, if you like, to withstand the challenge in an area where they've been traditionally strong, certainly since the back to the 70s, really. Um, well, more results have come in, so let's join Rita. Yes, they're nearly there in Sunderland. The winning post is 38 seats uh, and they've counted 17 out of 24. And as you can see, Labour is on 36 seats, so it's two off uh, retaining Sunderland. It has been a council that has been in Labour hands, as you said, Hugh, since the 1970s, but its support there has been whittled away in the last few years. Uh, in 2016, its majority was 59. Last year, that was cut to 11. So, you know, uh, still um, quite some tension there. So this is how things stand at the moment. I just want to take you to another screen which shows you the share share change since 2018 so that is since last time these seats were fought and as you can see Labour has slipped back a little bit uh, the independents have slipped back there in Sunderland as well and uh, the parties benefiting have been mainly the Liberal Democrats but also the Greens and the con Conservatives a smidgen. Rita many thanks um, what do you make of uh, Labour's performance there David? Well, I mean, let's wait to see where we end up. Um, on those figures, we, we could hold Sunderland. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no doubt about it, the Conservatives threw a lot at it. Um, Johnson was in the council leader's seat, um, campaigning pretty hard. Uh, let's see where we end up. Uh, I suppose there'll be viewers watching thinking, gosh, you know, here's David Lammy, who's a very experienced Labour campaigner, saying, well, it looks as if we're going to hold on to Sunderland, um, which for lots of people would be, you know, a, a remarkable thing to be saying, given that Sunderland is uh, really in the vanguard of the Labour tradition and has been for 50 plus years. So you could expect maybe a much more robust performance there. Am I being unfair? Hugh, I think we've got to acknowledge that there was a massive redrawing of the map just two years ago in in. In, 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 the, in the general election at the end of 2019. Uh, and clearly we did lose tracks of the Northeast, um, uh, parts of the Midlands uh, and parts of the Northwest. Uh, that's the so-called Red Wall. We've got a fight back on our hands. We recognize that we're two years uh, in. Uh, and of course we are fighting for every single council seat in every single ward. Let's see where we end up in, in, in Sunderland 
on those figures, it looks like we might just hold Sunderland. I'm pleased about that. Mm -hmm. We've got to look at the overall picture across the country. OK, well, it was interesting, wasn't it, to see that uh, the Lib Dems were gaining modestly about 2% there in Sunderland. Let's talk a little more about the Lib Dem performance. And uh, the Lib Dem MP, uh, Sarah Olney, is uh, waiting patiently to talk to us. Thanks very much, Sarah, um, for, for, for waiting there. Um, can I ask you, what are your realistic expectations tonight? Um, well, we're feeling, I would say, cautiously optimistic about making some steady progress, particularly in some of our blue wall seats uh, that we are, you know, particularly interested in, in our, some of our target uh, parliamentary seats. Um, we've had a really good campaign. Uh, it, we've, you know, ha working really, really hard across the country. Uh, obviously, the blue wall seats and seats like mine in, in Richmond and in Kingston, but fantastic to hear about that great result uh, that's just come through from Sunderland as well, which just goes to show that, you know, we are making gains across the country. And so we're feeling cautiously optimistic about uh, a reasonably good night. Um, for viewers who don't understand what you mean by looking at blue wall seats, <laughs> what, what, how would you describe that? Well, I think what we're really interested in is some of these seats across the south uh, and the southwest where Tories have traditionally been quite strong, but we've seen, um, particularly in places like Chesham and Amersham, which, as you know, we won uh, in a really uh, unexpected by-election victory last year, what we were seeing was traditional Tory voters are really, really disillusioned with Boris Johnson's government. Uh, it's not just the Partygate uh, revelations, which obviously have you know, all happened since uh, Chesham and Amersham. Uh, it goes back quite a long way. Um, many, many different things that people are upset with the government about. I mean, a lot of these people voted Remain in 20. 2016, but they don't like what they've heard from, from Boris Johnson and his government. They don't like Partygate. They didn't like the Owen Paterson affair. There's so many th other things that have been going on that they just feel really uncomfortable with. This is not the Conservative Party that they recognise, and they want the opportunity to vote for a party that takes them seriously, that listens to their concerns, that, uh, you know, a party of local champions who really want to stand up for their local residents. Uh, are you looking to just, um, I'm not saying just, but to, <laughs> to, to boost your performance in areas where you've traditionally done well, or are you looking to gain actual uh, control of more councils? Because that clearly is really the name of the game, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're looking to do both, uh, to be honest. I've been out in Kingston and Richmond. Uh, my seat covers both, uh, both of those local authorities, and it's feeling really good there. We, had, we won control of both of those in 2018. Um, we're, we're feeling quite we're reasonably comfortable that we've, held, uh, that we've uh, maintained control of Kingston, and I think we're looking at quite uh, a good night in, in Richmond as well, too early to say, but it's feeling very good on the doorsteps uh, in my part of the world. But, you know, we're working hard right across the country. Uh, we'll be looking quite closely at what happens in Hull uh, and in Somerset uh, and in Westmoreland and Furness, which is a new uh, unitary authority. Um, and, we, you know, we've, we're, we're looking to, to make some progress in, in, in those places. Um, Sarah, it's Laura here. I mean, a, a bit like David Lammy and Michelle Donnellan with us in the studio. You, though, also as a party are, in a way, geographically at least, trying to face two ways. You mentioned Hull there, where I know you feel slightly optimistic, but you said you were making great gains in Sunderland. Sunderland. Actually, the Lib Dems have only taken one seat so far. Do you have real hope of making inroads in the north of England or really, if you're being <laughs> candid with our viewers, is the southwest and the southeast your hope? Um, I think, you know, to be realistic, you know, when I say great gains, I, I meant that was a great gain and we're very uh, pleased about it. But I mean, we're not looking, I don't think, to make uh, necessarily huge strides. But I mean, I think the point is we've been making we're making gains across the country in all, si in all types of seats, in, in urban seats, in rural seats, in seats in the northeast and seats in the southwest. So, uh, you know, we've got lots, lots of different uh, um, as, um, places that we're looking to, to make some progress in. But, but more realistically, and also as a smaller party, you know, your resources are, are, are limited. You have to think about having laser target. If you're being really candid about it, are you looking for the next Chesham and Amersham? Are you looking for those parts of the world where the Tories are your rivals rather than the Labour Party? Um, Yes, I think that's probably fair. A lot of our targets at the next general election are, are Tory seats. And certainly what we're really picking up on, as I said before, is massive disillusionment with the Tory government. And people are looking again at the Liberal Democrats and they see in us, uh, you know, a, a party that is, is committed to standing up for, for local people. Um, and that's something that is, is, is drawing their interest. So certainly we think that that's, uh, uh, those parts of the country are, are definitely parts of the country that we're interested in. <laughs> Well, Sarah, thanks very much, and uh, we'll see how things pan out in the next few hours. But uh, Sarah, only there for us with the uh, 
uh, for the Lib Dems. In a moment, we'll go to Derby and we'll talk to our correspondent there, Georgina Roberts. But we're going to go to Bolton, first of all. Uh, and uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick is in uh, Bolton for us. Um, Kevin, give us an update on uh, how things look in Bolton. Yes, Hugh, it's a really interesting council election. This Bolton is the only Conservative-led borough in Greater Manchester. Ten boroughs in this area, all the rest of them are led by Labour, of course. We've got uh, a high-profile Labour mayor in Andy Burnham overseeing this area as well. Bolton have led this as a minority administration since 2018, relying on a rainbow coalition of every party except Labour to manage to get an administration together and to get things done. Tories currently have have uh, a lead of three over Labour, they're the largest party by three, but Labour have been nipping at their heels for the last couple of, of years now. So if the Conservatives can hold on to that lead and they're talking up the chances of actually making some gains tonight, that would be seen as a real success for them. Obviously, from Labour's point of view, this is one that they really want to win, really want to try and get back, even if they can't win a majority and take control. The other interesting thing about Bolton is the power, the influence of smaller parties and independents. They make up unusually more than a third of the councillors in Bolton. So whoever ends up as the largest party, they could well end up being the kingmaker. Some real key interesting seats, which is a three-way battle between Labour, the Tories and one of these smaller, more recently set up independent parties and how those key seats pan out will probably determine where we end up tonight. We're expecting to know how things stand after two o'clock, but because no one's going to have uh, an outright majority or oh, that's incredibly unlikely at this stage. There will be some politicking over the next few days at least to try and establish who's going to be in charge and how they're going to come together to try and make up an administration that can get things done. Kevin, that's very useful. Thank you very much. Kevin Fitzpatrick there for us uh, uh, with the latest in Bolton and uh, that's certainly an interesting battle. Um, a quick update again on Sunderland. Let's uh, join Rita once again to tell us uh, exactly what's going on there. Rita, I think we've passed the a winning post. Yes, indeed, Hugh. Uh, here you have it. Uh, Labour has held on to Sunderland. It's passed the 38 seats that it, well, it's got the 38 seats that it needed to get to hang on to Sunderland. They are still counting. As you can see, there are three seats still to be counted. Uh, so the majority is still unclear. Let's take a look and see what's changed. Um, just, uh, so Labour's actually lost a seat. The Conservatives have lost a seat. Uh, Lib Dems have gained another one. Sarah Olney would be pleased with that. Um, this is the share of the vote so far. But as I say, we don't yet have a complete picture. Labour on 43, Conservatives on 30, um, and uh, the Lib Dems on 18. And uh, this is the change in the share of the vote. Now, that is interesting, isn't it? Because although Labour has hung on to Sunderland, its share of the vote has gone down by uh, three percentage points since the last time. Um, I want to show you one more screen here, which is the share change since 2018 in two different um, areas within Sunderland Local Authority. And you can see that in Sunderland Central, Labour and the Conservatives have gone backwards, but the Lib Dems have gained by six percentage points. Whereas in Sunderland West, there's a different, uh, different complexion with Labour and the Lib Dems going backwards, but the Conservatives surging ahead with six percentage points. So very different um, political activity going on in these two areas. Rita, thanks very much. Um, David, you know, you were doing the victory sign um, because uh, you know, uh, you, you've held on to the council there. Um, I'm bound to say, you know, if you look at the comparison with the uh, baseline that we were discussing earlier, um, you're down 3% in terms of your performance, despite, you know, the fact you, you held on to the council. Why would that be something to celebrate at this point in a parliament against the Prime Minister who's been widely criticised for kinds of things, including dishonesty and all the rest of it. Um, you've got a cost of living crisis and you've had the Partygate scandal rolling on. You shouldn't be losing anything like 3% in a place like that, surely. <laughs> 
Hugh. <laughs> but 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 what's what's Hugh. wrong with that? Hugh, we've won Sunderland. Uh, there were suggestions that we might be losing Sunderland. We got a forty. 40- Three percent share mm-hmm. of the vote. Mm-hmm. If we get a forty-three percent share of the vote across the country, yeah. you're talking to the next foreign secretary. Mm-hmm. I'll be a very, very happy man. Um, look, uh, it looks like when you get down to granular details, of course, these are local elections. There'll be local factors. There was a big difference between those shares between just those two wards that we were looking at. But let's be clear: Boris Johnson, prime ministers generally go to places they think they're going to win. He went to the council leaders' um, uh, ward. He thought that they would. They thought they would take that ward. They lost it. We won it. We've got. Of course, we've got a win in the north. We've got a win in the south. We've got a win in London. Let, it's a long night and a long morning. Let's see where we end up. But to start with winning Sunderland, I'm a very happy man on a 43% share of the vote. Very happy indeed. When 2018 was a high water mark, this is good. Okay, Michelle. Well, I think we're a long way off it being good. You know, we, you are the party of opposition. We are in between two general elections. Ed Miliband did take 800 council seats in 2011. He did it again in 2012. Thatcher, in between two landslide elections, lost a thousand council seats. Tony Blair lost over a thousand council seats. We have to take this into context and look at what happens to incumbent governments in between general elections when we're looking at the data tonight. And also remember, you know, a lot of people are voting on local issues. It's less than 40 percent, I believe, of the actual political constituencies. You know, there's a lot to consider here tonight. But Michelle, when you talk about those historic comparisons mm. of governments, absolutely governments in midterm sometimes lose hundreds and hundreds mm. and hundreds of seats. You know, and our viewers should know also tonight, that the seats, the actual seats that are coming up for election that were available for you to fight over, made it very, very unlikely that we'd see those enormous totals moving from one party to another. So we don't want to give people the impression that this was a night where there might have been thousands of seats changing hands, because that's just not this kind of election based on the geography of these seats. Well, I dispute that, really. You know, some of these seats are in more more Labour areas where they could potentially be taking many, many seats from us. We'll see what happens tonight. You know, there's uh, many more hours to to progress with this. But Keir Starmer doesn't have a plan, just like Ed Miliband didn't have a plan. And that's what I've been hearing on the doorstep, as well as local issues. This is, at the end of the day, a local election. Potholes, pavements, council tax, those are the things that have been coming up. The, the rising uh, inflation that we're seeing globally across the world and the pressure that that is putting on people's budgets. Yes, of course, that came people's up. People's energy bills. That came up too, but predominantly local issues came up because this is a local election at the end of the day. You know, this is about the, the bin collections, the council tax, how your council is run. Yes, some national issues came up, mm. but predominantly local. That was my experience from being on the doorstep. Lying came up, cheating came up. Taxes came up. Fifteen taxes. Did that fifth, come up? Can I, Michelle, to let Starmer? me just finish. Fifteen taxes in the last ten years, and the national insurance hike. I'm afraid what you're expressing is a lot of concern about the Conservatives. You're playing down a very, very, a sense on the ground that things aren't great. Uh, and let's face it, they aren't great. I mean, what you said before that you know, Labour's fighting in areas it's gains. Therefore, you'd expect them to do. It didn't actually make sense. Is the truth. Um, No, I think you know and I know that this was a cost of living election. It was an election against which the rules uh, were seen to have been gained by your prime minister. And on that basis, um, you're not doing very well tonight. That's the truth. Well, we've only had one council declare, so it it is quite early. So let's not get let's not get too carried away, David. But um, something I would also say that did come up on the doorstep was about Keir Starmer and the hypocrisy. You know, your, your leader Good has relentlessly brought up Partygate over the last few months. In January, every single Prime Minister's question Sue that Gray. he used Sue Gray was brought up on Partygate. that. The Met Police brought up Partygate. And now every we, newspaper yeah, But now he seems Partygate. to be failing to answer <laughs> questions about his own whereabouts no. and exactly what total, happened total on spins. that evening. So hypocrisy <laughs> came up as well. You know, this is uh, something that did come up on the doorstep that I heard. So well. not just local issues. Other issues came I, up. I yeah. did say mainly yes. local yes. issues. I said some national yes. issues Fine. came up. Um, well then, let's have a look at Derby because Derby is an interesting contest, not just because we have Labour and uh, Tories fighting out in some parts of Derby, but Reform UK 
are also fielding a full slate of candidates in Derby uh, as well. So uh, Georgia Roberts is there for us. Uh, Georgia, bring us up to date. What, what do things look like? Yeah, so here in Derby, I'm at Derby Arena and Derby just one of two councils up for election in the East Midlands. And, you know, it's actually all up for grabs here, Hugh. There's only a third of seats up in Derby, so we're a bit limited in those big trends that we can spot. But it's still a very useful indicator here. And just to remind viewers what we're looking at in terms of the current situation, this is a minority led council led by the Conservatives. Labour are the second biggest party here. But as you say, we also have the added nuance of Reform UK, perhaps having the biggest presence here of any council in England. Six councillors for Reform UK. There were UKIP last time. They were contested here in 2018. Two seats up for grabs this time in traditional Labour areas. And it really is Labour, Hugh, who are going to be hoping to make some serious gains tonight. Um, just what are the parties hoping for here? The Conservatives, they're hoping for a pretty steady ship, perhaps not some monumental gains. Um, but, you know, there's some very tight races going on as well. We have Darley here. Now, that is one vote in it last time between the Conservatives and Labour. And Derby, Darley, rather, is in the parliamentary seat of Derby North. That is a key marginal here, held currently by Conservative MP Amanda Soloway. It's currently a Conservative ward. As I said, one vote in it last time and just speaking to Labour sources here on the ground, they say they're feeling pretty relaxed about taking it back. So that's perhaps one test that Labour can pass here. But just to add, Hugh, that when it comes to this talk about perhaps 2018 when these seats were last contested of there being a high watermark of results for Labour at that point elsewhere, a good showing for them last time, that wasn't the case here in Derby. In 2018, Labour lost control of Derby City Council and they are actually in a position where since then they've made consistent erosions in their support here. So tonight there's a lot of traditional red votes, if you like, up for grabs in places like where reform have been strong up until now, Labour hoping to retake some of their traditional areas that reform have been strong in now. So Labour really hoping that this tonight will set them on a good trajectory, so clawing back some support that they have lost here. And they lost it because of a myriad of local issues, for one, a very controversial Labour leader that led Derby City Council. But they want to see a beginning of a comeback tonight. And it really is going to be a key test because we are talking about a very marginal, divided Derby. You have actually, in just in terms of the parliamentary situation, Dame Margaret Beckett, veteran Labour MP in Derby South, and then you have, as I mentioned, Conservative MP Amanda Soloway in Derby North. The Lab Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, was here last week and she told Labour members on a key campaign stop that there is no route to number 10 without Labour winning in places like Derby and beginning to make a good showing again. Can they do it? We'll see what happens. And it is going to be a very nervous night for Labour. But the Conservatives, as I say, they lead the, Conser they leave the City Council at the moment. They are the minority leaders on the Council. For them, they're feeling pretty relaxed on the doorstep. People in their core wards, core Conservative vote, seems to have been holding up pretty well. Um, they actually are feeling quite good as well, just to mention, in places like Amber Valley, that's the one other Conservative, one, one other council in the East Midlands that is up for election tonight. Now, Amber Valley, of course, we have the added factor of the Conservative MP Nigel Mills, who was among the first Conservative MPs to call for the Prime Minister to resign after those fixed penalty notices. Conservatives on the ground in Amber Valley actually feel that perhaps that may have helped them in terms of perhaps getting a pretty tricky reception on the doorstep when it comes to going on to Westminster and how that might affect their position in Amber Valley. So a relaxed, perhaps night, conservative mood in Amber Valley where they control the council currently, they have overall control. Labour would have to actually win every ward up for grabs tonight in Amber Valley, as well as standing still in their current position to gain complete control there. So all to play for both in Amber Valley, in a sense, and Derby as well. Georgia, thank you very much. Uh, Georgia Roberts there with the uh, uh, look at the situation in Derby and uh, indeed in other parts of the East Midlands there mentioning Amber Valley. Um, and Laura, uh, you, you know, the whole 
concept of Labour's route back to power, any route that would take Labour back to power, mm -hmm. having to go through Derby mm -hmm. um, is, is clear. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet, you know, Georgia was there saying Labour are quite nervous. Well, that's right. And you have to look at marginal seats like that, the kind of seats where people change their minds and those change of heart change who gets the keys to number 10. And actually, it's fascinating to drill down into those seats and even into those wards like that, rather than what can be actually quite a risky game, which is to talk, as people often do, about the North or the South or the Southwest. And, you know, people get into that in political general debate. But actually, what the parties will be looking at are these micro, micro, micro areas, street by street. That ward that Georgia talked about, Darley in Derby, which makes up one ward in a particularly important marginal. And these are the kinds of clues that we will be looking for. Just one other uh, brief point to make. When we were talking before about Sunderland, Yes, Labour share. That is not the kind of thing where you look at that and think persuasively. You can sit here, David Lammy, tonight and say that means you're going to be Foreign Secretary this early in the night. That would be ridiculous to say anyway. But a bit of context of this. If we look back, yes, small swing Labour to Tory in Sunderland, despite the Labour hold. If you compare it to pre the referendum, the Tories are still looking at being 8% stronger than they were before Brexit. And this is still, we're in that era, mm -hmm. things have changed so much. So when, as we all have been talking about really historic swings backwards and forwards, this is still the sort of filling out of UK politics post-Brexit. We are in a new landscape and that comparison in terms of Sunderland, which was so iconic, wasn't it, during the Brexit referendum results night, it's just something worth bearing in mind. We'll see again, of course, um, when we get results in from other more remain areas, it, remain areas uh, and remain areas indeed. where we can indeed. make the comparison as well. Indeed. We're going to pause to, to go to the news. David, you're staying with us. Michelle, we're thanking you because I think you're leaving. So many thanks for your company. Um, and we're going to join uh, Tim for the news now. Hugh, thank you very much. Uh, here is the summary of the BBC News. Counting is underway in some areas after polls closed in elections across the UK. Northern Ireland has been choosing a new Stormont Assembly, while people in England, Wales and Scotland have been casting ballots to decide thousands of local authority seats. Seven mayoral elections have also taken place in England. Our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. Voters across the country went to the polls to elect thousands of local councillors who will run their services and set their council tax. All the political parties can do now is watch and wait as the votes are counted. For Boris Johnson and the Conservatives, these elections appear to have been the opposite of a walk in the park. The Tories are bracing themselves for a potentially bad night, especially in London and parts of the south of England. All eyes in particular are on the London borough of Wandsworth. The Tories have held it for 44 years, but it has been tipped to go Labour this time round. And outside of the capital, Southampton, although the Tories are hoping their vote has held up in other parts of England. For Keir Starmer, there's pressure to show he's finding a way back in for Labour. A bit of early cheer as the party held Sunderland. Labour says it's not expecting big gains because it already held the majority of the seats which were up, but it does expect the results across the country to show progress from what it calls the disastrous 2019 general election. For the Liberal Democrats, all smiles. Ed Davey says he's optimistic about their chances. They're hoping to pick up seats from the Tories in the south. While the Greens will be hoping to make gains too, it's co-leader Adam Ramsey casting his vote earlier. Not all councils are counting overnight tonight. The rest will start tomorrow. And these elections are about local issues, but as the results come in, they will also paint a national picture. Helen Catt, BBC News. There will be no counting until later this morning in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. In Scotland and Wales, where people are counting. way to Europe. From and if that is the case, 16. are you still getting Seats the, the billions of councils are being contested. Voters in Northern Ireland will elect members of the Assembly. It comes a few months after the Democratic Unionist Party resigned from the First Minister's role, causing the executive to collapse. Apologies uh, for the sound uh, problem there. If you want to find the result in your area, head to the BBC News website uh, or BBC News app. Uh, enter your postcode. You'll find lots of election analysis uh, and the latest reports from our teams around the country as well. Now, in other news, uh, interest that's rates. Uh, all the other news so far. Now back to election 2022 and to Hugh.
Yes, indeed. Welcome back to our BBC election studio, our live election coverage of these uh, local elections in England, Scotland and Wales, the Assembly elections in Northern Ireland. Uh, those being counted tomorrow, we're focusing overnight on the results from dozens of English local authorities. David Lammy for Labour is still with us in the studio. We've just been joined by the Conservative MP, uh, Claire Coutinho. Thanks for coming in, Claire. We'll be with you in a second. Uh, Laura's still with me, of course. Um, what I'd like to do now is because we know the results from nine English councils already. That's to say that they haven't completely declared some of them, but uh, we can uh, basically uh, pronounce the result on the basis of the uh, the declarations that we have to hand already. And Rita is now going to take us through those. Hugh, I've got eight of them up here, four apiece for the Conservatives and Labour. Uh, they're all holds, as you can see. Sunderland, we talked about earlier. South Tyneside is a Labour hold, as is Wigan in Greater Manchester and Holton in Cheshire. For the Conservatives, they've hung on to Redditch in the West Midlands, to Harlow in Essex, to Broxbourne in Hertfordshire, and also to Brentwood in Essex. I want to show you a little bit of what has happened in Brentwood because it's interesting um, to see how the Lib Dems have performed here. So uh, it's a Conservative hold, as I said. The winning post is 19 seats. They've got those 19, although they are still counting. So these figures could change. The Lib Dems on 10, Labour on 2. Now, this is a Conservative, has been a Conservative council for quite a while, but it was run by the Liberal Democrats in the 1990s. Um, there's no seat change being shown yet, um, but you can see the Lib Dems are actually two percentage points ahead of the Conservatives in terms of vote share. And if I show you the change since 2018, which is the last time that these seats were fought, you can see the Liberal Democrats up by 10 percentage points. I'll be very pleased with that. Independents uh, right down and the Conservatives down too, so they are the main beneficiaries. That hasn't yet resulted, though, in a gain in a seat for them. Is it going to? Well, we'll find out. Rita, many thanks. Um, in a moment, we'll have a, a look at tomorrow morning's uh, front, or this morning's front pages, <laughs> uh, because we want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the economic news, of course, of the past 24 hours, which is rather significant. Before that, Laura, um, mm. you had a little snippet from Worcester. Well, just a little snippet. We've been talking already, haven't we, about how much actually it's these, these, these really local contests on the ground matter so much. And it's important to look at these for obvious reasons. News from Worcester. Now, Worcester, you might remember a chat of Worcester women in the days of Tony Blair. Really important part of the country, those kinds of marginal seats that change hands that do, in the end, dictate who gets to number 10. Our team on the ground there has told us that the Tory leader, and the Tories had a very tight majority before tonight, has effectively thrown in the towel. He's gone home. He's told our team there on the ground he expects his party to have lost several seats tonight. He says people have given their verdict on the government and that party gate was the main national issue. He's also told our team there the parliamentary party needs to decide who it wants to lead them into the next election. Now think, and Claire Coutinho, maybe you'll do this, maybe you won't, but Michelle Donnellan, government minister who was sitting in the seat, really tried not to confess yes. that it had been an issue on the doorstep. But there we have it, a senior local Conservative identifying that as a problem. And he's gone home expecting to lose. Does that make sense to you, Claire? Well, I mean, I've got council elections in my area, so I've been out and about and talking to people. It's come up a couple of times, but it really hasn't come up that much. And I've had as many people talk about Beergate and Keir Starmer and being quite irritated, actually, at how hard he's gone in the government when actually he was chugging beer late at night himself. And actually, the main thing that I got from people is they want us to stop talking about Westminster. They understand that the country is facing really serious challenges and they want government and frankly, they want all politicians to be focusing on those challenges and making their lives better. Do you think voters in your part of Surrey don't care that the prime minister was fined for breaking the law? I, you know, I don't gloss over what happened. And I do think, you know, some of that has filtered through. But on the whole, they're really they care about cost of living. They care about the NHS working. They care about all of these public services actually working in their benefit. And, you know, I don't pretend that no one was angry. Lots of people were angry and, of course, they were right to be. But I also think a lot of people have moved on. Well, you mentioned their uh, cost of living mm. because clearly that's something that they will be exercised about. Um, because we've had the Bank of England in the past uh, 
uh, 24 hours or so, um, talking about the prospects, which are not great. Um, inflation heading for 10% and possible recession around the corner. Um, let's have a look at the front pages because these will be something for us to discuss, maybe. Um, there you have the Times talking about um, people asking uh, the Chancellor to slash taxes to stave off a recession. So that's uh, the first message. Uh, clearly, the implication there being that the Chancellor government needs to do more to help people. Um, soaring inflation says the independence set to push UK into recession. Uh, that's the possibility of a recession which was uh, being discussed earlier today based on what the uh, forecasts were. Um, the mirror's take is why won't they help? So that plays into the earlier message that we got from actually some Conservative MPs saying that they wanted the Chancellor uh, to step up and to provide more help, especially for people with uh, rising energy bills uh, for a start. Bank warns of recession and highest inflation in 40 years. That's the headline in the Daily Telegraph. And uh, uh, if we go on to the I, um, families face £1,200 hit, but no help before the next budget. Again, the theme about, you know, is there help forthcoming or extra help forthcoming? Uh, the Express uh, with, it, with its own take on this, as you, uh, as you might expect, hold on to your hats. A recession looms, says the Express. And then if you look at the mail, the take for the mail is families set for record squeeze. Bank of England bombshell, says the mail. UK facing recession, inflation to soar over 10% and a hit a 40-year high growth to plunge and uh, the biggest pay um, drop since 1990. So um, to come back to you, Claire, on these things, before I bring in Faisal Islam, who's waiting to talk to us, our economics editor, uh, people on the doorsteps, mm. I assume, will have been reflecting some of that theme, which is, is the government going to do more to help us than it's already done and the pressure on the Chancellor to deliver on that basis. W what's your message to, on that basis? Well, I mean, look, the country, is, it's very difficult. We're facing two problems. We're facing global energy prices, which have gone through the roof, as everyone knows. We're also facing some headwinds from the pandemic, which means that global supply chains are disrupted and the price of goods are going up. 10% um, inflation, it's extremely serious for the country. We know that people are really feeling it. And we started taking action back in autumn. I mean, I think the Chancellor was talking about inflation back in March last year. And what we've put together is about £22 billion worth of support. Some of that money is still getting out to people. I think it's really important that people go and contact their council where we have discretionary funds and local hardship funds and also that we get the council tax rebate out. But of course, we've got to keep everything in review and see what happens next. The theme seems to be that won't be enough. There's, there still is a lot of uncertainty in what's going to happen. But of course, you know, government will keep looking at it and people are, you know, people are up at night worrying about this issue. Would you expect the Chancellor to be offering more help? Well, I mean, I'll let the Chancellor set out but whatever you, he's going to set out. If people but, are asking you in your constituency, look, um, we need more help, is your message to them, uh, well, you're likely to get it? Or is your message, wait and see? Well, I think at the moment, there's lots of people in government who are looking at this issue. Like I said, it's number one for us. We know it's coming up on the doorstep because people are really hurting. So Do we're looking at everything very carefully. Do you think people Do you think that? Well, I mean, I think the two things I would say is we have to be very honest that we can't completely shield everyone from the effects of 10% inflation. And if you look at the people in this country who are facing a squeeze, it's almost everyone. There's only very, very few people at the top who are going to absorb it and probably not notice it. So that's a huge amount of people. So we have to balance not feeding into inflation whilst also trying to help people. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, let's just bring in Faisal, um, if we can. Uh, Laura, I'll be with you in a second. Um, Faisal, our economics editor, uh, talk us through the picture that you've been putting together for viewers today um, and indeed what that means for policy making in the next couple of years. Well, this is a moment, Hugh, where the economics and the politics are inextricably linked. A little bit like the uh, joke about the chicken and the egg. It's, it seems to me like the economics is, is coming first in terms of determining the tram lines for politics over the next uh, 12 months. You've heard about some of the challenges. All of this was in the ominous report from the Bank of England, uh, a, a, a forecast of inflation hitting double digits for the first time since 1982 by the end of this year. 
because of that squeeze on the cost of living, kind of that cost of living crisis rebounding on the macro economy uh, because people won't be able to afford to spend so much uh, and leading to fears of a recession. Certainly a smaller uh, contracting economy uh, at some points over the next year forecast uh, by the Bank of England. And yet at the same time, the bank's saying that rates still have to go up and perhaps go up more uh, than the 1% they reached uh, today. So all those three things put together uh, pretty ominous, uh, but also the reflection of what people are seeing at home. Um, you know, we've talked about you know, fifty-four percent rises in energy prices. Well, that is as nothing uh, as the moment oh, right now right. that is being that's happening in millions of households, perhaps ten to fifteen million households, where they're receiving direct debits which may have been, say, around £100 a month, and they're now over £250 a month. These are huge sums, and they're affecting millions and millions of households like I've never seen uh, before. And then those on prepayment meters who would put in £50 and it would last two or three weeks, it's now just lasting a week. So this is being felt very strongly in all these households. And I just wonder, given some of the... Uh, political promises we've seen both at the referendum and in the 2019 election, where I think some of the rhetoric coming from the Prime Minister seemed to certainly suggest a stronger state, a more assertive state, perhaps a bigger state. And we saw, didn't we, during the uh, pandemic, that the government sort of stepped up and paid the wages of over 10 million workers. And I just wonder whether that set an expectation amongst the public, amongst voters, that they expect more help than they would have done, that it set a kind of precedent. That's certainly not what the Treasury would like to think. It's not what the Chancellor would say, that the cost of living crisis is different from an emergency pandemic. But certainly when I go around the country reporting on businesses and consumers, uh, I do get the sense from them, uh, without being asked, they volunteer this suggestion that the government, although it's done, you know, it's saved a couple of hundred pounds uh, on bills here and there, when you're facing such huge sums, I do get regularly volunteered the suggestion, even from some Conservative voters that they think the government should do more given the scale of the problem and the fact that it's growing as the Bank of England forecast shows. Uh, hold on Faisal uh, because Laura that that's a crucial idea isn't it? Mm -hmm. People's expectations mm -hmm. after the furlough and all the rest of it mm -hmm. they look at these energy bills coming in they can't believe the figures that they see mm -hmm. um, their monthly direct debits have gone up a huge amount and the response from lots of people seems to be well surely Th there'll be help available with this. And I think for two reasons. One, because of that precedent and that enormous expansion of the state that came about because of a national emergency, love it or loathe it, coronavirus was a massive national emergency and the state absolutely grew at a very, very um, quick rate. What the Treasury now wants to do is to go the other way. Borrowing costs are very high. There are all sorts of risks out there. Rishi Sunak wants to have money for another rainy day. The point is, though, and I think it was very interesting listening to Faisal there, lots of people feel we're in another very serious mm. rainy day. This is another real financial, personal financial storm for many people. And I just wonder, I mean, Claire, you're not just an MP, you work in Rishi Sunak's team. He's made it very clear he doesn't want to do anything else until the autumn. But do you really expect people ordinary families up and down the country who are having to cut back in big ways, do you really expect them to wait another six months before any more help comes? And because when Boris Johnson was interviewed this week, he admitted that not enough was being done in the immediate term. He admitted that. So can you wait six months? Well, I mean, one of the things that we, we did when we did the energy price package, which was back in February, was we looked at the energy price cap, which keeps a lid on energy bills until the autumn. And because there's so much vol volatility in the energy market, what we sort of said at the time is we need to see what's going to happen, because until you know what's going to happen in the autumn, it's hard to judge what you should do but as a what's government. what's happening now is, is we're, we're seeing it happening already. You and know, inflation you know, maybe going to hit 10 percent. Yes. But just if you think about what where the inflation is coming from, I think about a half of it at least is energy prices. So that's why I think it is, it is worth looking to see what happens with energy prices going forward. OK, let's get a quick update from Worcester, because that was a uh, um, a council we were discussing earlier with some useful lessons uh, potentially there. Ben Sidwell is there for us. Um, ben, bring us up to date. Well, yeah, quite extraordinary scenes here actually in Worcester. Now, the counting hasn't actually begun. Verification has finished. They're just about to start counting here in Worcester. But before counting has even started, 
the leader of the council, the Conservative leader here, Mark Bayliss, has already left the building. He's basically seen enough, I think, of the verification ballots. He's seen where the votes are going. He believes that the Conservatives here will lose several seats and because of that they will most likely lose uh, control here. Now, Worcester is actually under no overall control. For the seven of the last ten years that's been the case here in Worcester. But until February it did have a majority of one, then one of their councillors resigned. Now they have the most seats here, but it's felt that they could lose four of those seats tonight. Now they could go to Labour, possibly the Liberal Democrats, and, and almost certainly one of those will go to the Green Party. And it's not the only criticism really of the Conservatives. Now, Louis Griffiths, who was uh, the uh, voted in in 2018 in the seat of Batten Hall here, now she was voted in as a Green candidate. She voted in for the Green Party, but 12 months later she defected to the Conservatives. Now she's not standing this time, and actually in her leaving speech to the Council about a month ago, she said that that move to the Conservatives was probably the biggest mistake of her life. She said the Conservatives have become a benevolent dictatorship here. It seems that up in the road, uh, well, about 30 miles up the road in Birmingham, there are concerns about Conservatives because on the ballot papers there, 80 of 101 Conservatives have had on their ballot paper, not Conservatives, but local Conservatives. They are that concerned about what's going on in Westminster that they feel it could affect their chances of winning their seat. Here that doesn't seem to be the case. There's not the evidence here, particularly that the Conservatives, certainly out on the doorstep, are distancing themselves at all from central government. But certainly Mark Bayliss says that the verdict from the people of, of Worcester really is the verdict on the government and, and he believes that that is the case why they are losing seats here. Now 13 of the 35 seats will be done today. They will be uh, we will find out what's going on and what's going to happen. The chances are Worcester will remain under no overall control, but if the seats go the way that people believe they could, it might be that Labour then take power as, as part of a coalition and they are, if not the biggest party, they may then lead Worcester from here. Well, Ben, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, ben Sidwell there for us. Uh, with the latest on the events in Worcester. That was interesting, Laura. And uh, just do. after what you said earlier, mm. but you know, the whole thing about how they sell the message and whether they're selling the message on the basis of, you know, we are just local conservatives and we're nothing to do maybe with, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on back up in Westminster. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that that is coming up as a theme in more than one area. It's definitely happened in a few pockets, there's no question about it. And you've seen, not surprisingly, given a lot of the headlines of the last few months, uh, local candidates distancing themselves from the Westminster leadership of Boris Johnson. We should say, though, however, that's not the first time that local councillors no. or indeed some no. MPs in some general elections mm. have done their own things and tried to sort of create that distance. But it is interesting, perhaps in comparison to the 2019 general election, and we shouldn't be too making too many comparisons to a general election campaign, but that election campaign for the Conservatives was all about Boris Johnson. Mm. This electoral test for some Conservative candidates, they're trying to make it about anything but. And the other difficulty as well, when they want to kind of stop talking about Partygate and all of those Downing Street sort of shenanigans that were going on, the alternative story to talk about is the very real thing that's happening to people at home and people's family finances. Mm. That's a very challenging issue for the government mm. too. So it's quite, you know, neither of the major political conversations are ones that are easy for the Conservatives right now. Uh, David, I'll bring you in in a second, because you've been very patient as well now in the last uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. And uh, just bear with us, Claire, for, for a moment. Uh, just two different perspectives. Uh, Harry Cole, who's the political editor of The Sun, and uh, we also have, um, I think we've got, uh, Caroline Wheeler as well, have we, Caroline, from the Sunday Times? That's very good. Um, uh, Harry, thanks for joining us and waiting for, to talk to us. Uh, is this the big test for Boris Johnson, or is it, as our Conservative guest seems to be telling us, uh, you know, mostly about local issues? 
Well, the Prime Minister would like it to be about local issues, but back in Westminster, this has been a, uh, a first moment since Partygate, since the cost of living crisis, since Boris Johnson's pretty torrid year so far. Um, it's been a rough old ride for the government since January, and um, there was a sort of attempt that fizzled out slightly to get those letters of no confidence in, trigger a vote in Boris Johnson's um, uh, premiership earlier on in the year. They didn't quite get there. Now, lots of Tory rebels telling uh, us, you know, wait till see the locals see how the dust settles and whether the summer would be a better time to have a inward navel gazing session that the Tory party is pretty good at. What's your sense of things so far? It's, it's early, I know, but uh, what are you being told it, so far it, this evening? It's very early, and cutting through all the, um, all the usual sort of expectation management and spin, there's a, a WhatsApp group for Tory MPs, and uh, a minister just passed a, a screenshot of it to me. And Boris Johnson did a big gushing message about two hours ago now, in which he said, thank you for all your hard work, onwards and upwards, everyone. You know, and there's been an absolute silence uh, from Tory MPs, not even the most loyal uh, of his supporters are, are weighing in and um, that could be a sense of foreboding for Downing Street in the fact that Tory MPs really are sitting on their hands at the moment and seeing how this night pans out. Bear with us Harry. Caroline, thanks for joining us. Uh, what's your take on what's happening? I think very similar to what Harry's saying. It's actually quite quiet out there at the moment. We're getting the odd sort of message coming in from special advisers and those in the campaign headquarters, certainly uh, from within the sort of conservative camps at the moment. They seem to be having quite a sort of gloomy evening, uh, already looking ahead to some of those losses that they are thinking that they might uh, see uh, coming up. Uh, in particular, I think they're worried about Barnet and the impact in London. Um, Labour haven't heard very much at all there so I think we are still very much in the early days of this and as Harry was saying it is all about sort of expectation management sort of downplaying uh, potential losses uh, for the Conservatives and also for Labour who've been keen to stress that uh, those uh, election results back in 2018 were sort of high watermark for them. <laughs> So just to clarify for both of you and uh, Caroline first, if I may, uh, on the whole issue of making a judgment on the party's performance, the Conservative Party's performance, and then trying to measure the Prime Minister's uh, role in that, the factor of the Prime Minister in terms of the way people have voted, how long is that going to take? Is that going to take a matter of days or weeks, Harry, first? Look, the Queen's speech is an opportunity for the government to try and reset. There's a, a looming threat of a reshuffle to try and keep the troops in line. Downing Street using all the traditional levers to try and restore dif discipline. If there is a, an absolute spanking tonight for the Conservative Party, it's going to be a rough summer. If the police tomorrow decide to announce that there's been lots more fines in Downing Street, if the Prime Minister himself receives another fine, um, it could be a very rough couple of weeks. This is just one part of a sort of moving uh, plate for Boris Johnson that he needs to, to get right. Hopefully, for him, he will be saying that you know most of the most of the most of the uh, seats being contested tonight are in London. Labour are very far ahead in London. It's a Labour city, uh, and he'll be cl clinging on to some some slivers of good news out in the out in the shires and in the north. But it does remain to be seen. And even if he does get through tonight unscathed, there's still lots of hurdles coming up. Uh, Harry, thanks, and Caroline, to you, that kind of uh, yardstick uh, in terms of judging the Prime Minister's future. How is that going to play out, do you think? Well, I think, uh, again, you know, Harry's setting that out quite clearly, that there are still a number of hurdles uh, that the Prime Minister is going to face. And certainly if you speak to some of those rebel MPs who have already expressed their dissatisfaction with the leadership, they've made it very clear that there could be a kind of uh, coming together of lots of different things which would precipitate some kind of challenge. And among that would be uh, the, the coming back of the Sue Gray report uh, and also potentially more fines. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the impact of these local elections, uh, particularly those blue wall areas which is really going to be indicative potentially of what we might see in a general election and certainly those uh, conservative MPs in those areas are feeling very much under pressure and of course that's what it comes down to at the end of all of this these uh, MPs who hold the kind of future of the Prime Minister in their hands uh, can only have any impact if they are re-elected at the next general election so they themselves will be thinking about their own futures uh, when they think about whether or not they're going to throw their weight behind the Prime Minister moving forward. Carolyn Wheeler, Harry Cole, thank you both very much for joining us uh, here on the uh, BBC election results uh, programme. Um, it is, uh, well, it's gone one o'clock in the morning now and we're getting some more results coming in. A note from Sir John Curtis, our resident guru, and John will be making an appearance shortly. Um, but John's passed this note on 
um, which makes for interesting reading, as it or as they always do. Worth noting that so far the Conservatives and Labour are both down. It's the Lib Dems and the Greens who are up as we speak at this early stage. The Greens, uh, says John, are so far noticing a two-point increase in their vote in wards that they also fought in 2018, while their vote is also up by one point on 2021. And uh, although the Greens look as though they're not doing as well as they did in 2019, this could prove to be one of the party's better local election performances. So, Laura, that's just uh, an important reminder for us um, as we really kind of get stuck into the talk about Boris Johnson's future or whether Keir Starmer's turned things around. Actually, the story of this night may well be the relative success of Greens and Lib Dems. Indeed, and a relatively sort of steady as you go, actually, for the two big mm. parties. And in the last couple of days, actually, something I've quite, quite often that people who've been on the doors have heard from voters is that sense of a plague on both your houses. You know, we mm. don't like what's been going on in Westminster. We don't like that argy-bargy. People are worried about their own finances and they're a bit fed up but they're not necessarily furious enough with the government to switch over with enormous enthusiasm to Labour because they're not feeling perhaps that passionate and excited about them either. And a, a, a cabinet minister gave a prediction to me earlier this evening saying that the Tories will probably do badly, but it won't be Armageddon. Labour will do better, but won't blow our socks off. And the implication there, of course, is, well, voters turning out will go to other parties, which, of course, in a local election is sometimes seen as a sort of less risky option because you don't have the same national moment of jeopardy that you see in general elections. Yeah, is that fair, David? Look, I think that when I was knocking on doors, what I saw is that there are undecided voters out there who are switching to Labour, but there are also what I would describe as soft Conservatives um, who have never voted Labour who are looking at other parties like Liberal Democrats and Greens. And I think that will be reflected uh, across the evening. But in the end, in our first past the post system, um, most voters are making calculations about the two main parties. And as I said, it's important for us that by the afternoon tomorrow, our share of the vote across the country has gone up. We were Earlier on, we talked to Faisal, and uh, indeed we, we talked to Claire as well about the uh, the cost of living crisis and the fact that uh, you know we mentioned the factors which were bothering people right now, including inflation uh, and energy bills, etc. Uh, again, do you think Labour is producing a clear and assertive enough message on this? It's the kind of thing that you would imagine uh, an assertive opposition would be really trying to capitalise on, not to capitalise on people's problems, but to capitalise on the fact that they think the economy is being managed or uh, mismanaged, in a, you know, and, and that, that they, they see that people need help, which they're not getting. Uh, the question being, you know, is Labour being effective enough in that area? We had a laser focus on cost of living. We said there should be an emergency budget we said there should be a windfall tax to help people with their fuel bills and not the loan scheme. We said we would get rid of non-DOM status. We said we would deal with uh, fraud in the system and get 11.8 billion out of the economy as a result of that. We also said, by the way, because we talk a lot about people with higher energy um, who, who are you know, ordinary constituents and residents, but also small businesses are suffering hugely. I was with a, uh, uh, a fish and chip shop today. Uh, they've seen their, their bills double um, um, hugely over this last while, and we want to support them with a business rate discount. That's a pretty comprehensive package people were getting. And I must say my colleague, Rachel Reeves, coming up on the doorstep, people saying that she's doing very well indeed alongside Keir Starmer. So I do think we went into this election cycle with a very comprehensive packet on package on the economy and that's the issue that people were talking about alongside of course rule breaking and party gate so if labor's talking about more help and targeted specific help that will increase the pressure on the chancellor to deliver something as laura said not waiting for the autumn not waiting for the winter but to deal with problems that people are having right now with the bills that they are actually seeing coming through the door. 
So I, I think in terms of the pressure that will come from the public and what they're facing, but not from Labour's plan, because I would just say Labour's plan is actually not that good. So if you think about the amount of help that they're giving to people, that's people at the very bottom. But as I said, the inflation challenge is for a lot more people than that. You can go up to the 70th percentile of income in this country. That's about £35,000. So I think everyone from about 30% to 70% of people, that sort of middle chunk of people who are still very, very squeezed, are, aren't getting anything other than a 5% reduction in energy bills under Labour's plan. Um, so and I just would question whether that is really more. Okay. Laura, thoughts? Just a couple of things. Uh, as you were talking there about the smaller parties benefiting, um, I've just been told that there's a 99% chance that the Tories are going to lose control of West Oxfordshire, David Cameron territory, because of Liberal Democrat gains. And in Colchester, uh, the Liberal Democrats have taken the Tory leader's seat. So just a couple of little of shreds there of evidence mm -hmm. that might go towards that picture of actually the big parties essentially both disappointing in different ways. Labour making smaller gains than they might need. The Tories taking a bit of a kicking, even though not something completely catastrophic. And maybe the dividends going to smaller parties. Well, let, let's stay with the thought of smaller parties, um, though they're growing, as they'd argue, the Greens, certainly, and the Lib Dems would say, don't call us smaller parties. Um, the Greens, certainly, we mentioned, are making some gains. And uh, let's join Rita to talk us through those. And then after that, hopefully, I'll be able to talk to uh, Carla Denia from the Green Party as well. So, Rita. Hugh, this is the state of the parties so far. The night is young, but uh, this is the scoreboard with 13 of 146 councils declared. And as you said, the two bigger parties, if I can call them that, Labour and the Conservatives, have actually made net losses. It's the Lib Dems who've picked up council seats on plus five and the Greens on plus four. Um, let me take you back to the screen with some of the latest results. You've seen this already, but I want to show you South Tyneside. Uh, here it comes, uh, a Labour hold, of course, 41 seats, uh, the Greens on six. What's really interesting is to look at the change in the seats uh, and Labour have lost four and the Greens have picked up three. Rita, thank you very much. Well, we mentioned there that um, Carla Denier, from the co-leader of the uh, Greens, is uh, joining us. And uh, Carla, thanks very much. Good morning. It's uh, well, it's just about a quarter past one. Yeah, and, good but, morning, I suppose. But, <laughs> uh, but 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 we are in a position at least to talk about some results. Now, why don't you give us uh, the results that uh, you've notched up so far? Yeah, well, the news from South Tyneside is really positive, but not a great surprise. We were expecting to do well there. We only got our first councillor elected there a few years ago. But just like in places all over England, we've we've done really well in the last few years. We've nearly trebled our number of councillors in the last three years, in fact. Uh, and so tonight we've gone from three to six councillors on South Tyneside, which makes us the second largest party there after Labour. And we're keeping an eye on a number of other councils, quite a you know, geographical spread and a spread in the, in the kinds of towns and cities and rural areas as well. So um, we're expecting to make gains uh, in Burnley, in Lancashire. Um, we're probably um, yeah, keeping a close eye on Hastings on the south coast and Reading. And then there'll be a whole um, swathe of other councils where we think we might have a chance to get our, our foot in the door and break through onto a number of new councils. Uh, in the southeast, London, uh, Wales, northeast, and so on. What's the dynamic of the campaign as far as you're concerned? People looking for uh, a vote that they think will be valid in terms of the environment and local transport and all the rest of it, the, the campaign issues that we're familiar with, uh, or is it a kind of haven for those who simply want to register their opposition to what they see going on elsewhere? So I think issues with around party gate and um, how the Conservative Party are conducting themselves generally certainly are coming up on the doorstep, but that's far from the whole story. As I mentioned, we've been making big gains year on year now for a few years. So we're really seeing this as part of that broader pattern where as people uh, learn about the Greens, they, they, they find out they agree with us, they uh, they see that we're very hard working and connected in our communities um, and 
ultimately it's about trust and integrity and they understand that the Greens do politics differently and that's why uh, lots of people have been telling us over the last few weeks and months that they're giving their vote to the Greens often for the first time. Uh, they see politics differently it's one of those phrases what does that mean? Um, I think that what what we hear said back to us on the doorstep from voters is that um, we are really well connected in our communities um, and that we are when we when we go out door knocking we're not just talking we're listening we're we're really listening to what people's concerns and issues are and working hard to tackle them and through that the greens are proving that there's really no such thing as a safe seat for labor and the conservatives anymore um, last year we um, gained around 100 new seats and that was pretty much equal numbers between Labour and the Conservatives. What would be, um, you know, a credible good result for you at the end of this period of counting? So we're talking about tomorrow evening, you know, when we've got everything in by then. What would your party be happy with? Uh, I'm not going to put an exact number on it. I think it, it's hard to say that, but we are expecting to make substantial gains. And as I mentioned, in a number of different areas of uh, of the country and and different types of cities towns and rural areas as well substantial gains uh, will suggest what well into double figures yes uh, certainly okay um well hopefully yeah. we'll talk tomorrow again uh, carla thanks very much for joining us thanks for having me on carla denier there we were mentioning earlier um when we were chatting around the table here about some of these uh, very symbolic London councils. Um, of course, we're not suggesting they are more important than any other council. And I just underlined that, but they've, they've kind of accrued, if you like, a kind of symbolism because of uh, the past uh, 20, 30 years when, you know, um, during the Thatcher years, certainly in terms of Wandsworth. Barnet is another of these councils in North London, which, by the way, uh, includes the old constituency of Finchley as it then was in those boundaries, which was Mrs. Thatcher's own seat, of course. Now, Barnet is a Labour target, uh, and it would be a pretty big development if Labour did get hold of Barnet from the Conservatives. Our reporter there is uh, Shelley Phelps. Shelley, what's it look like? Good morning, Hugh. Well, this is a key target for Labour. Keir Starmer launched his London campaign here. The Conservatives have held the council for over 20 years. And if Labour win here, it would be the first time they'd ever had uh, an outright majority here. So a historic win. In terms of the mood on the ground, the Labour Party candidates and uh, activists, they seem pretty upbeat. The Labour group leader, Barry Rawlins, told me he's fairly confident they're going to win by some margin, though he did add that he could still find himself crying into his cereal in the morning. And in terms of what a victory could mean for Labour here, he says it would show that the party has turned the corner on anti-Semitism. Under Jeremy, Corden, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, the party was uh, dogged by accusations of anti-Semitism. Now, Barnet has one of the largest uh, Jewish populations in the country. It's around 15% of the population. So he says that that's what a win here would mean. Now, in terms of the Conservative camp, the mood is more musical. Some of them have been uh, fairly quiet, lots of people saying we'll just have to wait and see. Though the candidates that I have spoke to said that they've fought this campaign on uh, you know, very hyper-local terms. And one Conservative Party source did say to me that nobody here wanted Conservative campaign headquarters anywhere near the campaign here. When you look at the kind of campaign that's been fought there, Sh Shelley, um you know, what have been the important signals for you of the way this campaign has been going? Well, I think when you speak to any of the candidates from either side of the party, they're saying that cost of living is one of the big issues that are, are coming up. Um, a number of the Conservative candidates that I have spoken to, they did say that um, the campaign had quite a, a national feel and that um, Boris Johnson was coming up quite a, a lot on the doorstep. And there was some concern around that from um, local Conservative Party candidates who said they'd be passing some of that feedback on to one of their MPs here, Mike Freer, who's a, a whip in, in the government. But also local issues, particularly here around green spaces and developments. There's been quite a lot of concern locally about high rises and, you know, building very tall buildings and also protection for green spaces. So, as I'm sure is the case in many places, a mix of the national and the local.
Well, that's interesting, Shelley. We'll be back, obviously, when there are more developments there. But thank you very much for bringing us up to date there in Barnet. That was uh, Shelley Phelps. Um, I'd like to bring in Sir John Curtis now for our first little chat of the night. It's 20 past, uh, 22 minutes past one. Good morning, John. Good morning to you, Hugh. Well, now then, in front of me, and I hope to share it with viewers, we have some key ward analysis. So this is the group of key wards, hundreds of key wards that uh, you and the team have been analysing. And if we look at this, it shows that so far, um, and it's just 92 of 738 of these key wards declared, um, Labour down 1%, Tories down 2%, Lib Dems up 3%, the Greens up 2%, UKIP um, then was uh, down 1% and the Independents um, up by a whisker. Now, uh, put all that, John, into some kind of message for viewers about where you see this contest at this stage of the morning. Well, the first thing to say is that virtually all of these ward results we've got in so far are from outside London, where, of course, we've got the complication that a lot of the boroughs have had changes in their ward boundaries, which makes ca calculating the change since 2018 uh, more difficult. That said, there is a broad message here, which is that, you know, according to the opinion polls, we might be expecting the Labour Party to be making net gains, including at least making some net gains outside of London. Well, the truth is that so far these have not trans transpired. As you can see, uh, Labour's vote is down a bit, as is the Conservative vote, and that perhaps something that none of us were necessarily expecting, so far at least, the party that's making most progress, albeit from a lower base, is the Liberal Democrats, whose share of the, if you actually confine the key ward analysis to those, war, those wards which the Liberal Democrats are fighting and fought last time, so the three-party contest, the, the Liberal Democrat vote so far is actually up on average by six percentage points, and it's particularly noticeably going up in those wards where they're challenging the Conservatives for first place. So for the Democrats at least, there's some evidence in these early results so far that maybe they are doing quite well in some of those so-called blue war areas, i.e. conservative held areas uh, where the Liberal Democrats are the principal challengers. At the other end of the spectrum, as we were kind of discussing about Sunderland an hour ago, there so far is very little evidence of the Labour Party making particularly significant advance in the more so-called red wall, i.e. pro-leave parts of the country in the Midlands and the North. Now, too early to kind of I'd be, go very firmly on this, but there is just the smell about the early results. The Labour is going to find perhaps more joy in London, perhaps even more joy in the south of England, outside of London, than it is in the more pro-leave Midlands and the North. And if that does prove to be the case, and I'll emphasise the if in that statement, that perhaps is going to temper whatever success Labour uh, claims uh, by tomorrow afternoon. Because, of course, the thing above all the Labour Party has been saying it's wanting to do is to recover and leave voting Britain. Uh, what about the Conservative performance, John? Well, I mean, so far the Conservative vote is down a bit. Um, and to that extent, at least as compared with 2018, it's roughly what we want. We should emphasise, by the way, the Conservative performance is down much more. We're looking at around a 5% swing or so to Labour. If we compare the results this year with last year, and when it comes to the question of, well, to what extent have the Conservatives suffered from Partygate, the cost of living crisis, as well as any, all the other things that have happened in the last 12 months, these are, although not so good for Labour as perhaps we were expecting, these local election results are still confirming that the Conservatives are in a markedly weaker position than they were 12 months ago, and that they are probably indeed in a weaker position now electorally than they have been at any point in this parliament. It's just that Labour isn't necessarily always profiting from that position. John, many thanks. Um, good to talk to you. We'll talk to you in a, in a while again. Um, a quick update from Rita uh, before we come to David and to Claire here in the studio. Um, Rita, you've got some latest results for us? I have indeed, Hugh. Uh, you've caught me actually playing with the touch screen here. I was trying to get Thurrock up for you. It's not cooperating. Well, we can see it's a Conservative hold anyway. 
Here it comes. Here it comes. But there's more detail than that. It's a Conservative hold. Yes, indeed. I wanted to bring you a couple of councils that are in Levy areas. John there was saying that uh, Labour really needs to show that it's coming back and solid building support in Leave voting areas. Well, Thurrock in Essex, very Levy, 72% voted to leave the EU in 2016. You can see a very comfortable majority for the Conservatives there. 11 seats. Uh, this is a council that they gained last year in 2021. Uh, it had been hung since 2007 before then. Let's just see what's happened overnight. And there you have it. Uh, three seats lost by Labour and gained by the Conservatives. A similar thing has been going on in Hartlepool. Now here by contrast, Hartlepool is hung and it remains hung. But still very interesting to see what has happened uh, behind those bold figures. So um, this, of course, is a, a, a Westminster seat that the Conservatives famously won last year. Let's see what's happened. They have failed to actually win the council, short by four seats, but they have gained two seats and Labour has failed to. So the Conservatives have taken two seats off the independents. Um, so no evidence from these two councils anyway, of that Labour advance that's so needed. Rita, many thanks. Uh, and that's the challenge for you, David, isn't it? That, that outside London is a good illustration there of what Rita has been saying and John's message earlier, that, you know, yes, you may well have things to celebrate in London, but outside London, you face an enormous challenge still. Well, there's a challenge in this set of elections because four out of 10 of the seats are here yes. in London. Mm -hmm. but. Beyond London, I think we've got to look at the whole picture by tomorrow afternoon, and that is seats, like areas like Sheffield, Southampton, Worthing, uh, and of course, Newcastle was very important, Sunderland was very important. We've got to look at the whole picture across the country to see where we are at the end of the evening. And I st I'm, I'm optimistic mm. that our share will be up from that 2019 position, and we will have made progress when you on, see 20, Hartlepool, on, on 2018. Does yeah. your heart sink when you see Hartlepool there? Well, I've knocked on doors in Hartlepool. I, I did that in the by-election. It was a tough, it was a tough part of the country for us, no doubt about it. Um, what there, were people there, telling you there? Well, voters were raising actually the, the, the local authority. They were raising loss of services uh, in, in that area in the by-election. And those issues are still coming up in Hartlepool. There's a lot to do, I think. Um, uh, it's look, it will be a mixed picture across some of those leave areas where there, you know, we need a four year cycle to gain back the trust of those voters who we lost overwhelmingly in 2019. Um, what does that tell you about the ability of the Conservatives to hang on to those areas which it took famously in 2019 and which lots of your colleagues have been rather nervous about in terms of the fragility possibly of the majorities that are there? Well, I mean, we should always be nervous if all of our voters are making sure that we're selling our case. Uh, what I would say, though, is if you look at the run up into this election is, you know, Labour was talking about 800 seats that they were going to win. You know, if you think about incumbencies and the fact that we, you know, we should be losing seats at this stage. Tony Blair, I think at his stage before he won the 97 election, won 2000 council seats. I think really it is a test of Keir Starmer's leadership. And I do question why he's not making those gains outside of London. And I'm, look, in, I'm intrigued, Claire, by this 800 figure because I, I mean, we never said 800. I, I, I'm not sure that it was. I mean, maybe some of the commentators said it. I think that's including it, Wales I don't, and Scotland. I, I, there was, there was what, to be clear for our yeah. viewers because we've actually talked about this already tonight yeah. before you arrived. There was one set of uh, projections by one group that came up with 800, but that is for our viewers, as we've already explained. That is way yeah. out of the expectation. Yeah. That's not to defend what's going on with the Labour Party in any way, shape, or form. But the fact is. The 800 seat projection was way at the extreme and okay. Labour certainly never said that. OK, well, I, I will, I will you know, take that on board. But I definitely <laughs> think they were talking about making quite serious gains and I don't think anyone would dispute that. And the fact that they're not at this point in the electoral cycle, I do think is something to question. And just on London, I know they've thrown the kitchen sink at London. The last two leaders represent seats in London, but if they're going to win a general election, they need to look outside of London. And we will be making gains beyond London by tomorrow afternoon. I have absolutely no doubt, absolutely no doubt, we will be making progress on our performance in 2018 and certainly in 2019. But David Lamy, are you confident that any of that progress will be in areas that voted leave? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's I am, what Rita actually. was I, showing us. Laura, I am because genuinely cost of living is the issue that was coming up and Partygate was the issue that's coming up and it will absolutely translate, I'm quite sure, in votes for us and other opposition parties. And if you don't accept 800, what might you accept? You said 200 a bit earlier no, no, before we I, knew very no, much, no, no, giving no. a go again, we'll have a go. <laughs> Any progress on a good year is progress for us and 2018 was a good year. It wasn't 20, a great year, 20, you've said that 2018 tw did very well. That's right, you were even with Theresa no, May in a very difficult mm -hmm. moment for her. Theresa May was on the floor of right, her she, support and, uh, and, and, Corbyn, and Corbyn was at his highest point, is what I said. And I think that's a fair analysis of the 2018 result. Hugely disappointing uh, at 2019 the 2019 was then very poor for us indeed. So that's the comparator that we've, that we've got to use. It's the comparison well, that the party's going to choose too. I think we've established that. Uh, thanks for your company, both Thank of you, you, Claire and David. Um, and uh, you're getting off to bed at 1.30, which is... <laughs> compared to those who are following after you, is actually quite a good deal, I think. <laughs> so, good, good to have you with us. Thank, Thank you both very much. <laughs> Thank um, you. So, let's take a break, Laura. And we, we're staying here, and uh, we're going to join Tim. Hugh, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a summary of the BBC News now. And uh, counting is underway in some areas after polls closed in elections across the UK. Northern Ireland has been choosing a new Stormont Assembly, while people in England, Wales and Scotland have been casting ballots to decide thousands of local authority seats. Uh, seven mayoral elections have also taken place in England. Our political correspondent Helen Catt has this latest report. Voters across the country went to the polls to elect thousands of local councillors who will run their services and set their council tax. All the political parties can do now is watch and wait as the votes are counted. For Boris Johnson and the Conservatives, these elections appear to have been the opposite of a walk in the park. The Tories are bracing themselves for a potentially bad night, especially in London and parts of the south of England. All eyes in particular are on the London borough of Wandsworth. The Tories have held it for 44 years, but it has been tipped to go Labour this time round. Westminster and Barnet are also being closely watched tonight. And outside of the capital, Southampton, although the Tories are hoping their vote has held up in other parts of England. The Tories have held several councils, including Harlow in Essex, but in Worcester, the Conservative Council leader left the building before a single vote had even been counted. Morning. Morning. For Keir Starmer, there's pressure to show he's finding a way back in for Labour. The party has held the key council of Sunderland, but with a smaller majority. Expectations of big gains are being downplayed, but Labour says it does expect the results to show progress from what it calls the disastrous 2019 general election. For the Liberal Democrats, all smiles. Ed Davey says he's optimistic about their chances. They're hoping to pick up seats from the Tories in the South. Conservative Party candidate 907. They've had one big scalp already, ousting the Conservative leader of Colchester Council from his seat. The Greens are making early gains too, their co-leader Adrian Ramsey casting his vote earlier. Not all councils are counting overnight tonight, the rest will start tomorrow. And these elections are about local issues, but as the results come in, they will also paint a national picture. Helen Catt, BBC News. There will be no counting until later this morning in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. In Scotland and Wales, where people can vote from the age of 16, uh, seats in all councils are being contested. Voters in Northern Ireland will elect members of the Assembly. It uh, comes a few months after the Democratic Unionist Party resigned from the First Minister's role, causing the executive to collapse there. If you want to find out uh, the results in your area, head to the BBC News website or BBC News app and just put in your postcode. You'll also find lots of election analysis there and the latest reports from our teams around the country. If you are uh, watching or want to uh, catch up online rather than watching uh, Hugh and Laura. Now, uh, in other news, uh, interest rates now back to election 22 and Hugh. Yes, welcome back to the BBC's election studio. Two new guests in the studio, Jonathan Ashworth for Labour, Tiana Davison for the Conservatives. You can just... Take it easy for a second because we're just saying hello, <laughs> just a friendly hello and a welcome. We'll take that okay, nice and easy. Um, before we pitch in. Yeah. Um, so it's good of you to join us. Um, if you're just joining us uh, uh, at home watching, 
maybe it's best for us to get right up to date as to where we are because uh, there are 20 councils declared so far out of 146 so we're still early days um, although some of those declarations are ones which are very useful for us they give us useful pointers but let's join Rita for the latest on the scoreboard here is uh, how that uh, those results of the first 20 councils translate. And as you can see, Labour and the Conservatives are neck and neck on 10 net losses of councillors each. But look at that for the Lib Dems. They've gained 10 and they're on 39. And the Greens uh, have gained seven councillors uh, and they're now on 10. So we heard... John Curtis talking a little bit earlier about how the Lib Dems and the Greens seem so far to be having a good night. There it is in bold figures. Um, let me also, Hugh, just bring you some of the latest results. Um, Roachford is a Conservative hold, Lincoln Labour hold, Epping Forest Conservative hold, as is Nuneaton and Thurrock. Hartlepool we were talking about a little bit earlier, that remains hung. And uh, Wigan in Greater Manchester and Newcastle upon Tyne are Labour holds. Rita, thanks very much. Well, we are trying to focus, obviously, on those contests which tell us most about the relative strengths or weaknesses of the parties, because in so many of these contests, uh, they follow a pattern and, you know, we concentrate on micro changes. But in some of these contests, it's a much bigger fight and they are more significant, I suppose, in terms of the trend of the, the night. So Southampton, Portsmouth certainly fit into the latter category. And Emily Hudson is our correspondent there. Emily, tell us what's going on in the contest uh, where you are. Well, it's certainly going to be a long time before Southampton is added to your results board because they've only just started counting here. It's taken some three hours to verify all the votes. But in terms of Southampton, it is close. The Conservatives won control of this council at last year's election. They took seven seats last year, but actually they only have a majority of one. If Labour can take two seats from them, they will be back in control. So that just gives you an idea of quite how close Southampton is. It's also very interesting because there's never been a Green candidate here, uh, never been a Green, sorry, uh, councillor here down in Southampton. It's been 10 years since there's been a Liberal Democrat and they've done a deal in certain wards where basically they stood aside to support the other candidate. So there is a possibility in certain wards, particularly where the university is, that we may see our first Green councillor for Southampton. As I say though, it is a key battleground between Labour and the Conservatives, proven by the fact that Sir Keir Starmer was here on Tuesday, Boris Johnson was in the Southampton area on Wednesday, obviously one which is high on their list. Um, as you mentioned Portsmouth, just down the road, we're already getting a few results uh, from there and it's not good news for the Conservatives so far. They've lost a seat to Labour and another one to the independent Portsmouth Independence Party. One Conservative there saying he feared a bloodbath. Uh, that's uh, a, a very useful update, Emily. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll be back with you a little later on. Um, interesting, Laura. Really interesting because we've been talking a lot, haven't we, about the geography and the patchwork. But that part of the country, Southampton, that is a classic southern marginal. And Labour's got to show that they're making progress in places like that if they're to look as if they can have confidence that they've got a proper crack at number 10. There's no doubt about it. Those are the kind of English southern seats where Labour has felt a lot of southern discomfort mm. for quite a long time. And the showing advance there is really, really critical. Places like that and Portsmouth too. Uh, what, what, are, what are the parties telling you at the moment? What are you getting? Well, bits and pieces. Uh, the Tories very downcast about London. We've talked about that a lot not just because it's important, which it is, but also because we'll get lots and lots of the results from yeah. London in the first kind of tranche of our, of our programme. Um, the overall sentiment, though, is sort of, from all of the parties really, is as is, is we've been talking about, little bit of forward progress from the Labour Party, evidence of the Tories going backwards a bit, but no sense of kind of massive, all-out panic, big disaster. The Lib Dems, though, from those people I'm in touch with, absolutely cock a hoop so far, especially because in the last few minutes I've been told that they've managed to take Hull Council mm. from 
Labour. Interesting little sidebar there. Their campaigns director also happens to be a councillor on Hull Council. So maybe if they hadn't managed to do that one, he might have been looking at his B45. But the Lib Dems certainly feel that they're shaping up for a decent night. Well, we'll talk to our guests here in the studio in a second. I'd like to have a quick word before that with uh, Joe Tanner, um, former advisor to Boris Johnson uh, and to Aisha Hazarika, who is a former advisor to Labour's Ed Miliband. Thanks both of you for joining us at this uh, at this hour. Um, it's good to have you with us. Uh, Joe, first of all, your take on where we are right now and where you think the Conservatives stand at this time of the night? Well, I guess the answer is we don't know, really. Um, as Laura was kind of saying, it's the it's that classic part of the night where we don't know what's happening because the, the results are coming in at such a, you know, such a pace that it's hard to see a clear picture. I think what's really interesting is the discussion you're starting to have about the Lib Dems, though, which I think many in Westminster can remember the conversation starting straight after the 2019 election, which was many Conservatives saying, hang on a minute, you've concentrated heavily on the North. What happens to those Southern seats where actually we think the Lib Dems will make serious gains at the next general election? And the Lib Dems have always been traditionally very good on the ground in local elections. They've often been very good at, at mobilising themselves, often very good in by-elections as well, which we've seen. So I think the interesting story is you know, we're obviously seeing Labour and, and, and the Conservatives at the moment, we don't quite know what the picture is, but I think the this story about the Lib Dems, actually, I think they could be potentially some of the happiest folks tomorrow. Uh, the implication being that you think the Conservatives have possibly had the wrong focus or what? Well, I think that I think there was a suggestion that, you know, almost the hype around the red wall, blue wall, whatever we're calling it these days, um, <laughs> that actually that big focus on the North which was very significant and you know and extremely important in that 2019 uh, election it it was almost a sense of was there a disproportionate focus and actually was there a concern and, and some people did moot it saying don't forget about those other seats where actually quietly behind the scenes the Lib Dems will just be doing their thing and because particularly when you see at local elections that they have got form for being pretty good well organized you know not necessarily on the, the the national stage you don't necessarily see the Lib Dems getting the airtime you don't even necessarily hear much from them on policy but on a local level they are very good at mobilizing themselves and I think there's potential that they will actually because the row has been very much the public have been pretty pretty fed up I think actually about you know party gate beer gate they're they're fed up with the sort of the yaboo politics they're fed up with the arguments and actually the Lib Dems are almost kind of quietly could come up uh, with unsuspecting really for the two major parties in terms of the, the, the gains that they could be making. Uh, Joe, thanks. Aisha, is that how you see the Lib Dem factor here as well? Uh, and of course, you know, Laura's just told us that the Lib Dems um, have done rather well in Hull at Labour's expense. So how do you see the Lib Dem factor in this election? I think the Lib Dems have been really interesting. I think they've been interesting for quite a while. If you look at two big by-election upsets, North Shropshire, uh, Chesham and Amersham, both Tory strongholds, the Liberal Democrats worked really hard there. They got a very good um, result there. So I think there's this new blue wall that we haven't really been focusing on because we've just all been collectively obsessed with the red wall. Of course, it's really important to keep your eye across the whole country these seats in the southwest, but also these seats outside London, just on the periphery of London, where the Liberal Democrats are doing well. The other people to look out for, I think, are the Greens. I think the Greens are going to have quite a good night, as, as we've been discussing. Sometimes in these local elections as well, people do use that as a chance to, to express a view that they might not want to do at a general election. But the other part of the country, which is incredibly important, particularly for the Labour Party, if they want to have any hope of winning Westminster, is Scotland uh, a place, you know, we talk about the red wall there, there was a, a, a red wall there, fell at the 2015 general election, I remember it well. So I think Labour's going to be looking across the whole country at the moment that the results are a bit patchy. I'm hearing that Labour is cautiously optimistic that it's going to take Wandsworth, um, Barnet and London. But of course, the point you've been making is outside London is very, very important. I'm hearing that the party is saying, look, there's still a way to go but they feel that they are on the right path, that they will be making a, a bit of a fight back. 
but the picture is going to be unclear. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Scotland because Labour could well move back into second position in Scotland, which is, uh, I mean, there's a long way to go against the SNP, but that is a shoot of, of, of potential recovery for Labour. Well, we'll be covering all of those Scottish results tomorrow, uh, Aisha, when the votes are counted there. Um, but you're right, of course, it's a crucial part of this uh, equation. Thank you both very much, and thanks for waiting to talk to us, um, uh, to you, Joe, and to you, Aisha, as well. Uh, Laura, we were listening there very carefully mm -hmm. in terms of um, the way that the, the Lib Dem factor could, you know, one of the contributors mm -hmm. there, there actually used a phrase like could creep up mm -hmm. on uh, the, the, the other parties. Mm -hmm. do, you think that's a, do you think that's a fair assessment at this stage? I, well, look, it's still very early, yeah. but I think certainly when the Lib Dems took that Cheshire and Amersham by-election, that absolutely yeah. took the Conservatives by surprise. Mm -hmm. No doubt about mm -hmm. it. Um, remember also, we've got some more by-elections coming up. Yeah. Probably ne next couple of months are going to be those other kinds of opportunities. I think two big caveats though. Number one, this is local elections. People vote. They think about it in a different way. They're not thinking about who's going to end up in number 10. That said, they are very important stepping stones for parties to build infrastructure, to build out. But that leads on to the next big challenge. Don't forget how much in the last 10 years, the Liberal Democrats, who were at one point in government yeah. as part of a coalition, you know, 50 or 60 MPs, they are a fraction of their former selves. And even if they have a great night tonight, there's a big question about how they would scale up that kind of success. So when you talk privately to the Lib Dems, they'll be pleased and rightly so if this trend continues yeah. throughout the night, if it's still an if. Yeah. But they talk privately about having targets for maybe 25 or 30 seats in a couple of years at the next general election. So for them, there's a question not just of being effective where they're targeting, but also how they would scale up that success that we may see in the next hours. I just want to, before I come to Jonathan and to Deanna, um, just to repeat the note we got from uh, Sir John Curtis, um, because it's useful in this context as well. He said, in those wards where Conservatives, Labour and the Lib Dems fought the ward in both 2018 and 22, the Lib Dems are so far up on average by six points. The, the advance appears to be particularly strong in the more remain parts of the country, including most notably wards where the party standing off in second place um, to the Conservatives. Uh, so far, there's much firmer evidence of the Lib Dems making progress in blue wall territory uh, than there is of Labour making any recovery in red wall England. So that's John's thesis at the moment based on what we have. Uh, Deanna, does that make sense to you? I think it does. I mean, as, as, as Laura and many others tonight have said, it's a bit early to tell, um, you know, there's going to be results counted right up through to sort of tomorrow evening. But looking at the picture so far, that does seem about right. You know, the Lib Dems seem to be doing better sort of in the southeast, maybe a bit in the southwest. Whereas in the red wall, I'd say the Conservative share is largely holding up and Labour seem to be failing to make any progress. Do you think that's fair, Jonathan? No, not remotely. Um, Boris not. Johnson was in Sunderland <laughs> just the other week. He made it his number one target. Prime Ministers don't go and visit councils unless they expect to take it. He failed to take Sunderland Council. Secondly, we're hearing good things from the new council of... Uh, Cumberland, that covers red wall seats like Workington, Carlisle uh, and Copeland. We think we've uh, made advances there. I understand that if you take the aggregate vote across Hartlepool, that would now be a Labour constituency. And then of course, other marginal seats which, which decide the government, seats like Peterborough, seats like Lincoln, we have made advances uh, uh, tonight. So as well as the panic, the meltdown, the Tory meltdown in London, as well as the advances I suspect we will see in Scotland. This is turning into an abysmal night for Boris Johnson, and that's because he's doing nothing to help people with this very severe cost of living crisis. He's, I mean, he's cutting the pension, the biggest cut in the pension for 50 years. He's, Rishi Sunak says it's silly to help people with their energy bills, no wonder the Tories are getting rejected across the country tonight. Well, it's a pretty strange read though, Jonathan, when you're losing seats in Oldham, you're losing seats in Bedworth, you're losing seats all over the country, including in Thurrock, where you've now got fewer no. councillors than you've ever had before. You lose, you've lost in Lincoln, you've lost in Peterborough, you didn't, you had, know, Bo you had Boris Johnson parading around Sunderland, you didn't win, you've lost two, you've, lo you've lost two county council seats in by-elections in County Durham, in, Bishop lost, Alka, in Bishop Awkward and, and, and you've just lost Hull, mate, uh, you've just lost Hull to the Lib Dems, I mean it's not a great night for Labour, is it? It's a terrible night for the Tories and the Lib Dems have always had some strength in uh, in uh, in Hull. Did, and you, actually, expect, did uh, you expect them to do as well? well I'm, I'm sure it's in Diana's notes that she's supposed to say there's a pact 
between the Lib Dems and the Labour Party. Like, well, if there's a, well, if there's a pact between the Lib Dems and the Labour Party, the Lib Dems wouldn't have taken us tonight. Uh, I'm so just there's no time the Tory party giving us that rubbish tonight as the you can be Kit Malthouse was on the other programme. But there programme. is nothing in my notes saying that. <laughs> well, that's good yeah, news. Thank, thank you for feeding me the lines good, I'm supposed to be saying. That's good news saying. because Hull just shows what a ridiculous bit of nonsense that was from Oliver Dowden to just what? sort of try and uh, obscure the fact that the Tories have got nothing to offer the British people who are struggling so much uh, well, in these camp in this, this sorry, elections. Well, I, no, no, uh, I, I, I'm very happy to ask about the Conservative performance. I'm just wanting to ask you about mm. Labour's, which is that, you know, did you expect the Lib Dems to do as well in Hull? We always knew the Lib Dems were strong in Hull. They've got lots of their very senior staff mm. uh, as councillors and candidates in Hull. They've always been very competitive with Labour in Hull. Actually, they ran the council when Labour were in government. Uh, in Hull for many years uh, and for many years the Hull Council was under no overall control so you can actually form a Labour government and not and, and have the Lib Dems running Hull Council let's, we've seen that in the past let, let, let's pause that for a second let's go straight to Hull and to talk to uh, Tim Airedale who's our uh, co colleague there Tim Tim because we're having this debate here and it's great to have you with us um, w what's been the driving force in the Hull campaign Well, the Liberal Democrats, Hugh, have been chipping away at Labour's lead here for some years. It's 11 years since the Lib Dems last ran the council here in Hull. And they've, they've been kind of, kind of quietly making gains in the last four or five years. Uh, until this year, they were in you know, speaking distance of, uh, of control of the council. Now, the Lib Dem gains are coming in thick and fast now. They need at least three seats... Uh, at Labour's expense to take full control of the council. Labour figures here look increasingly gloomy. It does look like the Lib Dems are going to take control of whole city council. Uh, Tim, I'm just, um, just bring us up to date on those gains, if you can, because I'm just looking for the figures here. You said the gains are coming in thick and fast. What's the latest position there? Well, we've, ju we've had two so far Hugh, two Lib Dem gains at Labour's expense so the Liberal Democrats need three gains in total from Labour to take control of the council that's assuming they hold all the other seats they're defending here as well there's also a suggestion that Labour could take the only Conservative held seat here in Hull so Labour could get one back but I don't think it'll be enough I think the Liberal Democrats are going to, going to come out of this election as the largest party here in Hull, probably with overall control by the end of the night. Tim, that's very useful. Thanks very much. Can I bring in um, Manira Wilson, the Lib Dem MP, spokesman on education? Uh, Manira, thanks very much for joining us. Um, what do you make of the news from Hull? Absolutely delighted. Isn't it fantastic news that we've taken control of Hull Council? Um, and it just shows you that this evening we're making gains in the Tory blue wall seats that we're targeting for the next general election. And we're taking seats off Labour in places like Hull. We took a seat off Labour in Sunderland earlier. In fact, we were the only party to make gains in Sunderland, both against the Conservatives and against the Labour Party. What are the factors involved? Are they the same factors? in all of these places to do with national politics or are they more local issues? Uh, I think it's a combination. I mean, obviously the national uh, picture played a huge part in terms of people having lost uh, all trust and confidence in Boris Johnson and uh, his Conservative government and, and distaste over uh, Partygate and feeling taken for granted, but also at a local level. I mean, Hull was obviously being run by the Labour Party and we know that uh, local people were not happy with the way their council was being run. Uh, and we We've got fantastic local champions on the ground there running a, a campaign on, on local issues as we do up and down the country and of course the cost of living crisis where we've been put, putting forward some positive solutions where the government has failed people time and time again. I, I saw in one commentary piece uh, uh, Manira that uh, the period after coalition government for the party has meant that the party is now being 
detoxified. That was the word used. Would you agree with that? I think what it is is that we're seeing that rebuilding from the grassroots. It's you know, uh, it's not a secret. Uh, obviously, that during the coalition, we did lose a number of council seats. That's key to our infrastructure and our campaigning base. And Ed Davey has put our, our field capacity and, and building up our, our campaign uh, resource uh, an absolute priority. And we saw that in the fantastic gains we made in Tory heartlands last year in the Cheshire and Amersham and the North Shropshire by-elections. We've been making steady gains at local council level and we're seeing again tonight already uh, where we're well up against the other two uh, major parties in terms of net gains of council seats. What does it mean for a contest for example in Tiverton and Honiton? What, what are you likely to do there? Well, we were traditionally very strong in the West Country. Uh, we've come closest to the Conservatives in, in recent elections in terms of, uh, well, we came within 2,000 votes of winning that seat uh, back in 1997. The, the closest Labour have come is 20,000 votes behind. So uh, it, will, it will be a challenge. We recently won uh, a by-election there from the Conservatives uh, on the Council. Uh, so we, you know, we'll be, we'll be challenging hard um, and, uh, and you know, I hope to see that we'll have a, a great result, um, but you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Manira, it's Laura here in the studio Hi. as well. Um, Somerset is a new unitary council, yes. and I think that will border up, edge up with that Tiverton That's right. uh, constituency of the by-election. So that will be a real indicator of the hope you might have there. Some sources in your party were feeling quite hopeful about Somerset earlier today, having been out on the doorsteps. What are you hearing from there? Do you think you might be able to take it? Yes, I think Somerset is a, a key indicator for us. At the moment, uh, all I know is that we do hope to make gains there, but it's far too early to tell uh, what, what the result is likely to look like in Somerset. Interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting because you, you said gains. Um, you don't sound confident of, of control. I, I just I, I don't I don't have the latest in, insight from the ground there. So it's just I, I, I'm telling you all, all that I know is that we do hope to make progress in Somerset. Uh, obviously, I, I, I hope we do take control, but but I, I, I don't want to commit to that at this stage. No. And um, uh, as we understand it, it's not counting till tomorrow anyway, as we exactly. say so. <laughs> exactly. So, so, I, can, so yeah. I, I, I can only go on what we know from the doorsteps today. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're forecasting skills are are noted <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting so the, thank you thank you Madeira. on thank the you. other hand i can tell you we're 99 percent sure that uh, west oxfordshire um it, well tories are going to lose control of west oxfordshire council uh which is you know that's the area that covered uh, david cameron's old seat of whitney so that's a, a significant step forward Manira, thanks very much indeed for joining us, Laura. Well, it will be interesting if the Lib Dems can, and to use a terrible geographical metaphor, if they can show over about in the next 24 or 48 hours that they can draw a diagonal line across the country from Summer Somerset all the way up to Hull in the northeast. Now, of course, that's only taking in one part of the country, uh, and there are many, many results still to come. But they will be cock a hoop if they can demonstrate that they are actually winning back different parts of the country, not just nibbling away at conservative um, parts of the southeast and southwest. Back with Jonathan and uh, uh, Diana in a second. Uh, Rita, some other Lib Dem examples that you can pick up for us. Yes, indeed. And you might think, looking at this screen, am I really talking about the Lib Dems? Because you can't see any yellow here. But I can tell you that the Liberal Democrats have picked up seats in all of these local authorities. Uh, four of them are in Essex, Brentwood, Roachford, Epping Forest and Colchester. They've picked up seats there. Uh, Kingston upon Hull, we've of course been hearing some serious speculation that they might be about to turn that yellow. Uh, we, shall, we shall see, hopefully find out very soon. I want to show you some detail uh, about Lincoln. Now, Lincoln is a Labour hold. It's been uh, controlled by Labour for the past decade. Uh, you can see that it has, uh, although they're still counting, it's got past the winning post. But I want to show you what's happened to the seats. So the Lib Dems have gained one seat and the Conservatives have lost one. So that's gone to the Lib Dems. Uh, this is the share of the vote. But the really interesting thing on this screen, uh, try again, is the change in the share. So look at that. The Lib Dems up by eight percentage points. So benefiting from losses by uh, Labour, the Conservatives, UKIP and independents. So, you know, a very striking result there. Um, 
people will be wanting to know what's going on in their own areas. Do remember you can go to the BBC News web website, uh, enter your postcode and uh, just click there and you'll find out what's going on and you can also visit the BBC News app as well. Rita, many thanks. Uh, Rita, thanks a lot for, for bringing us up to date again. Um, let, let's stay on the Lib Dem theme for a second. As we've been reporting, the uh, Conservative leader of uh, Colchester Council, uh, Paul Dundas, has lost his seat to the Lib Dems. Uh, and he's been speaking to our colleague, uh, Simon Dedman. Obviously, you know, people are very concerned about the state of the economy. So they want to send a message and some of them have. To lose a party leader is a big headline. It is a big deal. It's symbolic. What do you think the government should do now to change direction? For example, do you think there should be more done for the cost of living? I think it's probably something they're going to have to look at. I think particularly going into the autumn when we've got fuel bills going up again, potentially, I think that's probably something they will be looking at, yes. Or more generous help? Uh, that's probably what it would amount to. Do you, has Partygate played out here in Colchester as well? I honestly don't know. In all honesty, it didn't come up anywhere near as much on the doorstep as we thought it would. It, well, it wasn't really mentioned a great deal. I think it was far more about the general economic picture than Partygate. Uh, do you think Boris Johnson should stay on as leader? Uh, well, it's not really for me to say. Um, you know, it's above my pay grade. There, that's an MP's decision. Um, but I think that when you look at the situation, particularly internationally, maybe it's not the best time to change Prime Minister when we've got war in Europe. But Westminster politics has played out is playing out here in Colchester tonight, possible other Conservative, well there has been another Conservative loss in the last few minutes. You don't think that this is sending a message to Westminster and that actually maybe the party does need to change at the top? Up, there's a message there, there's no doubt there's a message. And uh, I'm not saying they should change at the top, but I do think Westminster and the wider party does need to listen. So just a sense of um, the reasoning there. Uh, and it was interesting, Jenna, wasn't it, that uh, the message there from uh, from the uh, defeated uh, candidate there was that basically you know this wasn't to do with local issues not to do with local mm -hmm. stewardship not to do with the quality of local services it was to do with much bigger things handled at westminster it was to do with you know the handling of the economy and the fact that people are facing real practical struggles with cost of living now if that is repeated elsewhere that could be a problem for you well, cost of living is, is a huge concern for people right across our country from kind of every walk of life at the moment. You know, the government's put in place this package to try and support people, but some of these factors are so far out of our control, the war in Ukraine clearly not helping. Now, the picture I got on the doorsteps was mixed. Cost of living was, of course, mentioned, but there were a lot of local issues. I mean, I was hearing a lot about quad bikes and antisocial behaviour um, in parts of the world where I was knocking. So those real localised issues really do cut through. And it's up to, you know, individual candidates to do their best to find those local issues and campaign on them to try and turn seats. But obviously very disappointed there to see that we had lose the leader of Colchester. When we looked at the uh, tomorrow's or today's front pages uh, earlier, um, quite a few of them, including papers that are normally conservative supporting, mm -hmm. were saying clearly, you know, extra help's needed. You know, people want the Chancellor to step up and say, OK, we've got that package, but actually, now that we see that people are struggling even more than we thought they would, given the state mm -hmm. of the economy, given inflation and all the rest of it, there should be more help. Is that what you'd like to be saying to voters? Because clearly it's not something you've been able to say in the last few weeks, because the mm -hmm. Chancellor has been on record as saying it would be silly to, you know, put extra measures in now, because we don't know what things will be like by the autumn. Mm -hmm. How frustrating has that been? I think, I think there is something to be said um, on the Chancellor's point there about, you know, we're not sure what that picture is going to look like in autumn. And the thing is, you know, every measure that is put in place is taxpayers' money being spent. And we know the vast amounts of debt we're in at the moment, debt interest repayments alone, topping £80 billion. Pounds. That's £80 billion pounds of taxpayers' money being spent before we've delivered a service, built a new school, built a new hospital. So these are very real things, you know, we can't open the purse completely and spend on everything, but certainly I do hope we can be a little bit more creative in putting in place some additional support. Even things like, you know, temporarily freezing green levies on energy bills could be something that we could look at in the short term to try and reduce the, those pressures on cost of living. There's a lot of conversations going on with Treasury at the moment to try and find creative solutions that don't necessarily cost the taxpayer that much money. But, you know, it's uh, for greater brains than mine to figure out precisely how to make that work. Uh, John, what's your view on this? And, 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 and you know, do, do you take the point that there can't be an unlimited commitment to spending more, given the fact that uh, government's already 
piled up a massive debt uh, after COVID and all the rest of it. Um, what, what is practically possible in terms of offering more help? Well, there's lots of things that could be done. And Diana talks about the situation in Ukraine or the international situation. Well, it wasn't Ukraine that cut universal credit by £20. It wasn't Ukraine that's just imposed the biggest real terms cut in the pension for 50 years on pensioners across the country. There is action that can be taken. Governments could impose a windfall tax on those massive profits that gas and oil producers have been making mm. and use that to take £600 off people's energy bills, but they've not. And that's why the Tories are having such a bad night tonight. In Hales Owen, key seat Hales Owen, uh, uh, we lost it in 2010. We've taken a seat off the Tories in Hales Owen, and I think on my calculation, I'm doing it up via my phone, a 12% swing. We've taken three seats in Wigan across a red wall seat, Lee is now in play for us and I think the Tory MP there should be worrying and the Tory leader in Wigan has just lost his seat and of course coming back we're still getting these very good noises from uh, Cumberland which has got seats like Workington, Work Workington man and woman voting Labour again having deserted Labour in 2019, Copeland where we lost a parliamentary by-election uh, a few years ago and of course Carlisle. So uh, the country is rejecting the Conservatives because they have no answers on the cost of living crisis Inflation is out of control, about to hit 10%. Mortgages have just gone up today. And all we get is more tax, but pensions cut, universal credit cut, and less, for, less delivery in our public services. Oh, Jonathan, can you really sit there though, right now and say that this is a terrible night for the Conservatives? I mean, if we look at the keyboards, yes, the Tories are so far down by three <laughs> points. Labour is also down by but one look the, point. Look at the trends of what we're seeing in the places where well, the these Tories are, the are supposed to be doing the, well. The, I mean, the key we're, about to we're about to lose a council in London it's that they've held forever in, in, one, in Wandsworth. They're about to lose Barnet Council. But this is you, not a good but, night John, for the Conservatives. I know you study these things very, very carefully. You've been in politics for a long time. You were telling Deanna what was in her notes. Maybe this might be, where in your notes does it say that it is a terrible thing for a mid-term government to be down by three points and a good thing for an opposition to be down by mm. one well, point? Where we, where, let's words. see where we are at the end of the evening. Right, so you can't say yet that this, this is definitively a terrible night. For this has been a terrible night so far. When, when they're about to lose Wandsworth Council, they're about to lose Barnet Council, according to the reports. They're losing seats in uh, Hales Owen and Raleigh Regis. They're losing seats in Lincoln. They're losing seats in Peterborough. They're losing seats in Portsmouth. They're probably losing seats in Southampton. Mm -hmm. These are all the battlegrounds of the next general election, and they are being pushed but back. But from what we know so far, the Conservatives have lost 16 seats. Labour has lost 10 seats, including four in Oldham. Now, can mm. Labour yeah, not that, be affording to lose and that, seats And when you look at the Oldham. details of that, that's mm -hmm. that, in those seats, it looks like it's because the independent candidate didn't mm -hmm. stand may well have been a pact between the Conservatives and the Independent, who knows. Well, you can but have the a pact conspiracy can, theories can, 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 But the Independents <laughs> didn't appear to stand, and that's why the Conservatives have taken those seats. That's what it looks like from the initial results I've seen from Oldham. Jonathan, if, if, if I may come in there, I mean, you're saying it's a terrible night for the Conservatives, but we're 12 years into government, in midterm, in really difficult financial circumstances. You're supposed to be a government in waiting, and you're losing seats in Oldham, you're losing seats in Newcastle, you're losing councils in Hull, you're losing seats in town si uh, South Tyneside, Thurrock, Bedworth and Uneaton, Basildon. You are gain. not a government in waiting, are you? Come seats, on, it's but, laughable. But, but, but I'm also very well aware that we got hammered in 2019, which mm -hmm. left us with a tremendous mountain to climb, the most mm -hmm. colossal mountain mm -hmm. to climb. So it's always going to be difficult for us, but we are making progress but tonight and the Conservatives again are doing worse. the accurate worse. comparison on these seats the last time they were fought was 2018. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when actually we well, should I'm make this point... I'm interested in the general, le Indeed, general election. But we though. should make this point though also from viewers when, when people are talking about the, the red wall and actually every seat is different. Lots mm -hmm. of different parts of the north of England are different, but also the red wall as a concept. Nobody had even heard of it in 2018 because mm -hmm. it was a product of the circumstances mm -hmm. of the Brexit debate and then how the mm -hmm. Conservatives pushed in. So just in terms of how we're all bandying around these phrases, let's be really clear and with viewers. These quite. seats were last fought in 2018 mm -hmm. when the red wall, as that uh, the, the, metaphor, had indeed. never even been heard of in and anybody's the wildest dreams. And the red wall wasn't, wasn't Conservative in 2018. Exactly. So if the red wall was sticking with the Conservatives, it would be crumbling in this election. It is not. If you were taking, making the comparison to the 2018 result, mm. then the Tories mm. should be smashing through it. They're not. Deanna? I, I just think some of these false equivalents are absolutely hilarious. You know, we're making gains in, in Hartlepool from the independents. You're making no progress. We'd win You're losing Hartlepool in South Tyneside. You say you'd win the general election based on, on the vote share, but that's not how this works, is it, Jonathan? 
Local elections and general election results do not equate. And we've heard John Curtis saying exactly this. So if you want to go against one of the leading election pollsters to make that equivalent, yeah, that's an, absolutely yeah, fine if it was an by me. aggregate result, you would in Hartlepool. If it was an aggregate result. But local result, election voting and general yeah, election you, voting that's, is that's very always different. The case. That's always why, the case in these discussions. So then why are you, you making the equivalent? Why would you lose four seats in Amber Valley, for example? What, what, well, what's that the is interesting there? because mm. the Tories in Amber Valley are saying the reason they've done so well is because Nigel Mills has called for Boris Johnson to resign. That's what Tories on the ground in Amber Valley are actually saying. So... That's what they're, they're saying it helped them on the doorstep that their MP was calling for Boris Johnson to resign. Well, you'd love to get into that, wouldn't you, Jonathan? That's what they said. That's, that's what they said. That's, 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 that's what it says on that's what BBC East Midlands but, have said. But tonight. what do you say to that, Dana? Because actually, mm -hmm. our, our colleague Tony oh. Rowe on the ground has said that is what local Conservatives are saying to him mm -hmm. there. So there is an example of somewhere where the local MP took it head on, made a decision, said it was a difficult decision. He didn't want to, to say that Boris Johnson should go, but he made that decision. Mm -hmm. And he's actually been rewarded for separating himself from the national leadership. What do you say to that? Well, I haven't been in his seat, so it's hard to know what's being said on the doorsteps. But if that's the feedback from, from local Conservatives, then you've kind of got to take that, that at, at that face value. You? Does that surprise you? Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. There's a lot of frustration around the country at the moment for a whole host of reasons. I think people are quite frustrated with politics and politicians more broadly, actually. And have you found it frustrating, though, because you've often been suggested and written about <laughs> as somebody who's got concerns, somebody who took on a former Labour area in the 2019 mm -hmm. election, who campaigned hard. You must have had some disappointment and frustration with how this has all played out. I have. I think most of the disappointment has been these anonymous briefings, you know, saying I'm part of a coup, that I'm leading a coup. That's the thing that I found the most frustrating about it all. That there is frustration, of course. You know, the Prime Minister's had a blooming difficult hand over the past few years with Covid, the war in Ukraine. There are things that could have been handled a lot better. Mm. I think the Partygate saga is one of those, and I don't, mm. I don't really think the PM would dispute that, really. Mm. But we just need to crack on, don't we? There is so much going on now. I think changing leader right now is precisely the wrong thing. Uh, the, the view being as well that, yes, Partygate may well have been damaging, obviously, but that the cost of living crisis has the potential to be far more damaging uh, if it's not seen to be handled in the right way. And if the government doesn't seem to be stepping up in a much more assertive way. Now, for you as a, uh, an MP who is in a part of the country where you are going to be dealing with people who mm -hmm. are really up against it, um, I, I imagine that you would be telling Rishi Sunak that he needs to up his game in this area. Mm -hmm. I do. I, I don't really like equating cost of living with electoral stuff, only in the sense that it's so much more important than that. Mm -hmm. This is people's day-to-day -day lives and the struggles that they're going through. And absolutely so, right. Yeah, so, so feeding all of these things into Treasury is absolutely crucial, not just yeah. to Treasury, but to the, the team at yeah. number 10 as well, to talk about the struggles that, that people are having. Yeah. And as backbench MPs, as all MPs, that is our role, mm. to try and shape the policy, change the policy and make it really work for people across our constituencies and across the but, country. But I can't believe that people in your area aren't saying we need more help. No, they must be saying that. There certainly is that. And at the moment, one of the things that I'm pushing for is for our council to get that discretionary funding delivered because the government's put in place this huge package, including discretionary funding for individual councils to put in place additional support for people who at the moment might fall through those cracks. I think there is more that we can do and those conversations are ongoing. Um, well, I think we're being joined by Mike Ross, who's the leader of the Lib Dem group in Hull and uh, presumably the next uh, leader of the council. Um, Mr Ross, thanks for joining us and congratulations on, on the performance. Uh, how does it feel? Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, if I could take this opportunity to thank all those people in Hull who have put their faith and trust in the Liberal Democrats tonight to, to serve them. And that's exactly what it looks like we will be forming the next uh, council administration here. As I'm hearing colleagues of mine being declared victorious tonight, we will serve the residents of Hull, whichever way they voted, that will be the job we'll be getting on with. Tell us about the campaign, Mike, and uh, what is it about the campaign that you fought that led to this and the kinds of things that people were telling you locally about your opponents in the sense of what they didn't like? So, you know, the things that played into your court. Well, I was had a, a Labour council now for over a decade and on doorstep after doorstep, residents were telling us they were fed up with the way that this Labour council was treating them, whether uh, the, fact that, the fact they weren't listening to their views or riding roughshod over what they wanted. We had a Labour council that wasn't in tune with the, the priorities of the people in the city. But of course, 
that's the local scene and nationally of course people are also fed up with the, this conservative government and we've seen from Partygate to, to other scandals the way that they have been letting down the people of Hull. So here in Hull people are calling out for change, calling out for change locally and they knew that the only way of getting that was by supporting the Liberal Democrats and it's something that I hope we'll be seeing, I've not had time yet to look at the results elsewhere, but across the rest of the country as well. Uh, the, the national picture, um, how does that dovetail with what you've been campaigning on there? I mean, the kind of concerns that people have been talking about. Well, I mean, this is a local election, actually, what's been really interesting in the last couple of years is locally, people have been raising with us some very local issues and local decisions about uh, the local decisions made by this Labour Council. And it goes back to what I was saying at the start, that the way that the Council hasn't, in their view, been listening to what the public of Hull wants. If it does indeed end up that now with a Liberal Democratic Council, we would be a council that would listen to what the residents of Hull want to see happen in the city. We'd be putting their priorities first. It's something that it's, this city's been crying out for, and we hope that with the Liberal Democrat administration, we'll be able to deliver that change that the public of Hull want. We also recognise, actually, the numbers are very tight if it is a, a Liberal Democrat council, and we'll listen to everybody, be it the residents of Hull, but also our Labour opponents. Mike Ross, good to talk to you, and congratulations again on the results that you've achieved Thank there. You. Um, that's Mike Ross, leader of the Lib Dem group in Hull. Uh, we were talking earlier about Wandsworth Council in South West London, because this, of course, is a, uh, a very, very significant seat, um, a very significant area, very significant authority in terms of the battle between Labour and the Conservatives over the years. It's been Conservative since 1978. Quite a few times Labour have been uh, within reach, but they've not quite got there. So let's talk to the Labour MP for Tooting uh, in the Wandsworth area. That's Rosina Allen Khan. Rosina, good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, are you able to Hello, claim to victory here. for Labour in Wandsworth? It's still difficult to say. It's still uh, lots of votes to be counted, um, but we have made some significant gains already. We have won both seats in Wandrell Ward, which is a ward that many people said we couldn't win. It's very, very clear on the doorsteps throughout the last few months, and especially today on the day, that people are tired of 44 years of the Conservatives managing the council. They don't trust Conservatives not only not to run the country, uh, but to run the council, and it's time for change. So we're still counting votes, uh, obviously many hours to go, but it looks and feels as though it could be a good night. Um, as I understand it, Rosina, there are 47, um, uh, 47 seats to go to declare there. Uh, I think that's right, it isn't still counting. Uh, Labour up one as we speak yeah, and the Conservatives like down one. So it's very tight. Um, I have it's to very, say- Very, very tight. In, in fact, Hugh, yes. Um, no. In fact, I was here in, exactly in, in 2014 where I won my solid Tory seat by just 16 votes and uh, we had a by-election very recently where we won by just one vote so that will let you know what kind of a nail-biter it is tonight. Well indeed and I was just going to make the point that over the years uh, you know it's all it's often been the case that people have had a sharp focus on Wandsworth because it could well go to Labour and of course since 1978 that hasn't happened why would that not be the case well, uh, tonight? Because actually we went from 11 councillors to uh, 19 councillors in 2014 to 27 councillors in 2018. We actually won the popular vote by 154 votes. So tonight it feels possible. Um, we are within touching distance and it would be a huge scalp really for the Tories. This is Boris Johnson's flagship council. If this goes Labour, this will dent him hugely and uh, be a very, very sharp blow for the Tories. Uh, any idea when you might have the final result there? We're expecting the final results about five or six in the morning. We are about to announce, I understand, um, a couple more seats. Um, it's a bit of a nail-biter because a couple of those seats are seats in the Tooting constituency. 
but we have now gone from having just one Labour MP to having all three Labour MPs. It's really, really clear from the doorstep uh, conversations, Hugh, that people are fed up, tired, absolutely wanting change from the Tories and uh, Labour so, so far tonight has been doing well, but it's still too early to tell. Uh, for sure, many counts uh, still to go of the votes, uh, many ballot boxes still to go, but it's exciting. I'm just hearing from down there that there actually are a couple of recounts going on in some wards, but aside from the recounts, actually, a senior Labour source at the count has told one of our colleagues there that it's a Labour win, but there are some recounts to do. Can you shed any light on that? I'm afraid not, um, because I've obviously uh, been... They've been going around all of the different, uh, the different wards supporting the candidates. Um, I remember myself going through recounts, uh, through, through uh, three recounts, and um, that goes to show just what a close fight it is here. So um, obviously, I'm hoping that Labour wins those recounts, it goes in our favour, and that we take the council tonight. Uh, Rosine Allen Khan, very good to talk to you, and uh, we'll, we'll keep a very sharp eye, obviously, on what's going on Thank you in Wandsworth, Laura. Fingers crossed, you. Fingers crossed. Uh, just Thank you. Just another piece of intel from another key London council of Barnet, where Labour have been really working very hard, hopeful of taking it. The Conservative leader of Barnet has told um, our reporter Shelley Phelps, we heard from a bit earlier, saying, I'm disappointed but proud of our Trek record. Um, there are multiple factors in a perfect storm of Conservative national government and the cost of living. I think people seeing a drop in their net pay was another mm. factor. Now, that's not official official confirmation that they've lost it, but the Conservative leader of Barnett telling our colleague that he's disappointed is, um, well, near as damn it, I suppose. And if that's the case, uh, what, what would that mean in terms of what we were talking about earlier? Despite what people might be achieving locally, uh, lots of your colleagues will be maybe feeling rather aggrieved that they've been deprived of, uh, you know, running their own local councils, that may, they may well have been proud of their track record, but they've been let down, as they would see it, by what's been going on in Downing Street and at Westminster. Is that a fair summary? I think there's always a, a range of factors why, why people go out and cast their vote, you know, in, in, some, in some wards, in some councils, there are key local issues that really come out to play more than anything else. I, th I think there will be disappointment um, tonight, particularly around London, which I must admit as a northerner, it's an area I don't know too well to get into the intricacies of it. But, you know, there probably is going to be some disappointment here. We were kind of expecting that. And, you know, looking at a broader picture, we are 12 years into government in midterm. Um, it's hardly surprising that we will lose seats. And there does seem to be this shift at the moment towards us gaining support in other parts of the country over recent years. But unfortunately, losing some of it here in London. Um, OK, let's just um, get a quick update on... Peterborough, because this is a, a, another area of great interest mm. for us um, and, uh, and, and a certainly a big test. So um, uh, Ben Schofield is our correspondent there. Uh, ben, what's going on? Well, they're about to start sweeping up here, Hugh. 19 councillors uh, have had their votes counted and 19 results are in and it is the status quo that has ruled the day here. Labour gained one seat but the Conservatives gained another elsewhere so all of the numbers stay exactly the same. It's a council with uh, 60 seats. The Conservatives went into uh, this morning holding 28 of them. On paper of course they just needed three to get a majority but that proved too big an ask. Talking to the council leader, uh, Conservative and the city's Conservative MP. Both of those were very buoyant though, putting a very uh, optimistic gloss on what's gone on here tonight. The MP saying that this is a really good result against a very difficult set of national issues. I asked the council leader what the issues were that gave us the results that we got today. He said it wasn't anything to do with, for example, a £27 million budget deficit that the city councils had to grapple with uh, or any local issues. He said it wasn't even national issues. Boris Johnson has uh, a very favourable reception here, he said. What he said was the issue was that the Liberal Democrats who were holding what were considered to be some vulnerable seats, he said they campaigned like Trojans and were able to hold all the four seats that they were defending. But Labour too are also putting an optimistic spin on what's happened here. Uh, they say that they think they've got enough support to start negotiations with the Liberal Democrats, with the Greens and with uh, an independent group called Peterborough First to try to form a new administration. Uh, he says those negotiations are going to start uh, on Monday. Ben, uh, thanks very much. Um, 
Ben Schofield there with the latest in Peterborough for us. Let's get a quick word uh, from Henry Hill, who's Deputy Editor of Conservative Home, and from Alita Adu, who's the political correspondent at the Daily Mirror. Um, Henry, first of all, uh, what's your reading of where we are so far? Well, it certainly doesn't seem to be the sort of result which is going to shake Conservative MPs to move against the Prime Minister, which I think from the perspective of Westminster was really the question going into these local elections, given that Tory MPs have so far not managed to mobilise against Boris Johnson during Partygate, would this be the sort of result, the sort of seismic result that might force more of them to feel that they had to put their letters in and make a decision because otherwise, you know, they didn't want this man leading them into the next election. Now, of course, it is early days. There are many results still to come in, but you can already see the Tories losing some major councils. If they have lost one worth, that's, that's an extraordinary result. But you can see how with some signs of minimal progress sort of elsewhere in the country, the Prime Minister's allies might be able to spin this. Uh, that's uh, Henry, just on that basis, I'll come to Alita in a second. Um, uh, just on that basis, uh, we, we're looking at two basic blocks of contest here, aren't we? We're looking at London, which is principally, if I can put it in this way, a, a Labour city. And then we're looking at very important areas, obviously, around the uh, around England tonight, which are uh, not not London, obviously, but they are areas where Labour has suffered because of the Conservative uh, inroads, certainly in those uh, leave areas in the north, etc. You think that on the basis of where we are right now, that the Conservatives have done well enough in the context for Boris Johnson to be feeling comfortable? Is that right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't personally think that uh, necessarily. I'm just trying to give you my reading of of where Tory MPs are likely to come down. I think there's two real danger signs for the party. The first is uh, they've been dubbed these blue wall seats, seats where there is a real danger of the Liberal Democrats coming up and taking uh, either seats they held before the 2015 election or even seats that the Conservatives have held for a long time. And the other, I, I do think the Conservatives do need to be more worried about London. There's a, there's da there's a danger that they've priced it in. As you, as you say, London is a, is a quote unquote Labour city, but Boris Johnson, part of his appeal, part of his power was that he did win London for the Conservatives. And of course, if the, if the, if the Tories are moving towards a position where they're simply not competitive in London, well, London is, a, in terms of Westminster seats, London is bigger than Scotland. It's a real handicap if they're entirely uncompetitive in the capital and if they lose their flagship councils and they risk losing even more seats and their seat count is already well down where it was even in 2010, I think the Conservative Party does need to not, it can't afford to just write that off and say, well, London is a Labour city. It needs to have a real reckoning with why this party, this party of government is so unappealing to sort of 8 million voters in this country's capital. Alita, can I ask you to address Labour's performance? How do you read that so far? Um, well, we must remember that uh, Labour did significantly well at the last local elections in 2018. But obviously the backdrop of this election is completely different to what was back then. We now have a Prime Minister that is now found guilty of breaking the law, the law that he has himself set. We are now in the midst of a really bleak cost of living crisis. I mean, yesterday we heard from the Bank of England that inflation is going to be skyrocketing to double di digit figures as high as 10%. And that has really resonated with people across the country at the doorstep. And I've heard that from senior Tory campaigners, senior Tory sources, and also the Labour Party and the Lib Dem parties too. And um, it's interesting to hear Henry talk about um, Boris winning the London city. Of course, that was, you know, it's a historic thing. Um, I've heard privately from senior Tory MPs who are es essentially saying that Boris's future rests on these election results. And there are still massive results to come yet. We're still yet to hear from Westminster and Wandsworth, seen as, you know, the Conservative Party's crown jewels. And, you know, I, I, from what I've heard from sources, it's not looking good at all. In fact, they're expecting the worst. Um, to quote one source, they said, well, I've just packed up and left. And I was simply sent me a message with expletives that I cannot repeat for the sake of television. Um, so it seems as though they acknowledge um, that it's not their best performance. But, you know, will Downing Street and number 10, will the officials in charge take a hint and maybe try and solve this cost of living crisis. We had 
Chancellor Rishi Sunak recently saying that it would be silly to provide support for the poorest households across the country, which is, you know, extraordinary hearing that, you know, people are really struggling and really trying their best to make ends meet. Now, obviously, this is also a very key test for Keir Starmer. Um, we're hearing from Barnett. Apparently, Labour sources are saying it's looking pretty good. And that would give Keir a really positive story to take back you know, to his next campaign because it was murdered with issues of anti-Semitism before. And I heard from a number of people that they turned against the Labour Party um, essentially to condemn the actions, to, con to condemn the leadership for not doing enough to help the Jewish population within that, um, within that space. Um, so if they were to take Barnett, that would be great for Labour. Um, and there's still many more results to come, we must remember. It's only half yeah. two in the morning. Uh, Alita, I do thank you very much. And uh, to uh, uh, Henry as well, thanks very much uh, indeed to both of you, because um, Henry, of course, is Deputy Editor of Conservative Home, Alita, a political correspondent at the Daily Mirror. Um, uh, Diana, I know that you're going to leave us in a second. Mm. Um, but you've got other outlets to go to, um, uh, s s such as the uh, such as the run of events overnight. Mm -hmm. Some thoughts before you leave us on whether you are heading in the right direction in the areas where you need to. Nothing to do with Boris Johnson's mm -hmm. future, nothing to do with whether he's going to fe face a leadership challenge or any of that stuff. Um, but, you know, the party, as it looks to its own uh, health, if you like, mm -hmm. electoral health uh, in the next two years. On the basis of what you're seeing here, are you telling viewers that you are relatively comfortable with that? A little bit early to tell. I think we've only got about 17% of seats declared now, so still obviously a, a very long way to go. Um, but certainly based on kind of some of the, the forecasting we were seeing, I don't feel uncomfortable at, the, at this moment in time. Obviously very disappointing for some of those candidates who've worked really hard and have, have found themselves defeated and disappointed. But actually for a government 12 years in midterm, I don't think it's a bad night for the Conservatives at all. And in some of these red wall areas, we are still making progress. Uh, John, so uh, we're, we're going to the news in a second. You're staying with us, I hope, yes? I, uh, I, I am, yes. yes. you are. Don't look so sad about it. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm delighted. Uh, I'll stay but, all night, if you like. But, but, but all to, morning. <laughs> just a, a, a stock take from you as well before we go to the news. Well, I mean, I think the Conservative leader of Carlisle have just, has just said Boris Johnson's position is untenable. So you can see the ructions in the Tory party. And while the Tory party is completely divided at each other's throats, they're failing to address this desperate cost of living crisis that people are struggling with at the moment. And that, that's the real tragedy of the situation we are in. We need a government with focusing on the cost of living crisis rather than ripping themselves apart. I'm sure that uh, Richard Holden, who's going to sit in that seat in a few moments, will answer that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for the moment, thank you both very much. And uh, Diana, thanks for joining us. Laura and I are staying here, obviously. Okay. Um, let's join Tim again for the news. Hugh, uh, thank you very much. A summary of the BBC News. Uh, early results, as we've been hearing in local elections in England, show small swings from the Conservatives to Labour. And the Liberal Democrats have seen an increase in support so far, particularly in Conservative areas. Voters in England, Wales and Scotland have been casting ballots to decide thousands of local authority seats. Northern Ireland has been choosing a new Stormont Assembly. Our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. Voters across the country went to the polls to elect thousands of local councillors who will run their services and set their council tax. All the political parties can do now is watch and wait as the votes are counted. For Boris Johnson and the Conservatives, these elections appear to have been the opposite of a walk in the park. The Tories are bracing themselves for a potentially bad night, especially in London and parts of the south of England. All eyes in particular are on the London borough of Wandsworth. The Tories have held it for 44 years, but it has been tipped to go Labour this time round. Westminster and Barnet are also being closely watched tonight, and outside of the capital, Southampton, although the Tories are hoping their vote has held up in other parts of England. The Tories have held several councils, including Harlow in Essex, but in Worcester, the Conservative council leader left the building before a single vote had even been counted. Morning. For Keir Starmer, there's pressure to show he's finding a way back in for Labour. The party has held the key council of Sunderland, but with a smaller majority. We've got a win in the south, we've got a win in London. Let, it's a long night 
and a long morning. Let's see where we end up. But to start with winning Sunderland, I'm a very happy man on a 43% share of the vote. Very happy indeed. Expectations of big. But Labour says it does expect the results to show progress from what it calls the disastrous 2019 general election. You didn't, yeah. know, yeah. While the Conservatives and Labour debate their performances so far... You've lost two county council seats in by-elections in County Durham, Bishop lost, Auckland, in Bishop Auckland and, and, and you've just lost Hall, mate. Uh, you've just lost Hall for the Lib Dems. I mean, it's not a great night for Labour, is it? But it's a terrible night for the Tories. For the Liberal Democrats, all smiles. Ed Davies said he was optimistic about their chances. They look on course to take Hull Council from Labour. They've taken some notable Conservative seats too, like that of the leader of Colchester Council. Being honest, local politics are always affected by the national picture. They always have been and they always will be. I'm not sure if it's necessarily about the state of Westminster uh, politics, but I think probably concerns about the economy are probably the biggest, biggest issue. The Greens are making early gains too, their co-leader Adrian Ramsey casting his vote earlier. Not all councils are counting overnight tonight, the rest will start tomorrow. And these elections are about local issues, but as the results come in, they will also paint a national picture. Helen Catt, BBC News. Well, there will be no counting either until later this morning in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. In Scotland and Wales, where people can vote from the age of 16, seats in all councils are being contested. Voters in Northern Ireland will elect members of the Assembly. Uh, it comes just a few months after the Democratic Unionist Party resigned from the First Minister's role, causing the executive to collapse. If you want to find out the result in your area, go to the BBC News website or BBC News app. Just put your postcode in. You'll also find lots of analysis and the latest reports from our teams around the country. In other news, interest now rates... Now back to election 2022 with Hugh and Laura. Welcome back to the BBC's Election Centre and uh, we are keeping tabs on the English local elections as they come in overnight. Tomorrow they'll be counting in more of the English uh, local authorities plus Wales and Scotland and the Assembly in Northern Ireland. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, I think we have roughly 38 of the English councils so far declared out of 146 or so. Um, so while we welcome the Conservative Richard Holden has just joined us. Welcome Richard, good morning. Good morning Hugh. Nice to see you, thanks very much. John is still with us um, and Laura too. Let's have a word with Rita just to bring us up to date with the latest results. Yes, Hugh, we're about a quarter of the way through the counts now, and this is how it stands. This is changing all the time, of course, and as you can see, uh, Labour's net losses are now down to minus five. That could still change, but at the moment, minus five, whereas the Conservatives are now on minus 36. Uh, we've been talking about a, a good Lib Dem performance and a good Green performance, and you can see that illustrated here. Again, the night is young, but this is what has happened uh, so far. The Liberal Democrats have picked up 21 councillors, and the Greens now have 17 councillors, of which they've gained 13 tonight, so they'll be very happy with that. Um, let me bring you some of the latest results as well. Now, these are all um, local councils where there's been no change in terms of who is uh, in control. Um, Southampton, they are still counting, and I'll come to Southampton in a moment. But although they are all Labour or Conservative holds or Bolton remains hung, there are changes behind the scenes. So in Redditch and in Chorley, for example, the Conservatives have lost three councillors in each of those, in both of those local authorities. In Tameside, Labour has lost two seats, and Tameside is where Angela Rayner, the party's deputy leader, has her Westminster seat. Uh, in North East Lincolnshire, the Conservatives have lost a seat. In Bolton, they've gained one. So a fairly patchy um, picture from around the country. Let's take a look at what's happening in Southampton, where as I said, they are still counting. They're about a third of the way through the count. Uh, this is a council that the Conservatives picked up last year. And as you can see, it was Labour for several years before that. Um, I want to show you 
this is the seat change. As I say, we're only some way through the count, so Labour has picked up a seat from the Conservatives. But what's really interesting is to see the change in the share of the vote. So there you have it. The share change since these seats were last um, voted on is a 7%, a 7 point swing from the Conservatives to Labour. Now, if that is replicated throughout the council, that will mean that Labour will take Southampton. Peter, thanks very much. Well, one of the things that's important for us to focus on here is if we can really discern different patterns, let's say between North and South of England, because that's been, we've been talking a little bit about the way that those patterns have changed and the fact that London is a bit of a, a Labour island, if you like. Um, so John Curtis is going to join us because uh, John's been looking at the, the North-South divide. Um, and can we define that in a little more detail, John? Yes, well, obviously by the south of England, we basically mean for the most part places south of uh, the wash through to Bristol, um, uh, but that's excluding London. Um, the interesting thing that we are finding is, and it doesn't matter whether you make the comparison with 2018 or indeed with last year, is that the Conservative votes, the Conservatives are finding it much more difficult to hold on to their vote in the south of England than they are in the north. Um, and the, to that extent, at least, therefore, the Conservatives are losing ground rather more in places of their traditional strength and, of course, places from which a lot of Conservative MPs come from. So although the national picture for the Conservatives may not look quite so bad as we might have been anticipating at the beginning of the night, quite a few Tory MPs are going to be finding that locally they still suffer something reverse and Southampton in a sense is an illustration. The interesting thing however is then to try to work out why this is the case and to be honest we've not entirely got to the bottom of it yet but what isn't the case, it isn't the case that the Labour Party is doing particularly well in the south of England and you know the Liberal Democrats only uh, marginally so also. One of the things that we are picking up, again, this is another bit of a story of the night where we need to look beyond the two big parties, is that some independent candidates are doing rather well. Um, in our key wards, where there's an independent candidate in the ward, they're actually getting about a fifth of the vote. And in Portsmouth, there's, a, there's an in, Portsmouth independent party that's running at over a quarter of the vote. And in some instances, at least, part of the reason why the Conservatives are losing out in the south of England is they're losing out to independents. Now, of course, we in many senses over the last 20, 30 years had thought that independence had more or less disappeared from uh, English uh, councils and party policies taken over. Well, there may be just a little footnote in tonight's story whereby actually we're going to see not only a few more Liberal Democrats and a few more Green councillors, but maybe we're going to get a few more independents too. On the uh, actual uh, difference between now and 2018, John, just looking at the, uh, the figures there, uh, with the Conservatives losing ground to, to the power of nine points in yeah. the south, three in the Midlands, two in the north. So um, I'm just wondering if that is translated <laughs> into a kind of broader thought about your know, parliamentary constituencies, uh, is that going to be enough to make Conservative MPs not just jittery, but positively... Uh, angry and agitated about the leadership of the party? Um, that's perhaps going a little bit too far because of course what isn't the case and it was the other crucial bit that I said that it isn't clear that it's the Labour Party that's particularly making a strong advance in the south of England. So um, yes there is obviously reason for Tory MPs in the south of England to have a degree of worry but at the moment at least it's not clear that it's the Labour Party that's profiting so that may in the end persuade them to stay their hand. Uh, and Midlands and North, I mean again the North is interesting given what happened in 2019 yeah, in parliamentary sure. terms. Um, what's your reading there of the, uh, the, the Conservative slippage of just 2%? Well it's an, it's an indication of how in what you know was once by far and away a relatively difficult terrain for the Conservatives until Brexit came along, 
as to how it looks as though that vote that the Conservatives gained uh, in the 2017 and 2019 elections north of Birmingham is proving in some senses rather more robust than the more traditional Conservative vote uh, further south. And of course, the Cheshire and Amersham by-election was a warning to the Conservative Party that it was potentially at risk. And as, and as we've said earlier in the programme, some of this damage, certainly when it comes to uh, seats being lost, is being done by the Democrats. Uh, just a final thought at this point, John, if I may. If we're looking at, um, you know, a headline narrative for the <laughs> results so far. Um, and yes, I, you know, of course, we acknowledge there's lots to come. Um, what would you say if somebody pitched up now and said, hang on, John, I haven't seen any results. I've no idea what's going on. Um, you know, what's the story so far? What would you say? Well, subject to the crucial caveat that we've not had that much in from London yet, although... We're getting to get a trickle of results in from Wandsworth and it looks to us, but it is difficult because of all boundary changes, that if things carry on as they are, then maybe Labour will just make it in Wandsworth. But I think the story so far is that, yes, the Conservatives, these results are confirming that the Conservatives have suffered something of a rebuff from the electorate during the course of the last 12 months and that their support is clearly down on where it was 12 months ago. But that what isn't the case is that the Labour Party is clearly demonstrating that it's the party that's uh, necessarily profiting from the Conservatives' difficulties. And that indeed, at the moment at least, the Labour Party, uh, you know, because its vote is down, it seems, on 2018, uh, the Labour Party may find itself at the, uh, the uh, end of tomorrow afternoon unable to say that they have done better in these local elections than Jeremy Corbyn did in his best local elections uh, back in 2015. And that, shall we say, perhaps will uh, add a certain coolness to whatever Labour celebrations uh, there might be. Meanwhile, what we've also discovered, uh, two other things, is that, well, that uh, one, the Liberal Democrats perhaps, perhaps, are finally beginning to show a measure of recovery from the disaster of the 2015 general election which followed the coalition um, and that certainly they're showing some signs of having built, built on their two parliamentary by-election successes last year and that also we're getting reminder in an era when climate change is becoming increasingly important on the agenda that the Greens that the opinion polls have been telling us for quite a while are you know, doing relatively well are indeed now a force in English politics that cannot simply be ignored. John, great to talk to you again. Thank you. Um, it's John Curtis there. Um, can I come to you, Jonathan, yes, first on that? Because, uh, you know, in his usual measured way, yeah, uh, John was saying, yes, of course, there are some gains. Um, but as far as Labour's concerned, it's not in that range of gains so far, which would suggest that, you know, there is a serious shift going on. Do you accept that? Well, I mean, we've still got some way to go. But yeah. we're, we're nearly on about 400 seats and we're now making net gains. The Tories are down about, are almost down 50 seats and it will get worse. The Tories will lose more tonight. We've just gained two seats in Derby North. One seat that we lost by one vote last year, I think it was. We've gained it with a majority of nearly 1,000 tonight in Derby North. That's currently a Tory held seat. Cumberland Council, it's confirmed we've taken that. So seats like Copeland, Workington, would be in big trouble if that result translated to a general election. Just made three gains in Chorley. That's the Speaker's seat at the moment. When, but when it is not, when it, when it doesn't return a Speaker of the House of Commons, it's a classic Labour Tory marginal seat. We've just gained three Tory seats in Chorley. Just gained Formby in Southport. Southport is a target seat for us at the next general election. So we are making gains, but we've always said we had a mountain to climb from that terrible, terrible result in 2019 but we are making progress there's confirmation that the lib dems have gained uh, kingston upon hull let's have a look at the figures uh, lib dems on 29 labor on 27 majority of one lib dems are up three uh, and labor's lost uh, two seats there in uh, kingston upon hull if we look at the change of seats uh, and the conservatives are down one there we go confirmation of that and uh, uh, just to have a quick look again at Cumberland, because John's just mentioned that Cumberland is a Labour win. 30 seats to Labour, 7 to the Tories, 4 to the Lib Dems, majority of 14. 
Uh, and if we look at the change of seats there, it's Labour up 12, uh, the Tories down 14. So the narrative, Jonathan, is mixed. Uh, Kingston upon Hull, clearly. You'll be disappointed with it. Yeah, of course we're disappointed. But the Lib Dems have always traditionally been strong there. They did run the council when we had a Labour government there. So that, that is disappointing. I think the Tory has lost their seat to Labour in Hull, though, for what it's worth. But look, that's a disappointing result. But elsewhere, we are making progress. But we always had a mountain to climb from uh, 2019. Richard, thanks for joining us. Um, you are MP in, uh, for Durham, um, and you know that northeast area obviously is crucial in this matrix as well. Um, w w how do you read the performance of the of the Tories so far? We know what's going on in Wandsworth; it's very tight, but you could lose that. Um, Barnet doesn't look great, no. um, and we've 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 clocked some other losses elsewhere. Where's this going, do you think, for you? Look, it's always going to be tough in the midterm for a government that's been in power for uh, quite a while now. But one of the things that I've been really encouraged by, just been seeing some results coming in from Greater Manchester, Bolton made a gain there, Oldham uh, made gains there, including taking out the Labour council leader. Um, I was up in Bury during the campaign. That doesn't count till tomorrow. Mm. But um, I think, you know, we might be doing all right there. And I think. I sort of agree with what uh, Sir John Curtis was saying, really. You know, uh, uh, you know, Labour really aren't the ones who are making the progress that they need to if they were going to be looking at, at, at government. And, you know, across the country, you've seen some places like Nuneaton and Bedworth, a real uh, marginal seat in terms of general election. Conservatives c are continuing to make gains. Places like Thurrock, where Labour really do need to gain those seats in the general election context. Uh, Amber Valley. You know, there's the uh, Harlow, you know, for certainly from those uh, late 90s, early 2000s, was a, it was a Labour seat, you know. So they've, they, they needed to go much further than where they've been going. And for John to crow at this stage in an electoral cycle about the main opposition party currently looking at a net gain of four. I mean, we might see a few more coming in from London soon, but it's, uh, it's hardly really uh, punching through, is it? Uh, w when we talk about um, the, the, the broad picture, Richard, uh, and you've been out campaigning, I mean, just be upfront up about it. Were, were people telling you they, they, they didn't trust Boris Johnson anymore? They didn't like his conduct on Partygate? Were, were they questioning that? Or were they more angry about cost of living issues? The, the fact that the government, in their view, maybe isn't providing enough help? What were they saying? I think the biggest issues on the ground in the... So I, I went to uh, Stoke, I went to uh, Hindburn, uh, Burnley, some of the Mid Wales seats, uh, and up in the North East as well. Um, people are feeling uh, squeezed on at the moment. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but that's uh, the biggest thing that came on up on the doorstep. Really, was council and council services and what councils are doing to help them. Um, I know the government has been put quite a lot of cash into, uh, which hasn't actually gone out yet. I think that was a particular issue. I've had my own constituents. We don't have elections this year, but asking where that 150 pounds is yet. Um, and I think some of the councils have been a bit slow about getting that out, but I think people do need to feel that we're on their side, and uh, that's one of the things that we really need to ensure gets through into people's pockets as quickly as possible. Um, I'll put that point then to John Mallinson, who's the Conservative leader of Carlisle City Council. Uh, Mr Mallinson, thank you very much for joining us, and um, to just tell us, just to share with viewers, what's gone on in Carlisle? Well, we've had a very bad night in, in Carlisle, Isle, Carlisle, I'm afraid. We were uh, holding the first elections for the new shadow authority. We moved into unit three authorities, uh, council of 46, and over the three districts that are joining, I think we've got seven, and we were, we were looking at over 20, but a really bad night. In Carlisle, we only held three seats. What were the reasons, do you think? What were people telling you? Number of things really, mostly national. It was difficult to uh, to drag the debate back to uh, local issues. We were trying to steer off the national the national issues, but uh, things were cop uh, prop uh, cropping up. Uh, party gate was a big thing, um, and of course the cost of living crisis. And I don't think it wasn't helping. We were getting comments from uh, people like I think it was George Eustace talking about people. Um, using value brands uh, to ease their shopping bills. Well, that just seems to have gone over very patronising, and people have not like have not liked it. I managed to retain my seat, but uh, we've lost some very good colleagues, which I'm very disappointed about. So, it, Councillor, sorry, 
Um, Councillors, Laura Kunzberg in the studio here as well. I mean, you've, you've said there one cabinet minister people felt was patronising them by suggesting how they might cut costs. What were people saying to you about Boris Johnson and his leadership? That is a lot of animosity towards the Prime Minister at the moment. I think it's party gate, it's not just party gate. Um, there's the, the integrity issue, basically, I just don't feel people any longer have the confidence that the Prime Minister can be relied upon to tell the truth. That's quite a big thing to say, isn't it? Well, that's what people have been saying to me. And do you think that's fair? I can see that point of view. So what should happen then, Councillor Mallinson? Do well, it, it's not something I get a decision in, but I, I would expect that uh, the chairman of the 22 committee will, will shortly receive 54 letters and there will be um, will there be some sort of a process? I, I, I don't know whether, whether the parliamentary party will close ranks around Boris or they will seek to replace him. That's, uh, that's above my pay grade, really. But you're being very clear with our viewers tonight as far as you're concerned. One of the central reasons why your councillor colleagues lost out was because voters have lost their faith in Boris Johnson and therefore, in your view, you're saying MPs should move him on. That would be my preference, yes. What do you say to that, Richard? Look, I, I can quite understand if uh, I'd been in the situation of that council leader losing colleagues, I'd also feel very bruised at the moment. Uh, obviously, they've got a new council up there in Cumberland, a totally different system to what they've had before. Um, but genuinely on the ground, the issues that I've been coming across are around cost of living. Uh, they are around concerns about the a broader economy, but I, uh, that's, that's what I'd say at the moment. Um, I, I think I, I genuinely, on the doorsteps, the, uh, all the, the issues that uh, councillors were raising there were not the ones that I, were, the, were the top priority for voters that I came across. Uh, Councillor Mallinson, I, I'm just wondering, on the cost of living issue, what were people saying there about the level of help and support that uh, government is offering? Um, it doesn't seem to have struck a note at all. People didn't uh, didn't really connect with me on those subjects. I, you know, when I tried to engage, people didn't really come over. Uh, didn't really want to talk about it. I just didn't feel they were receptive. Not receptive to the message the government's been giving. No, I think it's seen as. Um, it may be, it may well be as much as the count, as the government can do at the moment, but it's certainly not. I don't believe it is seen as enough in in uh, in, in in the public's eye. We are, I'm afraid, in over the last few decades, we have been used with our our standard of living rising consistently year on year. That is not happening, and I think people are um, people are. Um, very uncomfortable at, about that scenario. People are talking about, you know, wondering if they can pay the mortgage, wondering how they can save a bit of money on the food bills, etc., etc. And it's just getting harder. Fuel is very, you know, fuels now 170, 180 a gallon. I know we're all moving to electric cars, but that's going to take some time. So um, it's just all very difficult. We've got a very difficult year or two ahead of us inflation is going to peak at 10 percent and it's going to get very very uncomfortable for people Mr. i don't it's bit i'm sorry to interrupt it's it's really good of you to talk to us it's uh very late uh, it's early in the morning so thank you so much for joining us john mallison there from the uh, uh from carlisle um, i'm going to bring in there um the uh, former conservative um pollster uh, James Johnson, former Downing Street poster, so still a poster, of course. Um, James, it's good to talk to you. Good morning. Morning. Um, right. Well, let, we've just heard there quite a strong contribution from John Mallinson, um, the Conservative group leader on Carlisle City Council, making his views very plain about Boris Johnson and uh, his effect on the campaign. What are you picking up in your polling? So throughout this campaign, really since January, the message in the focus groups and in the polling has been pretty consistent. Voters are very angry about the Partygate situation and are particularly frustrated 
about the way that they feel that Boris Johnson and the Conservatives seem to have covered it up or, or, or not been straight with voters on that issue. And although that when you ask voters what they're going to vote on in these elections, local issues did certainly come to the fore, <coughs> as well as the cost of living, um, there is real frustration out there about Boris Johnson, and that's bubbling beneath the surface. And think I think that's had a big impact on these elections. Uh, given what we've seen of the results so far, um, James, uh, you know, we've been talking about the fact that uh, it's difficult to discern a, a clear narrative so far. Um, are these results, if they persist in this way, are they going to be enough to shake Conservative MPs into changing their view on whether Boris Johnson should survive as leader? So what we're certainly not seeing here is a wipeout for the Conservatives. Um, we're not seeing a situation uh, like in the 90s, uh, like in the early 2000s, where the Conservatives were really behind Labour on seats, nor are we seeing a Blair-style recovery for Labour. Um, they're clearly uh, not making big gains. But in some ways, that's even more dangerous for Conservative MPs. The Conservatives don't need a Blair-style defeat in order to lose power. They can lose their majority in a general election while ahead on votes. And actually, if you look at what's happening in those key northern Midland seats, as they're called the Red Wall, yes, on 2018, where these elections last took place, Labour is standing still or going backwards. But actually, when you look at the change uh, on 2019, you actually see a small swing towards Labour. So Labour are doing as well in the Red Wall tonight as they were when they held the Red Wall. And that is concerning for Conservative MPs before you even get on to Labour gains and Lib Dem gains and Green gains in their heartlands in London and the South. Whether it will be enough is obviously a, a, another question. But I think you hear from these council leaders and you hear increasingly from Conservative MPs, there are, are worries out there. And although this isn't a great wipeout for the Conservatives, it certainly should spell concerns for them. James, we talked about polling uh, perceptions on Boris Johnson. Uh, what about Keir Starmer? What do, what, what do people make of him? There's not much love for Keir Starmer um, in bad news uh, for the Labour Party. Uh, people say that he's not very strong. They say he's quite bland. Uh, they say he's lacking direction uh, and vision. Um, the reason, though, that Keir Starmer is doing a little bit better than Boris Johnson in the polls is because they think much less well of Boris Johnson. And Keir Starmer even beats Boris on some of those uh, attributes like strong uh, and get things done, which are very, very important to swing voters. So, yeah, they're certainly not animated by him. I think you see a bit of that coming through in these results tonight. I expect that when we ask voters, which we're going to which we've been doing throughout the throughout the local elections, um, why they didn't vote for Labour, I expect we'll probably see Keir Starmer quite prominent in there. The thing is, when Boris Johnson is as unpopular as he is, it doesn't much matter. James, good to talk to you. Thank you very much. James Johnson, their former Downing Street pollster. Richard Holden, we've just heard there James Johnson pollster basically say that many voters have lost patience with Boris Johnson. Moments after you had a Conservative Council leader, activist on the ground, saying that voters have lost faith in his integrity and that you as a group of MPs should move Boris Johnson on. And he even said that people felt patronised by a cabinet minister. Now, you, you told us that wasn't what you heard on the doorstep, but surely that must worry you. I think what Councillor Mullinson then went on to do and deep dived a bit more was talk about some of those cost of living issues. Now, Cumberland's a very similar sort of part of the world to my seat in North West Durham. Uh, very rural, uh, things like petrol prices, uh, heating, major concerns for people. People and are we, feeling and squeezed have, And we've moment. talked about that a lot, but he raised a very specific point about the integrity of the Prime Minister that he as a Conservative activist said people didn't believe that he had integrity anymore and there should be a leadership contest. And then we heard a pollster say that many voters across the country are telling him the same. As a Conservative MP, you must be worried about that, surely. Even if you don't agree, you, you must be worried. I, looking at the results that are coming through here tonight, we've seen around a quarter of the councils now declared um, Labour aren't going anywhere. They're level pegging at best. In fact, we're seeing them slightly down at the moment. Um, and the Conservative Party is holding up in large parts of the country and making progress in, in places like Greater Manchester, which is where I would like to see is, uh, you know, uh, which is which is very important for us. So no, I, I don't share those concerns because I'm not seeing that reflected by these results. People aren't saying we want to see a change of government. They're not switching over in large numbers to 
uh, the Labour Party. In fact, Jeremy, we've got to remember in 2018, Jeremy Corbyn fought these results at the moment. It looks like Keir Starmer's level pegging with Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and perhaps even going slightly behind in some areas. But doesn't it make you feel uncomfortable to hear a fellow Conservative say he doesn't think the Prime Minister's got integrity? And you're not the only one. With, with respect, Laura, it's a, it's a fellow Conservative who's just had the battering of his life. In, yeah, but he's not the only one, is he? He's not the only uh, one who's saying that. Results. He's not the only Conservative saying and, that. And you go to other parts of the country, and uh, if, I'm sure if you interv interviewed some council leaders who just become, uh, you know, who were Conservative council leaders who'd held their councils rather than the ones who've, uh, only the ones who've lost, then... Uh, you might see a different picture yeah, emerging from you're, you're suggesting he's just saying that because he's feeling a bit yeah. down and a bit sad, rather than he's actually just offered our viewers his considered opinion from what he's heard during and, an election and, campaign. And, and you're when, just dismissing he's had a bad night, so don't pay and attention. When, and, when he deep down, and when we went further into it, he started talking about the real issues, which also the issues which come up on the doorsteps in North West Durham, which are those issues around cost of living. And, you know, there's, and they're there largely because we've just seen a major international situation in which one country, large countries invaded another, sending the global price of oil doubling, the global price of gas quadrupling uh, and, overnight. And not and really for one impacting, second that wasn't a big Really part impacting of those people in, in their pocket at the moment. Interesting. It's a more specific point mm. about, I mean, because all of those economic points are valid um, and nobody questions that. It's to do with character and integrity and trust, these very powerful and important values and judgments that people make on their potential leaders or their actual leaders. So putting aside the valid economic points, mm. it's about the Prime Minister's character. Now that must bother you if your own colleagues are questioning that. Well, as I said, it's had a difficult result in Cumberland tonight. Other parts well, of the country... Well, it's not just down to that, Richard. Other, other, other parts of the country are getting are seeing very different results to that, um, and, and including in Greater Manchester. But, but, but I think, you know, I'm going to say this in a different way. You can't suggest that that gentleman has just lost his seat and is just having a bit of a tantrum about the Prime Minister and is questioning his character because he's lost, uh, or he's lost colleagues. He's not lost his seat, he's lost colleagues there. Um, you know, it's, yes, of course he's going to feel aggrieved, but that's a different judgment. He's making a different judgment about the Prime Minister's own character. And, and, when he, and when we drill down into what he was saying, he was talking about major cost of living issues, which are the same as the cost of living issues in North West Durham. That's nothing to do with the Prime Minister's character. Cost of that's, living issues. That's abs you're absolutely correct, yeah. Well, 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 why are you blending them both together? Because that's exactly what the council leader, when we started uh, asking him further, what else was coming up on the Well, what else, that's yes. What, what else? That's absolutely true. What else is true? But he started by saying, you know, the Prime Minister's a problem. The Prime Minister's a problem. You don't seem to be wanting to recognise that that's even an issue. Well, I just, I think if, if we were looking at the difference between the main party leaders at the moment, if there is a, a, real, a real desire from the general public to switch from one to another, mm -hmm. if that was a main cause, you'd see Labour making massive gains tonight, um, as, it, as we are, we're seeing Labour literally level pegging on the position of So it doesn't matter to you as long as you're not getting absolutely hammered? Not at all. I think we need to address the issues which are really facing the people I've met on the doorsteps across the country who are really talking about cost of living and the squeeze they're facing. Well, it was interesting. We also heard James Johnson, James Johnson there, John Ashworth, talking about Keir Starmer mm -hmm. and saying very plainly yeah. that there is no love for Keir Starmer as far as he's concerned. He's and that's somebody weak. who spends his life looking at evidence, listening to mm -hmm. voters. Now, you, you, you must feel worried when you hear that well, too. I mean, can I just say we just gained a 30 off the Tories in Derby North. That's a key seat for us at the next election. I notice you've um, also, and and John, and John you've just dropped down three to one in Wirral. Well, 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 you, well, you two, um, you two can, can, can trace your seats. We'll be bringing out your well, results, yeah. the results the results as they come in. But please address, well, I mean, I, address the point. I, I, I mean, there's Starmer. affection for Sheik Keir Starmer. Convincing... Your council leader lost in Wigan. Convincing affection. Tory leader. Um, not the council leader. Yeah, Tory leader lost in Wigan. You two can can trade them all you like, but I'm going to ask you this question. James Johnson, polls there, said very clearly to us, He's not seeing evidence of any huge affection from the public for Keir Starmer. He's not seeing evidence of many, many people thinking, you know what, this guy's really the guy for Downing Street. Why is that? You must be concerned to hear it. And those numbers don't bear that out either. Well, I think Keir Starmer's led a distinguished campaign totally focused on this cost of living crisis and highlighting the reality that the Conservatives have got no much. answers for the cost of living crisis. In fact, they've they've exacerbated it by imposing the biggest cut on pensioners for 50 years, taking £20 off well, the Well, if it's been it, a great campaign and he's a great leader, why are you not seeing that? Why are we not people? seeing because, that in the numbers because, 
we've got to accept that we got an absolute hammering in 2019 and we the worst result worst election result since the 1930s for us and it's always going to take us time to rebuild trust and to make up that lost ground but we are making progress tonight in key target areas seats like Derby North like Chipping Barnet like it sounds like the Southampton Itchen seat these will be the sorts of seats which will decide the next general election and Labour is doing well in those but seats tonight. But I'm concerned that there is a specific issue which James Johnson outlined about Keir Starmer's ability to really make a connection with the public. And if the government is doing as terribly as you suggest on all of these issues that you talk about and if they really don't have a grip as you continually suggest, why are people not being persuaded by your leader. Well, we have been and persuaded. Had, I mean, you know, it's th 2019 Curtis... is now April, it's May, May, of course, we're in the election day. Mm -hmm. It's May to 2022. Well, I think John Curtis said, I was scribbling things down, so he'll forgive me if I've scribbled it down wrong, but I think he said there was a 5% swing to Labour mm -hmm. since 2018 uh, uh, in the South, a swing to Labour since last year. We are making progress, but we've got to accept that we had a very bad result in 2019. It, it has left us with a colossal mountain to climb. Okay. But we, I think we are at a turning point and we are making progress tonight. Well, let's see if there's any progress for Labour in Bolton. Let's go to Kevin Fitzpatrick, who's there for us. Uh, Kevin, bring us up to date. Yeah, overall, a pretty satisfactory night for the Conservatives here in Bolton. This is the only Conservative-led council in Greater Manchester. The other nine are led by the Labour Party and the Tories actually gained a seat here. Labour gained one as again two seats as well. So those three seats come in from independents and smaller parties and that means that the Conservatives continue to be the largest party on this council and odds on to continue leading a minority administration. Unusually around a third of the councillors on this council are independents or from hyper-local parties and both the Tories and Labour say they'll now be spending the next couple of days trying to work and get on board the support of, of those to cobble together a rainbow coalition to uh, get things done and, and lead a minority administration in here but Tories are odds on to do that in Oldham Labour continue to run the council there but for the second year on the trot they've lost their leader last year the leader Sean Fielding was taken out by a really personal targeted campaign by an independent this time councillor Aru Shah has been taken out by another targeted campaign this time by the Conservatives Labour is down two seats in Thameside but it's been a bad night for the Tories in Stockport where they've lost all three of the seats that they were defending two to the Liberal Democrats, one to the Labour Party, but Labour ended up even because the Greens have taken a seat from them. But that uh, defeat to the two Liberal Democrats will be seen as a bit of a blow for the Conservatives' general election prospects in Cheadle, the constituency where that happened, because that's always neck and neck between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems, and that's currently held by the Tories. So to lose two seats there, a bit of a blow for them. So a real mixed picture across Greater Manchester. And then later on today, the big one that lots of people have been looking out for, Bury. Both Sir Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson went to Bury to launch their local elections campaigns. Labour currently has a majority on the council there of three, but the Tories have been talking up the chances for a good number of years now, and it'll be really interesting to see how that pans out, and you can expect both those big parties to take a lot of uh, credit and kudos if they end up on top in that battle. Kevin, thanks very much for the latest there, and uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick there for us uh, in Bolton. Battle Royal in Southampton between uh, uh, the Tories and Labour. Let's join Emily Hudson. Uh, Emily, what's, uh, what's the latest you have for us? Well, in Southampton, things are moving quite fast now. We've had nearly half the seats declared and the Conservatives were defending seven. They have lost three of those two to Labour and one to the Liberal Democrats, who've taken their first seat on Southampton Council in 10 years. Liberal Democrats and the Greens uh, did an election agreement with one of the parties standing aside in three wards each. It seems to have paid off for the Liberal Democrats, who, as I say, will take their first seat on the Council. But this does mean for the Conservatives, if things continue as they are, they will have lost control of Southampton Council. Now, as I say, there's still about seven seats to declare, but one of the seats they lost was Bitten Park. Now, the Conservative leader was up here a few minutes ago on the balcony uh, and was saying to me, I am surprised we weren't 
expecting that to be a ward we had to defend particularly hard. Uh, it's a very leafy, suburban part of Southampton. It was won by Labour. Now, Labour have not had a seat in Bitton Park for 20 years. So it shows that swing to Labour. It was a significant swing. And people are either voting because they knew the candidate, he'd stood for police and crime commissioner in the area, or because they were taking a stand against the Conservatives. We don't know that, of course, but I was in Bitten the other day when Sir Keir Starmer was there, and there was certainly a lot of people who were fed up with politicians generally. They wanted people who represented them locally, who did what they said they were going to do. There was a lot of discontent with the Conservatives and the Partygate situation in Bitten on Tuesday. Uh, down the road in Portsmouth, actually, an even worse night so far for the Conservatives. They were the largest party in Portsmouth, but they didn't run the council. The Liberal Democrats did that with Labour support. They're no longer the largest party. They've lost four seats in Portsmouth. And actually, that's across the board. They've lost two to the Liberal Democrats, who are now the largest party and will probably continue to run the council with Labour support. But they've also lost a seat to an independent, the Portsmouth People party and the Labour Party. Uh, they'll be very, very surprised to be losing those seats. Uh, the leader of the Conservative group has sent me a message saying he thinks Boris Johnson needs to take a long, hard look at himself and see what it has done to councillors in his area. So definitely some questions uh, for the leadership coming from these cities here on the south coast. Emily, many thanks. Uh, clearly fast moving there. Southampton and Portsmouth. Emily Hudson there for us. Um, I think we have 45 uh, councils declared out of 146 uh, at uh, 20 past three in the morning. Um, Rita, can we just get up to date with uh, what's been going on so far? This is the state of play at the moment, Hugh. And as you can see, Labour has made a net gain of one seat. Uh, the Conservatives have lost 53. Uh, the Lib Dems and the Greens continuing to pick up uh, seats. So the Lib Dems on plus 27 and the Greens on plus 18. Um, let's take a look at some of the councils that have come in. Hull, of course, we've talked about a lot. Uh, that's a Lib Dem gain tonight. And Cumberland, a Labour win, this new shadow unitary authority that's only going to actually properly start work in about a year's time. But we've also had these notable uh, Labour holds in Exeter, Stevenage, Wolverhampton, Waltham Forest. Waltham Forest is the first London result to come in and Sandwell in the West Midlands, while Tamworth in Staffordshire, well, that's a Conservative hold. Um, we're talking about the Greens having a uh, pretty good night of it so far. So I want to show you what has happened in Exeter. So it's a Labour hold uh, and Labour have held on to it with a very healthy majority of 13 seats. But the Greens are tying with the Conservatives on five seats. And look at that. It, they've taken three seats, um, from two from Labour and one from the Conservatives. And this is in a Remain part of the country. So really interesting there. Um, if you're wondering what's going on in your own local area, do remember that you can go to the BBC website, enter your postcode, and uh, you can find out exactly what's going on. You can do that on the website, or you can use the BBC News app. Rita, thanks very much. Uh, well, let's get another couple of different perspectives, shall we? Because we're going to be joined by Robert Colville, who's uh, the director of the Centre for Policy Studies, and uh, Andrew Fisher, um, or Director of Policy um, at the Labour Party 2016 to 2019. Uh, Andrew and Robert, thanks very much for joining us and uh, for being uh, good sports, joining us at 20 past three in the morning. It's very good of you. Um, and actually, this is good to mention because as I understand it, Robert, you're in Wandsworth and Andrew, you're in Croydon. They're both actually contests which are extremely uh, interesting and significant in terms of what they present. <coughs> Um, for the for the Tories and for for for, for Labour, um, I, I'll start with you, Robert, if I may, because you're in Wandsworth. Uh, what do you make of what's been going on in London? Let's start with London, um, given that uh, we've been focusing on Wandsworth and uh, on Barnet and to an extent Westminster. What's your take on things? 
Sure. Well, I've been expecting Wandsworth to go to Labour for, for quite a while now. If you look back to 2018, what happened there was Labour actually won the vote share in Wandsworth. Um, the issue was that it piled up seats, uh, it piled up votes in in wards in a couple of wards, one of which is the one I live in, um, although they've reshuffled the, band, the boundaries now. So you had Tory councillors, you know, we, we lost, lost, the Tories lost by like a thousand in, in my ward, but that you had Tory councillors winning by like you know, th tens of votes um, in in multiple wards, so Labour doesn't actually need a big swing in Wandsworth. It just needs a, a you know slightly better distribution of its vote share and slightly more um, uh, cle slightly cleverer campaigning. And um, so yeah, and and th there's something really interesting happening in Wandsworth, I think, which is that Wandsworth has always been the emblematic Tory council. It boasts it was the kind of the Thatcherite spearhead. Uh, it was the, you know the lowest council tax in the country. Um, you know, absolute ruthless focus on efficiency and and service, and that has held it up even as London and the middle class and graduates. Um, you know, the, the figures on graduate vote share in, are, are fascinating. Um, even that has has gone to Labour in the time I've been living here, probably about ten years. It's gone from being a marginal seat in in parliamentary terms to you know to a pretty pretty safe Labour seat. So what we're seeing is kind of the, the, the tides of Labour support are gradually lapping at the, at the shore of this Tory bastion. And I think tonight is probably the night that it goes. Uh, on a wider scale, um, if I can ask you, Robert, um, before I come to, to Andrew, uh, where, where do you assess the Tory performance more widely, even at this you know, stage where we've got maybe, what, 46 out of 146 declared so far uh, of these authorities? And because we had a fairly lively exchange in the studio earlier about, you know, whether um, Boris Johnson himself was or wasn't a factor. And we had the Tory group leader from Carlisle telling us that mm. he definitely was. What, what's your reading of that? So I think that there's two things here. Um, what, what I think we're seeing is, and this this all started with Cheshire Man Amersham, is that we've got a two party politics, but it's a sort of Tory and anti-Tory um, politics that... The Tories have been in power for, for quite a long time. There's two big headwinds, as, as you've alluded to. There was the, the, um, the party gate stuff, but also, crucially, um, cost of living. And so I, what I think you're seeing, and in a way that doesn't bode terribly well for Labour at a general election, is people gravitating to whoever they think is best placed to, to defeat the Tories um, in, their, in their local area, in you know, quite the same way that you saw happening with the, with the Tories in, in the 90s, and again with the, with the Labour government um, later on. Um, that said, I think one of the sort of interesting things is, is the rise of the Greens. You, you referred to them taking taking a seat off Labour. Well, like, one of the reasons the Tories are doing worse tonight than they did in 2018 is that because they haven't held on to as many of their 2019 voters as Labour. But one of the big challenges for Labour is that, you know, generally speaking, in the, in the, in the the, the system we've got now, whichever of the Tories and Labour can hold on to more of the sort of broad centre-right, centre-left, leave, remain coalition tends to win, uh, will tend to win the general election. And so if Labour are losing people to the Greens, that's that's not a good sign for, for the general. Uh, Andrew, can I bring you in and um, uh, ask you, I mean, you're in Croydon, which obviously is a, an interesting area because uh, of the difficulties that the uh, authorities mm -hmm. had there, the Labour authorities had there in terms of uh, budget and finance. Um, what's your take so far on the Labour performance? We've again had a lively debate here um, with John Ashworth and, uh, uh, and colleagues before that about, you know, whether Labour's actually doing enough in terms of trying to find a springboard to possible success at the next election. Uh, how do you read the performance? Uh, it's underwhelming at the moment, but of course there are a lot of um, potentially good seats for or good council results for Labour to come. Um, if you look at Southampton on the south coast, which I think is, is sort of nearly there, but not quite yet. Uh, Worthing, which doesn't count until tomorrow. Some of the London seats, which aren't quite official yet. Barnet, Wandsworth, although it looks like Wandsworth has gone to Labour. Um, so, there's, so there's still a bit more to come for Labour. But overall, does it look like we're on course to win the next general election? No, nowhere near. Um, some fairly modest gains and also still going backwards in some parts of the country, even from 2018, which was an OK set of election results for Labour, but it wasn't earth shatteringly good either. So... Um, you know, it is underwhelming. What's clear is people are annoyed with the Conservatives, both after, you know, the scandals of Partygate and um, they're sort of sitting idly by as people cope or try to cope with this cost of living crisis. 
people are angry with the Conservatives, but they're not enthused by Labour at this stage. And you're seeing, you know, some Labour voters go to the Lib Dems and the Greens. You're seeing sort of people sitting at home, maybe, you know, we have to look at the turnout figures in a bit more detail um, at some point. But there's not this rush of enthusiasm that tells you Labour's on course yet. And I think, you know, Labour does need to reflect on these results and, and have a think about its strategy, both in terms of where in the country it needs to target its resources to win a general election, but also is it saying enough, is it doing enough, is it convincing enough people? And at the moment, I think it's not, to be honest. And Andrew, is Laura here? You were part of mm. Jeremy Corbyn's team, and particularly mm. in the sort of early days when he managed to attract mm. so many new members mm. to the Labour Party, although obviously it led in a, a very serious election defeat. If you were advising Keir Starmer now, what would you be mm. telling him to do? Because you clearly don't think it's quite working, not quite connecting, not mm. making enough progress. I think there's two things. I think that the first thing to say is, well, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn also got a good result in 2017, of course, a very bad one in 2019. But let's learn the lessons from the positive one. You know, Labour got a lot more members. It got masses of people out on the streets. There was an enthusiasm for Labour in 2017. Of course, it didn't end up very well in 2019. But that enthusiasm can be channeled. You know, Keir Starmer's keen to emphasise his professionalism as a politician. You know, if he can combine those two things, enthusiasm and professionalism, he'll be on course. But at the moment, there's too much briefing, there's too much everything you know, that was, that's wrong with Labour was all down to the last bloke. You know, that's nonsense. You know, Labour's lost the last four general elections. Only two of those are Jeremy Corbyn. You know, so Labour's problems predate Jeremy Corbyn. So unite the party, which is what he said he'd do, I think, for one. Focus on the Conservatives, focus on the positive message that Labour's got. Um, and really start to set out a bold alternative. You know, we, we are in a real crisis. You know, people's finances are in a terrible state. There's a food bank at the end of my road, and I've never seen the queue as long as it was um, last night as I went out to canvas for Labour. So there's real problems, um, and people want solutions. And Labour needs to be absolutely laser-focused on answering people's concerns, not on fighting internally. And I, I think if... If Keir Starmer and his team can focus on that, can put forward bold alternatives, I think they can win. There's a real opportunity here. The Conservatives are on the floor and Labour isn't quite taking advantage at the moment. Jonathan, what do you say to Andrew Fisher's comments? I mean, he's basically said Keir Starmer's not brave enough, not being gutsy enough. Well, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Andrew, uh, uh, get on well, as he knows, but I do think Labour is making some progress tonight, for example, if, it, if you extrapolated or you took the aggregate result and applied it to constituency, mm -hmm. Labour would win Bolton North East, Bolton West, Lee, West Bromwich West, Workington, Copeland, Hartlepool, Lincoln, Southport, Thurrock. We've just gained a seat in the marginal seat of Stourbridge in the Dudley Borough. So we are making progress tonight. But Andrew is correct. We, continue, we need to continue to make an argument to the British people about how we will improve their lives and how we will tackle this desperate cost of living crisis because it's blatantly obvious the Conservatives don't have any answers on that front. But he's saying more than that though isn't he? He's saying what you're doing is not being bold enough and it's too much actually still too much infighting, not being inclusive enough in the party but actually not being convincing enough, not being interesting enough, not uh, having enthusiasm. Well I always try my best to be interesting but... <laughs> that was an interesting person of course. <laughs> but look we will, we will have to over the next year or two years, or there could be a general election this autumn according mm. to the reports uh, today, that's Boris Johnson's latest trick to try and save his skin with his Tory MPs, apparently. But we will obviously, as we move towards that general election, come forward with the policies of how we want to change the country. And there are big challenges facing the country, from an ageing society to climate change, to the fact that our children have met, missed the best part of two academic years' worth of education. There are big challenges facing the country, and Labour will have answers to these big challenges. The Conservatives, I'm afraid, have no answers. Um, Richard, do you mind if I, I, I just put this latest uh, John Curtis note to you? He says, uh, so far the Conservatives are losing around one in six of the seats they're trying to defend tonight. If this trend were to continue, then the Conservative losses in England could be just below 250 seats when all the votes are counted. That's John's latest assessment and clearly it's based on, on what we have so mm. far. W w would that be within the range that ties in with a previous commentator saying you know conservative mps are not going to be too rattled by that i, I think with the predictions we heard earlier on tonight um of you know hundreds and hundreds of seat losses uh, that's well below that so i think that's 
that is reassuring in a, in a broad context. But I think we also need to look at what's happening on the flip side. I think that's, there's two sides to that. And that's what's happening to the Labour seats. I mean, in 2014, when these seats were up, Ed Miliband gained about 320 or so. Uh, in 2018, when they were up last time, uh, Jeremy Corbyn gained around 80 or so uh, net gains in those elections. Uh, and tonight, we're not, you know, we're seeing Labour really hovering around, not making any progress on where Jeremy Corbyn was in 2018 in those uh, elections. And it's very difficult to extrapolate from local elections to general elections. Um, but, you know, we're, not, we're, we're really not seeing massive progress in any of those uh, across the board, uh, certainly from Labour tonight. Just you taking would be happy with about 250. But, but Richard, you, would you be quite happy with about 250 I'm not happy with, I'm not happy losing any But councillors. as a government in mid-term, because actually a lot of the analysis would suggest for a government that's been in power for a long, long time, it's mid-term, actually 250 seats for lots of Conservatives I've talked to privately would think mm. actually that's I, I, absolutely I, manageable I, I, at this stage. Yeah, I want to be very clear. Like, I don't want to see any councillors lose their seats at all, right? And I'm sure there will be parts of the country where we actually make gains in tomorrow. I'm really hopeful about some of the areas I visited. Um, but, I, but you're absolutely right that predictions of hundreds and hundreds of seat losses between sort of four, five, six, seven, eight hundred, you know, but maybe up to a thousand in some cases, it was going to be absolutely disastrous. Obviously, this is far, this is far, this is looking far better than that, predictions. Uh, uh, John, just one to you as well from John Curtis. Um, London is hard to gauge, he says, because of the boundary changes. But based on early results, John Curtis says, it is not clear that Labour's performance in London is going to be better than its relatively disappointing performance so far outside of the capital. So performance in London, not going to be better than performance outside. Would that surprise you? Well, we look like we're going to be taking Wandsworth. We think we're doing well in Barnet. We've just taken a seat off the Tories in, that, in the marginal Uxbridge constituency, which will be a target for us at the next general election, of course. So we do appear to be making progress uh, in London, but we did do very well in London in 2018 as well. So it's a high uh, watermark, if you like. What I'm also interested in is the progress we're making across the country. And I think also tomorrow you'll see us making progress in Scotland as well. That will be an interesting thing to look out for. I mean, there's been a lot yeah. of sense, a lot of chatter and a lot of expectation in the Labour movement that they may move beyond the Conservatives in Scotland uh, to be the challengers, challengers to the SNP. But actually, in the big picture, actually, the SNP look like they will continue to sort of defy political gravity and mm. stay absolutely dominant. Um, and it says something for Labour historically that they're jockeying to get back into second place. Mm. Anyway, those results are still a long, long way away. Yeah. So yeah. maybe not get into that right now. Um, well, sadly, I think you're both leaving us. Oh. Uh, yeah, don't, don't move yet. Um, um, I'm, I'm basically, I'm going to delay the news for a second uh, to give you just a final comment each. It's been great to have you with us. Thank you both. Um, so just as you leave and before um, your co colleagues replace us, um, you first, John. Uh, are, you a, are you in a position at this point, at half past three in the morning, um, <laughs> where you are you know, relatively encouraged? Or are you in a position where you're going to tell your fellow uh, workers in the Labour Party, you know, yes, we're on course. This looks like, you know, election winning territory for us in two years time. Are you really in that position? I think these are encouraging. We, we have made progress in the types of constituency that will be the battleground for the next general election. And I think what we're seeing is that the British people are fed up of a government that has not done anything to help them with the cost of living crisis, has worsened the cost of living crisis with their tax rises and cuts to things like the pension mm. and universal credit. And with inflation hitting 10% likely at the end of this year, you've got runaway inflation, they've lost control of the economy. I'm afraid Boris Johnson's government have run out of ideas and have run out of solutions. Richard? Look, I think these results are far better than a lot of people predicted uh, over the last few weeks. I think what we're cl seeing very clearly is that Keir Starmer isn't cutting through. Labour are making hardly any progress compared to uh, 2018. You know, places like Wandsworth, well, that was the only seat that Jeremy Corbyn had a gain in in 2019 when he took uh, Battersea, I think. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we were not seeing those big changes. Um, obviously, there are, there are major issues to address for the country. A lot of that's fallout from an international situation. But... You know, if we can get some of those issues on the international stage calmed down and deal with some of those, the impacts of those that having domestically, then I think, uh, you know, we can definitely uh, build back from these results tonight. 
Uh, you both deserve a tea or a coffee or whatever else you want to drink. So thank you both for being <laughs> with us. And can moment. I just say um, to <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Fisher, Robert Colville, uh, for two excellent contributions. Sorry to keep you waiting there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us as well. So let's get a little break and an update on the news and let's join Tim again. Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, summary of the BBC News at 3.38 in the morning. Uh, early indications show the Liberal Democrats are seeing an increase in support, particularly in Conservative areas in the local elections in England. There have also been small swings from the Conservatives to Labour. One Tory councillor told this programme there was a great deal of animosity towards Boris Johnson and that voters had told him they no longer have the confidence that the Prime Minister can be relied upon to tell the truth. Our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. Voters across the country went to the polls to elect thousands of local councillors who will run their services and set their council tax. The early results are suggesting a good night for the Liberal Democrats. They've won whole council from Labour. It just shows you that this evening we're making gains in the Tory blue wall seats that we're targeting for the next general election and we're taking seats off Labour in places like Hull. We took a seat off Labour in Sunderland earlier. In fact, we were the only party to make gains in Sunderland both against the Conservatives and against the Labour Party. Conservative Party counted out 907. They've taken some notable Conservative seats too, like that of the leader of Colchester Council. Being honest, local politics are always affected by the national picture. They always have been and they always will be. I'm not sure if it's necessarily about the state of Westminster uh, politics, but I think probably concerns about the economy are probably the biggest, biggest issue. The Greens too have made some early gains. For the Conservatives and Labour, these first results have been more of a mixed bag. You've lost two county council seats in by-elections in County Dublin, in Bishop Auckland and Sedgefield. And, and you've just lost Hull, mate. Uh, you've just lost Hull for the Lib Dems. I mean, it's not a great night for Labour, is it? But it's a terrible night for the Tories. Morning. Keir Starmer is under pressure to show he's finding a way back in for Labour. The party has held the key council of Sunderland, but with a smaller majority. We've got a win in the South. We've got to win in London. Let, it's a long night and a long morning. Let's see where we end up. But to start with winning Sunderland, I'm a very happy man on a 43% share of the vote. Very happy indeed. Expectations of big gains are being downplayed, but they have made a strong start in Conservative-held Southampton. They've also won the newly created Cumberland Council. The Conservative leader of Carlisle Council is clear why. It's party gate. It's not just party gate. Um, there's the, the integrity issue, basically, I just don't feel people any longer have the confidence that the Prime Minister can be relied upon to tell the truth. That's um, quite a big thing to say, isn't it? Well, that's what people have been saying to me. And do you think that's fair? I can see that point of view. For Boris Johnson and the Conservatives, these elections appear to have been the opposite of a walk in the park. They've held several councils, including Harlow in Essex, and are the largest party in Hartlepool. But they're bracing themselves for a bad night in London and parts of the south of England. They think they've lost Barnet in North London, and Wandsworth in South London is looking tight and had been tipped to go red after 44 years of Conservative control. Not all councils are counting overnight tonight. The rest will start tomorrow. And these elections are about local issues, but as the results come in, they will also paint a national picture. Helen Catt, BBC News. Well, there'll be no counting until later this morning in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. In Scotland and Wales, where people can vote from the age of 16, seats in all councils are being contested. Voters in Northern Ireland will elect members of the Assembly. It comes just a few months after the Democratic Unionist Party resigned from the First Minister role, causing the executive to collapse. If you want to find out the result where you are, just head to the BBC News website or the BBC News app. Just put your postcode in. You'll find also lots of analysis and the latest reports from our teams around the country. In other news, uh, interest rates, those are the main stories so far. Now, back to you, Hugh. Very warm welcome back to the BBC election studio. 
Uh, it is、uh, a quarter to four in the morning, and we have fifty local authorities declared out of a total of one hundred and forty-six in England. Because just to remind you, we are focusing on England overnight,、uh, Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland, and the rest of the、uh, English local authorities will be coming up later today、uh, during Friday and even into Saturday morning. So、uh, bear with us; we're going to be focusing. Uh, on the remaining results overnight, towards six and seven in the morning,、uh, quite a few important results coming up in terms of the pattern that tells us something about where the parties stand at the moment.、Uh, we have a new set of guests in the studio.、Uh, we have for the Conservatives Paul Scully and for Labour、uh, Bridget Phillips. And thank you both for joining us.、Mm-hmm. Nice to have you with us. And、um, Laura is still with us, of course. And、uh, we're going to join. Rita, just to bring us right up to date with the latest results that we have. A couple of interesting results for you, Hugh. Worcester,、uh, the Conservatives have lost control of Worcester, and it is now a hung council. They only gained it last year when Labour actually lost seats,、uh, but it has now gone into no overall control. Worcester, of course, made famous by、uh, Tony Blair,、uh, for whom Worcester woman was a key target voter. Let's have a look and see what's happened with the seats here.、Um, There we go. So the Conservatives have lost three seats, and Labour, the Greens, and the Liberal Democrats have each gained one apiece. I want to show you one more result that we've had in, which is Derby, which has、uh, remained hung.、Um, and here,、um, the Conservatives are the largest party, but they are short by eight seats. But let's have a look again and see what's happened to. The seat change is there. The Conservatives have lost three. UKIP has lost two, and it's Labour and the Reform Party, as well as an Independent, that have、uh, been the beneficiaries. What's always so interesting is the change in the share of the vote. So that is the bold、uh, share, but this is the change in the share of the vote. Fascinating that the Conservative vote and the UKIP votes have gone right down, and you can see who the beneficiaries are. And what's interesting is that this is a Leave voting area, as was Worcester. So that is maybe not the sort of result that you would expect in council areas like these. Rita, thanks very much.、Um, I noticed there the one of the green gains in in Worcester. I want to talk、mm. about the Greens in a second, but let me bring you an update. From Wandsworth in southwest London, which we've been keeping an eye on, because of course it's been Conservative since 1978,、um, and Labour have come quite close to taking it over in the past, but have failed. Well, Labour have made two more seat gains in Wandsworth, we're told, compared to the、um, estimated baseline, making three gains in total.、Um, and our、uh, team under John Curtis telling us, so long as they don't lose any seats that they're defending,、uh, they are on course. To take the council, so that would be a very big symbolic win for Labour in Wandsworth. But we'll、uh, we'll talk about that a little later because、um, Paul has just joined us. Paul Scully is、uh, Minister for London, among his other duties. So we'll we'll have a chat about that in a second, Paul. Now we were talking about the Greens. This is a, one of the important stories of the night. No question about this.、Um, the strength of the Green performance. If we look at the key ward analysis,、um, over seven hundred key wards. Uh, you'll see that we've got virtually half of them declared, and look at this: Labour down one percent, Tories down four percent,、uh, Lib Dems up two, but the Greens up three, and、um, the Independents、uh, also up three.、Um, so the Green performance is very, very much in focus, in sharp focus、um, this evening in all parts of England, and some very strong pockets indeed.、Um, so what I'd like to do now is to. Bring in、uh, Adrian Ramsey, who's、uh, the co-leader of the Green Party in England and Wales. Adrian, good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Borodá, Hugh.、Um, Borodá, thank you very much. <laughs> well, now then,、uh, where are we? Where do we stand with your party? How do you assess the performance so far? 
Well, we're really pleased with the progress that we're making and building on the gains we've seen in recent years. We're seeing further significant gains for the Greens right across the country from Labour and the Conservatives and uh, in all different parts of England. And you were mentioning just now Worcester, which has gone into no overall control. So two Green gains there from the Conservatives have made a big impact in wrestling that council away from the Conservatives and putting the Greens in a position of real influence. And then there's other areas like South Tyneside, traditional Labour areas where we've seen a doubling of the number of Greens, also six seats there now. And that's reflected across the country where we're seeing Green gains from Labour and the Conservatives and building to record numbers of Green councillors across the country. Can we talk about the campaign in terms of what you've been hearing on the doorstep? Because we've had this from um, different perspectives over the last four hours or so, uh, with some people citing local issues, some people citing you know, changes in their local areas, including uh, low traffic networks and all the rest of it. And then others, of course, focusing on a bigger national picture to do with national politics. Mm -hmm. So what would your guide be to the things that have driven your vote? I think there's a mixture of factors. So there are certainly national factors um, and Partygate did come up on the doorstep people disillusioned with the establishment parties but that's just one factor i think the biggest factor is people looking for a positive alternative both in terms of the green message nationally and the urgency with which we need to tackle the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis and people recognizing that those are intertwined uh, and also people responding really positively to strong green campaigning on the grounds greens as champions in their communities and standing up for them on issues which are often overlooked by other parties whether whether that's air quality, whether that's improving public transport, whether it's protecting the green spaces that we know and love, or ensuring that the housing that's being built is affordable to local people. These issues come up across the country and people have responded to green policies. Adrian, it's Laura here in the studio. I, I wonder, at the beginning of the night, we were talking to your colleague who was very reluctant to get into discussion of any numbers, but she sort of <laughs> said, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe double figures we might be about there. Are you, are you a bit surprised, actually, by this? I mean, if this election had come perhaps straight off the back of the COP climate conference in mm. Glasgow or a time when people were really focused on the climate change debate, then perhaps it might have been, in a national sense, more sort of understandable. But... Are you, are you surprised? Because people are so focused on energy costs and the mm. cost of living and sometimes green politics have seemed to some voters perhaps a bit of a, an indulgence sometimes. Well, hello, Laura, and uh, we're, we're really pleased with the results we're seeing across the country, but we're not surprised. It reflects the strong green campaigning on the ground, the positive response we've been getting. And also, yes, the cost of living crisis is absolutely top of people's minds. But people increasingly recognise that that is tied up with addressing our addiction to fossil fuels. You know, a few weeks ago I was on the doorstep in Suffolk and I was speaking to a gentleman in his garden and the first thing he said to me was, we need to invest more in renewable energy. And he was saying that partly because of the climate crisis, but he was thinking about the war in Ukraine and the problems there with our addiction to fossil fuels, but also the cost of living crisis because we have the leakiest homes in Europe in the UK. People are struggling to pay their fuel bills at the moment and yet when when you have the heating on it goes out of the door and out of the window but adrian, so people you, are seeing the links between these issues and responding to positive green policies but adrian there you mentioned the war in ukraine i mean mm. during this campaign there had been talk of the green party suggesting that we should not be part of nato anymore i mean there are some of your policies that many people might seem to be perhaps uncomfortably radical do you think people are looking at you as a you know as, as a serious party potentially of government or running councils around the country? Well we are focused on how we can support the people of Ukraine uh, through this conflict and we're putting forward uh, policies on all of the range of national issues as well as local issues and people are responding very positively to that and you ask could people envisage Greens running councils well there are already 15 councils across the country where Greens are in position of joint administration and are delivering real policies that make a difference to people on the ground so I think the Greens are coming of age and people are seeing that we can deliver practical policies that make a difference for people locally and that it's it's a positive choice for people to invest their vote in. Adrian, thank you very much indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks to Adrian Ramsey there. Um, I want to go quickly to Barnet because that's uh, another of the uh, 
uh, contest we're keeping a very sharp eye on in North London. Barry Rawlings is the uh, Labour Group leader there. Um, uh, Mr Rawlings, thanks very much for joining us. Good morning. Are you, are you going to become the next council leader? Uh, well, I, I can't say that for definite because there's still declarations to be made, but it does seem like um, we, we're doing well and uh, we're picking up seats and hopefully we will know within a couple of hours whether we have. But it, it, it feels like it's been a good campaign, we've worked hard, um, and there's certainly a feeling of a time for a change. And I'll be honest, it's not us being wonderful. It, it, I think a lot of Conservatives haven't voted this time. Uh, I think they feel alienated from number 10, uh, and that they are, I don't know, they're, they're, They've, they've been disappointed in Boris Johnson and so not voting, and I think that's made a difference as well. I note, uh, Mr Rawlings, you've made four gains so far, Conservatives lost four, and um, I, you, are you pretty confident that you're heading in the right direction, yes? Oh, no, I'm confident we're heading in the right direction. Uh, it worries me that I was doing this four years ago and it seems... <laughs> uh, not, I don't know where those four years have gone, but it's very different circumstances. Four years ago, um, you were talking to me, and the main issue was about anti-Semitism. Hard, hardly came up on the doorstep. So I think in that, certainly Labour is no longer the tainted brand, and it's, we've turned a corner on that. Um, fault on, it was fault on local, on local issues, uh, mainly, but I won't pretend national issues don't have in effect but uh, yeah we, we, we've had a good campaign we've got good candidates I think I think we may well be uh, the council but we won't know for another couple of hours and it might end in tears and you might show this and show what a fool I am but at the moment it feels very good uh, Mr Rollins, it's Laura here in the studio. I remember very clearly four years ago, actually, when you identified what you'd heard about anti-Semitism on the doorstep. And I remember you being very, very emotional about that. And, you know, more or less, you just said you, you hope you won't be in tears for, the, for your wrong reasons tomorrow. But I remember actually that moment you were almost in tears about what had happened. But I was struck also that you said you think you've done well not because you've been wonderful, but because Tory voters have been disappointed and stayed at home. So are, are you a bit disappointed in... I think... I think uh... Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think, I think that is one of the changes comparing it with four years ago, and I do remember. And I think what really hit me four years ago was an elderly Jewish woman who packed her bags and was worried that she might have to leave the country. Rightly or wrongly, that's how she felt, that's how she perceived the situation. This time, knocking on doors, and yeah, all right, you knock on a lot, lot of uh, doors of Jewish people, they want to talk about uh, schools, want to talk about family homes, want to talk about the air quality. You know, they don't want to be defined by anti-Semitism, anti and Labour is no longer, as I say, the tainted brand. So we could talk a lot more about local issues, a lot more about the hopes for people. Um, and it's a lot easier, easier being a Labour leader in Barnet now than it was four years ago, I'll be honest. But is it as easy or as positive as it should be? I mean, just on that other point, I did note you did say it wasn't us being wonderful, it's Tory voters being disappointed. I mean, do you yeah, think... Yeah, yeah, I, th I think there's, I think there's, two, or th I think there's two or three things, the reasons why, if we do win, what, what's made the difference. I think there's a definite alienation amongst Conservative votes with the, with, with, uh, the Boris Johnson government. I think we've gone back to, if you like, the basics, that a lot of what you do at local level is to get the basics right. And it is the potholes, the pavements, and people might disparage that, but it, if you think about it, it's when you open your front doors, how does your local area appear? Are the, do the streets seem clean? Uh, has rubbish been taken away? Is there fly tipping? Is the air musty or polluted? All these things are very important and it's where local government can make a difference. But I'll tell you the other biggest difference and that's uh, the post-Covid stuff. Sorry if I'm talking too much, but during the Covid-19 people realised the importance of local authorities, local government on uh, the free school meals, on grants for businesses, on making sure the waste is collected, on working with public health. Suddenly people got a clearer idea that local government is actually important, who runs it is important, and what we do is important. 
and that, um, I think that, that's made, made a difference as well. But I do think we ran a very good local campaign. We got the local issues right. Uh, things like calling the climate emergency for having sustainability, um, standing up to developers, and probably because you were talking about the cost of living crisis, we've found a different way of funding adult social care. Which, uh, the finance have signed off and said yes, that's viable, which means we will be giving £2 million back to uh, the people of Bar Barnet to help them with their bills. Mr Rawlings, good to talk to you. And uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Barry Rawlings, uh, the Labour Group leader in Barnet, who may well be uh, the next uh, council leader there. Um, he made lots of interesting points, which I'll put to Bridget and to Paul in just a moment, because I want to talk to John Curtis first. Uh, John, Labour's performance in London, if I can talk about that first, uh, because, of course, with the Barnet result looking as it does and Wandsworth, etc., would suggest that Labour's having a pretty terrific time in London. Uh, how would you describe it? To be honest, if Labour hadn't, it, let's assume Labour have got Wandsworth and Barnet, and certainly we agree with you uh, uh, that on Wandsworth that does not look very likely. To be honest, if Labour hadn't won Wandsworth and Barnet, it would have been a shock. There are both places where, frankly, we expected Labour to win. The crucial question in London will eventually be whether there's any evidence that they go beyond that. Do they manage to do best to gain uh, control of Westminster or Hillingdon? Um, but otherwise, you know, it didn't need terribly long, large swings for those two councils to fall. It doesn't look as though Labour is recording particularly large swings in London, certainly nothing dramatically bigger than they are doing outside. These are, ju these are yes, they'll help to give Labour headlines, but in truth, they are simply not much more than what we would expect, given what looks like a modest swing from Conservative to Labour, but that's a swing that's essentially generated by a declining Conservative support because Labour support is down slightly too. And outside London, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, the point is, isn't it, it's not that much different. So Labour have indeed, looks as though they're going to pick up the one council that was on everybody's lips, which was Southampton, as a council they should get, given their position in the polls, and they've managed to deny the Tories control of Worcester. Not sure there are going to be many more such headlines, but uh, uh, we, will, we will wait and see. Um, and we've heard more than one Labour spokesman during the course of the evening pointing out the Labour Party is indeed now uh, recording a small net uh, increase in number of seats um, and pointing out various ways in which the party is doing better. Um, but, of course, what we have to remember with our first-past-the-post system, if you go down a bit, but your opponents, your principal opponents, go down even more, you will end up making gains of seats, even though, actually, your vote tally has also gone down. And certainly, once we look at the votes, uh, certainly outside of London, uh, then what we are basically discovering, it's not dramatic, but it's a small decline in Labour support since 2018. It is an improvement on last year, but let's remember that last year's local elections were particularly disappointing for the Labour Party. We estimated the equivalent projected national share last year was putting Labour seven points behind. So if there wasn't a recovery from that, um, the Labour Party certainly would be in an awful lot of trouble. And as for the Conservatives, because we were talking before this uh, election, John, about you know, the possibility of Conservative MPs being alarmed by the set of results and questioning the Prime Minister's suitability, etc. Um, are we in that territory? Well, probably not, but I'm not sure there was ever a reasonable expectation that we would be. Um, you know, because of the character of these results, it's mostly more Labour England that uh, has been voting, uh, because a lot of the councils which the Conservatives are controlling, only one third of the seats are up for grabs. And because this was a relatively modest Conservative performance in 2018, which is the baseline against we're comparing things um, as compared with other local elections in recent years, the Tories did not have a great deal of skin in the game. They were never going to lose enormous amounts of seats. Now, I think probably we're heading in a direction where actually the fall in the Conservative vote is not a million miles away from what we might have expected from the opinion polls. Maybe it will end up being a little bit less. It's just that some of the potential consequence of that fall 
is not going to be as stark as it would be because it's uh, Liberal Democrats who've been making some of the progress rather than the Labour Party. Um, so, I mean, in the end, what Conservative MPs will probably have to decide, I mean, at the moment, we are looking like something like a five and a half to six point swing on average in our key wards from Conservative to Labour over the course of the last 12 months. And it's the last during the last 12 months that this government has got into trouble, not since 2018. And Tory MPs will have to decide for themselves whether that reverse is indeed no more than mid-term blues, which is, I'm sure we're going to hear repeatedly in the next uh, 12 to 18 hours, or whether indeed it is a signal that Boris Johnson has lost his principal asset of electability. But that's a judgment that they will have to make. Uh, John, many thanks. Uh, well, one of the people having to make uh, the judgment, of course, is Paul Scully, who's with us, who's the business minister, minister of London, uh, and uh, a, a proper good morning now. Uh, and to you, uh, Bridget, Bridget Phillipson, Shadow Education Secretary, nice to have you with us. Um, Wandsworth, well, of course, you're going to say now, well, of course, Labour are always going to win Wandsworth, you know, it was very tight, etc. Um, but symbolically, you know, it's all been about uh, Thatcher's favourite borough and more seriously in terms of policy it's about conservatives saying in local government we can deliver a low council tax and excellent services Th that's been a crucial formula so to lose it if that is indeed the case um you know has to be a blow it's going to be disappointing if we lose it clearly because uh it, it is a, a beacon of a um a council in london or elsewhere where you can actually it has provided very low council tax compared to its direct neighbours when the actual the, the government funding is very similar because it's difficult to to take one council authority to, from another in different parts of London. But the, when you look at Lambeth, you look at Brent, you look at Hammersmith and Fulham, Merton uh, surrounding it, it does stand out quite um, quite significantly. And resident satisfactions up there and uh, and the services that it provides are excellent. However, this is clearly you, you, the Labour Party there would come back to me and say party gates come up this has come up because they've made it all about national picture and diverted away from their neighbors lack of deliver delivering in those other boroughs if you you only need to look back at um in january for example when keir starmer asked every single prime minister's question about party gate that's the only thing he asked in that entire month and then was wondering why everybody was talking about it. And when it comes back to him, he was now wanting to divert his attention away from there. And so that's and that's disappointing because I used to be a local councillor and I, I, I like local elections to be faced to be on local services because people should be accountable for those things. And it, I think what, what you thought, uh, heard from um, Barry Rawlings could be the message of the night, not being with Barnet uh, Labour, not being wonderful. It was more um, focus on Conservatives and, and, and Westminster. The Labour Party nationally clearly have not been wonderful. This has all been about uh, uh, about the mood music that uh, with, with, with Conservative paper, people maybe staying at home rather than Labour making the significant gains that they need to be making if they're going to have a serious tilt at government in the next general election. I mean, some people listening, Paul, would think, hang on a second, if, if, if Paul and his colleagues were on the opposition benches and you had a Labour Prime Minister who had been involved in the Partygate stuff, you know, you'd have made hay with it. So the idea that that's some kind of thing that shouldn't have happened is just Hugh, I'm not, is I'm curious, not, isn't I'm it? not saying it shouldn't happen. I'm, I'm, you know, politics is politics. Yeah. All I'm saying is as a yeah. local councillor, yeah. I was actually a local councillor that joined the, elect uh, the expenses scandal. I know what it's like to be yeah. on the doorstep and have that sort of thing that's way beyond your control thrown, mm. thrown at your face. But, uh, but ultimately, what I do believe in is devolution. And you can only have devolution if people are held accountable for their delivering or, or lack of delivery. Uh, there was a point there, wasn't there, Bridget, by, by John Curtis, where he was saying, um, you know, come on, Barnet, Wandsworth, you know, it would be a shock if Labour wasn't picking them up, um, given the closeness that we've seen in the past. And um, there was the anti-Semitism issue in Barnet, which the Labour leader there now says seems to have been um, dealt with uh, more, more effectively. Um, but John's real, message was that Labour's performance, you know, w wasn't overwhelming. It wasn't that impressive at this stage. It, it, does that bother you? I think we've seen real progress tonight. I'm really positive about the results that we've been seeing. I think we heard uh, the impact that Keir Starmer's leadership has had on the Labour Party, that we can now start to win back seats in places like Barnet, uh, because we've turned a corner as a party. But of course, it's not just in London. We're seeing progress 
in those parts of the country where we'll need to um, you mm -hmm. know, be making gains at the next general election. Mm -hmm. So whether that's in Worcester or Derby or in Cumberland, where we've taken uh, the new council there, you know, there are three Conservative MPs in that area, three seats that we'll be you know, really pushing to take next time. I think that stands us in really good stead uh, for the next general election. It's the extent of the gains, isn't it? You know, um, because the figures speak for themselves and it says plus 16 there, I can see it on the board, and the Tories down 76. Um, so, so no one's denying that. It is, that is progress. It's just that it's not enough progress. Uh, so, so if you're going to carry on at that level, um, you, you know, it'll be kind of OK at the end of the day, but kind of OK isn't going to do it. Well, I think it's more than that. And I think the results that we're seeing are really encouraging. And what you heard from John Curtis was also that because of the cycle and the way that, you know, these are in thirds, there is a ceiling on what we can achieve. But I think if you look at the areas where we're making progress in those places, we'll need to win seats at the next general election. There's a lot that's positive. And I think when you think back to where we were as a party back in 2019, you know, if you'd said to me then that we would be in this position, I would have been absolutely delighted. So that, you know, I am delighted that we're seeing that progress. Clearly there's more to do. You know, we're not complacent about it. Uh, we need to make further gains. But I think, you know, this is uh, looking like it's a good result and a good night so far for us. Um, Paul, earlier we spoke to um, the Conservative group leader, it was Carlisle, Laura, wasn't Carlyle, it? Carlisle, yes. Um, who was pretty tough, really, on, on the Prime Minister and uh, really did kind of blame him for a disappointing result for the Conservatives uh, on his council. And he said that people did question integrity and, and, and the rest of it. Do, do, do you accept that, you know, for Conservative voters, not, not for people who would, you, you know, not be on side anyway, hmm. uh, but for Conservative voters, the way the Prime Minister's conducted himself has been a disadvantage when it's come to campaigning in this election? I think for some Conservative voters, and I think it depends on where you, where you are in the country, uh, to be honest, if, think, if you're in the middle of London, uh, you'll get one view. If you're in Sutton, even in my, where I've just come from now and I'm going back afterwards, um, it actually didn't come up that, that, that much. Um, whereas it might have done for Lib, De Lib Dem and uh, Labour activists who were obviously prompting that kind of, for, that, for that kind of response. Uh, so clearly, I'm sure it came up more for them. I don't think you needed to prompt it um, too much. Well, I mean, wherever came, I went, but it, it did, came up but it completely did, unprompted. But, yeah, but, there's, but, but, in, but in Sutton, it didn't. It came up exactly twice today from Conservative voters that I spoke to um, in three separate wards mm -hmm. around the borough. So, you know, I'm only reporting what I've heard. But I think it comes back to the fact that, uh, you know, this is a midterm election for the Conservatives. We've been 12, um, t um, 12 years in government now. There have been a lot of headwinds. There remains a lot of headwinds, which mm -hmm. clearly we need to tackle. We need to get back to, uh, to focusing on that, those big um, things in our, in our day job, rather than Labour, as I say, being wonderful and being, getting ready for government. Well, we can't, having talked about it for several hours, we can now tell you that a Labour campaign HQ source has actually now finally called Wandsworth for the Labour Party. And as uh, told us, Boris Johnson losing, losing Wandsworth is monumental. This was the Tories' duel in the Crown and claiming that voters in Wandsworth have put their trust in the change that Keir Starmer's Labour is representing. Interesting, they're pointing to what Keir Starmer's been doing in his time mm -hmm. in charge of the party. I mean, Paul, that, that isn't necessarily a surprise as a result, as we were hearing for Sir John. But I mean, I can tell you this morning, both the parties were still moving resources there, actually. Yeah. It did feel as if yeah. it was that tight. Yeah. But do you have a concern as the Minister for London and as a Southern Conservative MP about this seesaw where in the South East and in London, you do seem, whether it's down to what Boris Johnson's been up to, whether it's down sometimes to demographics or whether it's just that malaise of midterms, 12 years in office, do you worry that you're seeing a seesaw and this sort of geographical split where you know, the Tories are less welcome in parts of the country that have I think, traditionally I think been clearly, used. You know, clearly the uh, sort of plate tectonics has shifted a little mm. bit over the last few years in, uh, in, in the country. But Wandsworth, I mean, we, we only just won it last time, frankly. Uh, yeah. And with boundary changes that we've, uh, that we can, yeah. which were, we didn't go for changes, as... But, um, but in, in the, the terms of that big Wandsworth. picture, that but yeah, look, I mean, it's, frankly, you know, as, as Minister for London, it's my job to worry. I mean, like, is, uh, you know, one of it, this, <laughs> this, this, this is exactly what I'm So you'd be to, more worried tomorrow morning than you were this morning. Because I worry for Londoners because what I've heard over the last um, uh, four, five, six years in London is a lot of talk about values, which is fine because London is a very value driven city with the cosmopolitan, uh, very diverse city, a lot of diagnosing and re-diagnosing re of the problems without many solutions um, through, from, from the mayor 
through local government. And we need to, it's my job really, to get to the heart of that and work with the mayor, work with the Labour councillors as well as the, as the others to actually drive a far more delivery focused vision for London rather than the, uh, uh, the sort of slightly amorphous mass that we have at the moment. What do you mean by that? Well, because actually I'm not seeing any, any um, delivery, enough delivery for housing, for crime, for the, um, air pollution, all of the things that London is at will actually affect Londoners on, on the next, um, over the next few years, the next decade or so. I'm hearing a lot of talk, a lot of diagnosis, but no, no delivery on that. I mean, I think it's interesting we're hearing a lot of talk about how the government's been in power now for 12 years. I mean, that, that's a new development. They have been in power for 12 years. When Boris Johnson in 2019 was very keen to distance himself from the government's record, but if the government want to have this argument about the record, I think that puts the Labour Party in a very strong position for the next general election because we've got a government now out of ideas, running out of road. I mean, what was their big idea around the cost of living? You know, you, you MOT your car less frequently. We reduce the quality of people's childcare. I mean, they are not big ideas about grants. the direction of... I think yeah. it's more than 22 billion quid that we put in towards the cost of living uh, programme that was uh, that, that were the, the sort of big ideas, the, the, the solutions, rather than an idea which, is, which has come up. But there's, no, there's, no, there's, up no the there's no plan for it, and that has come up on the doorstep. I mean, alongside the real anger that people feel about a Prime Minister who's broken the law, and I'm afraid everywhere I've been, it's come up and prompted right across England, whether that's been in Sunderland or Southampton, where I've campaigned, or in Barnet, but on the cost of living too. I mean, Labour has set out a plan. Did it come out in Durham? In Durham? Yeah, was it, yeah well, I mean, because, you know, clearly we, we, we've had this thing that as soon as it starts coming back to the Labour Party, you know, Keir Starmer saying, actually, no, we should be talking about other things. And uh, actually, we should be fronting up. Uh, Richard Holden was here literally uh, no, la li last, last week, um, just the uh, last hour. And he was very much at the forefront of saying the Durham police should be investigating that because they, these, there does need to be a consistency Rich, about Richard, the enforcement. Richard Holden would be very keen for Durham police to waste their time on this rubbish. I mean, he's, you know, I think he should reflect on his behaviour, to be honest. That has not come up when I've been knocking on doors in Sunderland. What has come up an awful lot is the conduct of your prime minister. And, you know, it is a fundamental question of integrity and honesty. And I think people expect more. Let's take a pause, shall we? Thank you very much. Royston Smith is with us, uh, who's a Conservative MP for Southampton Itchen. Um, Mr Smith, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, what's the update in Southampton? Pleasure. Um, well, numerically now that we can't save it, so the Conservatives have lost control of Southampton and Labour are now back in control after just a year of a Conservative administration. So let's have your assessment of what's happened and why it's happened. I think it's a, a combination of things. I think there's demographics. I think there is a concern about the challenges that people are facing, rising fuel bills, rising energy bills, the cost of living in general with inflation and pay not keeping up and what they're wanting, what they need and I think they deserve is a solution to some of those problems. Now I think the government has moved quite a lot to come to some of those uh, solutions but perhaps we're going to have to find a mechanism to do something else and I think in the end what we're seeing now is the mid-term, I know John Curtis said this and he'd expect me to say that's the situation but I think this is the mid-term, you know, we need a solution, you're the government, if you don't give us a solution then we'll take it out on the local councils. It's happened before, it will no doubt happen again. Uh, Russell, when you say mechanism, what, what do you mean by an, another mechanism for helping people? Well, I, I think, you know, some things are symbolic and some things, uh, you know, are really helpful. But, you know, I felt that we should take VAT off people's fuel bills in the beginning because we can. It's something we can do quickly and it's something that will help. Not, you know, it's not overwhelming. It's only 5%, of course. But I thought we should have done that in the first place. And I think, you know, we should still do that. So when you combine that with the council tax, when you combine that with the £200 uh, levelling money for bills coming down the road and then you add perhaps something like VAT on their energy bills that will help and it will at least show people that you're doing something to help them. Uh, I'm bound to ask you this Mr Smith uh, because it's come up with uh, um, in different forms uh, you mentioned their demographics you mentioned your cost of living um, you talked about VAT uh, what about the issue to do with uh, conduct and integrity and all the rest of it has that not come up? 
Not really. Um, I know that you know people would expect me to say that, and there'd be people shouting their screen somewhere. You know, he's bound to say that. But uh, you know, we've knocked a lot of doors. I've been here. I've done this for 25 years in Southampton. I know it like the back of my hand, and I know many of the people that I've spoken to. I've spoken to in the past, and a lot of them were saying things like, "We're just not interested in this this nonsense." You know, of course, he. You know, things could have been handled better. But what they are interested in is how they get through the next day, week, month and beyond and in the end that's what a government is there to do you know i don't condone any of people's actions i i, I hear labor saying that it's conservative mudslinging to to talk about keir starmer i think the two things are one in the same but keir starmer didn't particularly come up on the doorsteps and nor did the conduct of the prime minister what came up all the time was this this worry about cost of living and that's what we need to address and that's our job in government so so, so just to to, to summarize your message is basically to the Prime Minister and more particularly possibly to the Chancellor to come up with more help than they've come up with so far. Yes, that is my message to them and I've said it to them uh, personally um, before. And I think there is a, a thing that we are almost scared of talking about, the elephant in the room. And, you know, from my point of view, having done the same city over and over again, the demographics are shifting. Our voters between Labour and the Conservatives in some areas have almost swapped. And if I'm really honest and if I'm blunt to my colleagues, I don't think we know our new electorate very well. And I think we need to learn about them. We need to understand them and we need to respond to their needs. And I would say, actually, that's the same with Labour. They're going to have to learn to know their new electorate uh, you know, in, uh, in a way that they haven't in the past. And things have changed. And there's no doubt you look you look up and down the country and you'll see pockets where Labour are not doing very well and you'll see pockets where Conservatives have historically done well but are now not doing well. And we need to, we need to look at that and we need to understand our electorates. Mr Smith, good to talk to you and thanks very much for giving us time uh, at this hour of the day. So, uh, Royston Smith there for us, the MP for Southampton, Hitchin. I want to go to the count in Hillingdon in West London. Uh, that's where we have the... Uh, former Labour Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell waiting for us. Um, your constituency, John, of course, next to the Prime Minister's. Um, so it's an interesting part of the world for more than one reason. Uh, yeah. What's going on in Hillingdon? I'm at the count, as you said, so it's going to get a bit noisy at times. I apologise for, for that. What's been happening is with Labour has picked up seats in Boris Johnson's own constituency. We've, we've picked up at least three seats in the heart of his constituency. Now that says something. And you tell me how often you've seen a rock solid, always been Tory seat represented by the Prime Minister actually start losing seats in an election like this. It's quite remarkable. And you've been, I've listened to some of your discussion. What's come up in the doorstep in Boris Johnson's constituency? Because I've been canvassing there. Why can't the government do more for us? There have been issues, you know, there have been issues about party gate as well. And I've even had people raise with me with unprompted issues around morality and honesty. So there, I, I think there's real issues that the Conservatives need to think about with regard to Boris Johnson's premiership. You're making three gains as we speak, I think. John is 16 to declare. I'm just looking at the Hillingdon tally. Um, how far is that likely to go? Because um, you, you're not I suggesting think, Labour are going to take control there, are no, you? No, no. I think we're virtually at the limit now. Um, we'll increase our, our numbers on the, the uh, council overall, and it'll be a pretty much stronger opposition. But what surprised me is I thought we'd just consolidate all those seats in my own constituency and I'd pick up a couple more in my constituency. We've gone beyond that. We've actually driven into the Uxbridge Ward, and in addition to that, a ward next to the Uxbridge Ward as well. So we're in the heart of Boris Johnson's own constituency. And as I say, it's always been Tory. It's been rock solid. It's the Prime Minister's constituency. Uh, that sends a message that there's some certain amount of disillusionment amongst his own voters. John, it's Laura here in the studio as well. What's your take on the Labour results that we've seen coming through beyond your own patch? I mean, for understandable reasons, I'm sure your fellow activists in the Labour Party will feel pretty happy about maybe breathing down Boris Johnson's constituency's neck a little bit. But what about the wider Labour performance? 
Well, I understand what uh, other commentators have been saying about, you know, it's been relatively modest. But let me put this to you. I think you need to look at how the, the politics is working out at the moment. At the moment, what we've got is a politics which is damaging the Tory party. And I think there is considerable damage to the Tory party at the moment. And it isn't just about losing seats, it's that demoralisation. And also, I think also you've got to a situation now where people may not be shifting to Labour in dramatic numbers, but what they're doing is questioning their support to the Tory party. So the next stage for Labour is have this damage being inflicted on the Tory party gives us such an opportunity now. Bridget and her colleagues now will bring forward a programme of policy that will take us into the next election. It's, and it's got to be a programme that inspires. So I think what's happened is an opportunity has opened up for the, for the Labour party because of some of the self-inflicted damage by the Tories themselves around Boris Johnson's behaviour, but also because they have no, they have not been able to answer the key question of the day, which is how do you support people in a in the personal economic crisis that they're facing as a result of the cost of living crisis? But John, and I think that's an opportunity to Labour. Now. But what would you like to see Labour do with that opportunity? I mean, previously you've been quite clear that you don't think your Starmer's offer to the public has been bold enough and you've been quite peeved that people from your side of the party have been excluded, many of them feel, from some of Keir Starmer's project. What would you think he should do with the opportunity that you say now presents him? It is about bringing forward quite a comprehensive plan of support and I think the call for another uh, a budget to support people. Keir's already made that call. What we've got to do is consolidate around that. For ex I just give you, for example, what we've been picking up on the doorstep, the, the way in which the benefit increase and pension increase was announced by Rishi Sunak, you know, 3% when inflation's going to hit 8 And in, for some people, a different rate of inflation will be 10%. In addition to that, we've been picking up a large number of workers on the doorstep who effectively have had their wages cut, not just public sector workers, but also in the private sector as well. What we need, one, for one example, is we need to ensure that people have at least a cost of living protected increase in their benefits and their pensions and their wages. And then also when we're looking at energy itself, you know, let's double the winter fuel allowance. Rishi Sunak, I think people feel is really let them down and then he's been exposed on his own tax position which any on any doorstep you'll find people saying questioning the sort of some of the hypocrisy around it john mcdonald good to talk to you thank you very much um for joining us there from hillingdon uh john mcdonald the former labor shadow chancellor um i can say that wandsworth the uh, london uh, authority has now been gained by Labour. That is the official confirmation. Uh, Labour have gained Wandsworth in southwest London, something they've been trying to do since 1978, uh, but they've now managed to do it. Uh, 32 seats to Labour, 22 to the Conservatives, uh, one to the Independents, 30 needed for a majority, Labour already on 32, with three to declare. And how did this come about? Well, Labour made eight gains in Wandsworth, uh, the Tories made eight losses. So it was a, a straight switch from Tory to Labour. Uh, and I can tell you now that we're joined by uh, Ravi Govindia, who's the uh, uh, Conservative leader of Wadsworth Council, the outgoing leader. Um, Mr Govindia, thanks very much for joining us and uh, commiserations to you on the result. I'm just wondering what you make of the reasons for this result. How did it happen? Well, thank you, Hugh. Uh, it's very difficult at the moment to actually work out what happened. In a sense, it looks like a low turnout, it looks like people probably didn't turn up in the numbers that we had expected. And inevitably, you know, other events have clouded the judgment of people in Monsworth. Uh, uh, other events I mean, being? We have had a... Well, I mean, you know, I mean, let's, let's not beat about the bush. I mean, the national events, and of course, my difficulty has been that we have run the most exceptional council. We have cut council tax, we have frozen rents, we have frozen heating and water charges, and we have actually done exactly what the residents of Wandsworth have wanted for the last 44 years indeed. And to find that that counts for nothing is a kind of a sad reflection 
on the importance of local government not being recognised. Why do you think it wasn't recognised? Well, I don't know. You need to go and, uh, go and send your team to, to speak to the people who wants it, who voted. But well, I do well, imagine that, you know... But you must have asked them yeah. yourself, surely? Well, yes. Look, I mean, on the doorstep, consistently, people raised the issues of central government. And when they came, were challenged about local issues, they credited the council as a good council. And I think a number of BBC reports found that the local residents appreciated a great council. And we thought that that was enough for us. We were discussing earlier, um, Mr. Govindia, you know, you know, the whole issue around a level of council tax being lower and services being sustained. So that, that formula is one that we are familiar with. We've discussed that a lot. Now, if you didn't succeed in selling that message to local residents or if they somehow, as you say, were distracted, um, you know, why don't you spell it out? Do you mean that people were unhappy with Boris Johnson? Well, I don't know. I mean, I look, I, I have to say he consistently on the doorstep, the issue of Boris Johnson was raised and when we talked about exactly that this was a local election and what were their concerns locally, they had none. And so we were fighting a local campaign and consistently people said, yes, fine, we are angry about it, but we will settle for this council. What and we obviously didn't see it coming. What in terms of the campaign, when you were on the doorstep, you were campaigning and telling people about the yes. service that uh, yeah. you are providing and why you think it's better than the yeah. one that Labour would provide and what was the response you yeah. got in terms of the actual argument on services? Well actually there were none because in fact if you study the Labour Party manifesto it has virtually taken every one of our promises and turned into their promises. They have promised to keep the council tax low when they consistently haven't been supporting council tax, low council tax. They agreed to build 1,000 homes, which is exactly our policy and has been our policy for a very long time. They agreed that the weekly bin collection would stay, which is exactly our policy. So in a sense, they have taken all our policies. So I don't understand. You, you said it's Laura here in the studio as well. You, you obviously sound frustrated. You say your local success, as you see it, counted for nothing because consistently the issue of Boris Johnson was raised. When you say the issue of Boris Johnson, can you just... I mean, spell that out for us. Was it frustration about the lockdown parties? And, and what would you want MPs in Parliament to do about it? Look, so Laura, I mean, no, I didn't say consistently, but many people did raise it. So people were actually trying to balance the local issue versus national. And, you know, people genuinely conflicted. And on the doorstep, we were able to focus the attention onto local services. But when you say the issue of Boris Johnson, forgive me, I just to, to spell that out, do you mean handling of the well, cost of living crisis or are you talking about lockdown no, events that a lot of MPs and a lot of members well, of public were upset, have been upset about in recent months, but other people, frankly, have had enough of hearing about it? So, look, I mean, a lot of people were talking about the cost of living crisis as they saw it. There were people obviously affected by tax increases and the national insurance, and again, my point to local resident was that what I could fix, which was the council tax, I have fixed in their favour. The only council in the land to cut council tax. Mr. Govindia, thank you so much for bearing with us. Uh, I know it's been difficult to hear some of the questions, but uh, um, yeah. you've, you've answered them all very clearly. So thank you very much indeed. Um, that was interesting, Paul, wasn't much. it, in terms of um, what he was saying. He was clearly very... Well, understandably, he's going to be disappointed and frustrated. Um, but, but, you know, he was reluctant to criticise the Prime Minister, uh, clearly. But, but, uh, but he did concede that that distracted people from the work that they'd been doing locally. Yeah, I mean, Ravi is a brilliant council leader. He's done amazing work over the last few years and, and rallied his uh, councillor team to provide those services that we were talking about. And that's what I meant about when I was talking about the fact that uh, it was raised in different ways in different areas. I was in Putney, I was in Ballam over the last few days, and it was certainly raised a, a bit more there than um, unprompted than it was in Sutton, mm. the, the two examples that I gave you today. Um, but nonetheless, Ravi's absolutely right, because what, what I found, and what Ravi obviously described, 
is that you have to have those conversations. That's why the ground campaign is so, so important because you, you can be so distracted by, by rolling news, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. um, national news, by national media, by social media and these kind of things which are taking you off on all sorts of tangents. You forget actually just what's out your front, outside your front door. It comes full circle. I'm agreeing with Barry Rawlins when he said right at the beginning <laughs> that it really does, the local council stuff does matter. It's, as soon as you open your door, you've seen if your bins have been emptied, you get in your car, you're driving over potholes, you're taking your child to a school, have you got enough school places or enough children's services for them? Every visible service actually is council driven. Mm -hmm not national government. But there we are, one of the most successful Conservative, now former council leaders, couldn't get people to focus on those issues that are so important to them because of all of the noise and what seemed to many people like chaos in central government. We're hearing also from Conservative sources that the same might happen even in Westminster Council. That may also be lost by the Conservatives. I mean, well, I'm not how serious about do you think but this, this, this situation I'm not going to speculate be. about Westminster, but I think actually what you, what you find is that people tend to drive their votes more through um, their pocket. And so the cost of living thing, I think, has is, is, is probably got more cut through at the moment. And actually what Ravi was doing, he was doing the one thing that councils can do to tackle the cost of living issue, cut your council tax. It's a hefty budget for most people to pick up on, and yet it's half the price of, um, of, 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 of the boroughs around him, and he had a 1% cut, cut this year. It's a shame it didn't get more cut through, um, because I think uh, the residents of Wandsworth are actually going to regret what, they, what they've had um, for the last 40 years. Now it's gone. Uh, Paul, I think you're leaving us. Um, Bridget, I hope you're staying. Yeah. Uh, not that I want you to go, Paul, but I think, <laughs> not, I think Robert Jenrick is going to take your place. So um, thanks for being with us. Pleasure. It's good, good, good to have you with us. Um, and uh, why don't we just take a break for, for the news um, and join Tim again. Indeed, a 4.35, a summary of the BBC News. Now, the Conservatives are losing seats, with Labour making only modest gains in the local elections in England. In the last few minutes, as we've just heard, the Tories have lost control of Wandsworth to Labour. One Conservative councillor told this programme uh, there was a great deal of animosity towards Boris Johnson and that voters had told him they no longer have the confidence that the Prime Minister can be relied upon to tell the truth. The Lib Dems have won Hull from Labour in the first change of control of the night. Our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. Voters across the country went to the polls to elect thousands of local councillors who will run their services and set their council tax. Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are seeing losses, particularly in London and the South, to the anger of some party members. It's party gate, it's not just party gate. Um, there's the, the integrity issue, basically, I just don't feel people any longer have the confidence that the Prime Minister can be relied upon to tell the truth. That's um, quite a big thing to say, isn't it? Well, that's what people have been saying to me. And do you think that's fair? I can see that point of view. They've lost Wandsworth in South London to Labour for the first time in 44 years. And they're on course to lose Southampton and Barnet in North London to Labour too. I think these results are far better than a lot of people predicted uh, over the last few weeks. I think what we're seeing very clearly is that Keir Starmer isn't cutting through. Labour are making hardly any progress compared to uh, 2018. Obviously, there are, there are major issues to address for the country. A lot of that's fallout from an international situation. But, you know, if we can get some of those issues on the international stage calmed down and deal with some of those, the impacts of those that are having domestically, then I think, uh, you know, we can definitely... Uh, bill back from these results tonight. The party has held the key council of Sunderland, but with a smaller majority. We've got a win in the south. We've got a win in London. Let, it's a long night and a long morning. Let's see where we end up. But to start with winning Sunderland, I'm a very happy man on a 43% share of the vote. Very happy indeed. But Labour is not expecting big gains, and they've had losses too. The Liberal Democrats, who've been having a good night, took Hull Council from them. It just shows you that this evening we're making gains in the Tory blue wall seats that we're targeting for the next general election, and we're taking seats off Labour in places like Hull. We took a seat off Labour in Sunderland earlier. In fact, we were the only party to make gains in Sunderland, both against the Conservatives and against the Labour Party. 
The Greens too have made some early gains. Not all councils are counting overnight tonight. The rest will start tomorrow. And these elections are about local issues, but as the results come in, they will also paint a national picture. Helen Catt, BBC News. Helen. Well, as Helen was saying, there will be no counting until later this morning in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. In Scotland and Wales, where people can vote from the age of 16, seats in all councils are being contested. Voters in Northern Ireland will be electing members of the Assembly. It comes just a few months after the Democratic Unionist Party resigned from the First Minister's role, causing the executive to collapse. If you want to find out the result in your area, just go to the website or the app, put in your postcode. Uh, you'll also get lots of analysis and the latest reports from our teams around the country. In other news, uh, interest rates... Those are the main other stories so far. Back to you now, Hugh. Very good morning and welcome back to the uh, BBC's election studio. If you've been with us all night, we salute your perseverance and we love your loyalty. If you're just joining us, you're also welcome. Um, so I think the best thing to do is say that we're saying good morning to Robert Jenrick, Conservative MP, who's just joined us. Bridget uh, Phillipson is still with us for Labour. Laura's with me, of course. And uh, Rita is still with us too. So we'll start with Rita with the latest results, and then we'll uh, pick up and start discussing some of the lessons to be learned from those. Rita? So some painful news here for Robert Jenrick, uh, which is that West Oxfordshire is now a hung council. The Conservatives have lost control of West Oxfordshire. This is where David Cameron's former seat was, of course, and it has been Conservative since the turn of the century, although Tory support had been whittled away in the last three elections. Um, let's have a look and see what's happened to the seats. So the Conservatives have lost three seats so far and they've been uh, gained by the Liberal Democrats and by the Greens. There are still, as you can see, five seats to be counted, um, but the Conservatives can't uh, meet the winning post of 25 seats. That is the way in which the share of the vote um, has uh, divided up. Uh, the Lib Dems just behind the Conservatives. But look at that. That's the share change since four years ago. Uh, and the Conservatives and Labour both down. And it is David Cameron's coalition partners, the Liberal Democrats and also the Greens, who are picking up the the share of the vote there um, some more results to bring you here Wandsworth of course we've talked about um, Ealing and Redbridge both in London are Labour holds uh, Preston is also a Labour hold uh, in Barnet and Westminster uh, similarly totemic councils for the Conservatives in London so we're waiting to see what's going to happen there but um, as Laura was saying uh, some very um, optimistic and positive sounding noises coming from the Labour camps in each of those councils and Southampton Labour needs one more seat to win overall control of Southampton but the Conservative MP for Southampton has effectively already conceded the council on air. Rita many thanks well Plenty for us to talk about there. Uh, there's a note from Sir John Curtis. I just wanted to bring this in. It's about turnout uh, because it's it's emerged a few times in the discussion about whether turnout is to do with uh, some of the results. It does look as though we're heading for a slightly lower turnout compared to other recent local elections, says John. Uh, on average, the turnout is down by a point compared to with 2018, the last time these seats uh, were being contested uh, in the key wards, he says. Um, and by two and a half points compared with last year. Uh, however, we cannot find any sign that where turnout fell most, the Conservatives necessarily particularly suffered as a result. Well, John is saying that because one or two of the contributors, um, mm. as Laura and I were discussing earlier, mm. uh, they were suggesting that, you know, some of the results were down to a lower turnout. Um, the Lib Dems, as we noticed there, a really important factor in the loss of control in West Oxfordshire for the Conservatives. They're up 13%. So let's join um, Baroness Kramer, uh, Susan Kramer for the Lib Dems. Um, uh, Susan, good morning. Thanks very much for joining good us. Good morning to you. Good to see you. And um, 
Yes, up 13% in West Oxfordshire, but there are other uh, promising results for you as well. Um, let's have your reading of things so far. I, I mean, we started out saying that we wanted to make progress. We thought it would be modest progress, but frankly, it's looking significantly better than that. And uh, what excites me is we, we have obviously some areas of strength, particularly areas that we won, like Richmond, where I live, uh, in 2018. But it seems to be spreading out across the country. I mean, you know, picking up seats in Sunderland, obviously winning Hull, uh, but uh, almost everywhere you look uh, in what would have been the constituency constituency of Cheadle. That's an, an area where we have history. We've picked up seats there. If I look in London, um, I never thought we could win any more seats in Richmond. I really thought we'd, we'd maxed out there. But in Barnes Ward, where I live, we've taken all three seats from the Conservative, the only ward that they actually held, and they've held it for 20 years. And I think that will reverberate pretty heavily that, uh, uh, through the Conservative Party. But it's a good reflection on the kind of quality of local services. Uh, and then if we look at uh, the borough of Merton, um, in the Wimbledon uh, constituency, uh, we, we now have holds within that, that catchment area of Merton. Uh, so we've got 17 seats up from six and the Conservatives have dropped from 17 to six. So there are, I think, a lot of, of powerful and good messages here uh, that show that the party is rebuilding. Um, uh, we have Robert Jenrick in the studios, isn't I'm just um, uh, going, to be, going to be asking him in a, in a moment about the Lib Dems and the kind of threat they potentially pose to Conservatives in the South and the South West. Um, I'm just wondering what, what, what you'd say about your message really in terms of your own strength in these areas and what kind of threat you think you might pose uh, in these seats going forward in the next couple of years. Well, we've been getting really good responses back in the South and Southwest. I mean, some of those are areas where historically we had strength, but we really have found, uh, you know, if you look at in areas like Somerset, that uh, we really have found local people feeling taken for granted. Uh, so it's a bit like sort of going up and being part of that North Shropshire campaign. You go out into areas, you find farmers uh, so who are feeling that their issues are not being addressed and are not being dealt with. Uh, so, and they know that the Lib Dems have a long history and really being supportive to the farm community. You find in more rural areas that they don't getting the level of service they've been overlooked they've been taken for granted we're getting a lot of feedback of that kind and i'll be really interested to see the results as they start to come out that uh, over the rest of the day but you can feel that we're we're not confined to just you know our absolutely key major strongholds anymore you can look and see the expansion beyond that and uh, particularly i think we're going to be seeing it now down in what we call the blue wall seats but that those seats have been held by the Conservatives, but where there's a lot of sharing of values with Liberal Democrats and, uh, and people are, are looking at the party and saying, actually, um, I, I, I think it's time I voted what I wanted rather than, you know, anti-Labour Party, which, which has been a lot of what's happened before. Baroness Kramer, good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Baroness Kramer there for the Lib Dems. Um, we're also joined by the Mayor of London, Labour's Sadiq Khan. Um, Mr Khan, th thanks very much for joining us. You're down in Wandsworth. Um, I can't imagine what you're doing down in Wandsworth, to be honest. Uh, although, it's tooting, isn't it? So it's your own backyard, really. So, uh, uh, what do you make of the performance there? It's amazing. I mean, history has been made tonight for the first time in 44 years. A council first one when Margaret Thatcher was leader of the Conservative opposition and has stayed Conservative for 44 years has gone Labour and it's quite remarkable. We now have three Labour MPs in Wandsworth, in Tooton of course, in Battersea and in Putney and we now have a majority uh, we never dreamed of in the last 44 years and tomorrow residents will be waking up to a Labour Council. What are the factors here? You're going to say, uh, as lots of your colleagues have said, previously that you know it's all about um, Boris Johnson and Partygate and cost of living. Um, is it not then about the fact that Labour offers a better vision of local services? You're standing there in Wandsworth where traditionally people have been lauding this combination of a lower council tax with good local services. Was it nothing to do with that? 
So what the Labour team did in Wandsworth, led by Councillor Simon Hogg, was make an offer to residents of not just keeping council tax low in Wandsworth, but to be building genuinely affordable homes that residents uh, need, to have a target to get to zero carbon by 2030, to invest in young people. But also, let me be frank, the cost of living crisis did come up as did the massive cuts from the government since 2010 and also Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was a vote winner for Labour as indeed was Keir Starmer as uh, well and I, I remind you Hugh in uh, 1998 a year after our landslide victory we didn't win this seat in Wandsworth in 2002 a year after our landslide victory in 2001 we didn't win this seat in Wandsworth and we've done it in 2022 and uh, a lot of hard work from great candidates behind me but actually uh, local residents here, like in national uh, elections, are fed up with same old, same old. When we discussed with uh, Sir John Curtis earlier, the wider Labour performance, not just the one in London, because of course we were talking about Barnet as well earlier, um, John was suggesting that the performance, yes, of course it involved gains, but it wasn't uh, in the area of really impressive gains and certainly not in the area of being able to say it was a springboard to election victory. Um, I mean, hold on a second. Where, where do I you listen. rate it? Well, first of all, I, I bow to Sir John, uh, who obviously is the guru. But listen, Margaret Thatcher won this. John Major kept it. Uh, you know, William Hay kept it. Uh, IDS kept it. Michael Howard kept it. David Cameron kept it uh, conservative. Theresa May kept a conservative a combination of Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer won it back for us 44 years I was literally eight years old Hugh uh, when this seat went uh, to the uh, Tories we've won it back we have made history tonight and as much as I love Sir John he's not ruined my night for me um, I, I was gonna ask you about <laughs> Westminster um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm doing my best here Sadiq um, I, I'm, I'm basically asking about Westminster what are your chances then as a Labour Party of gaining control of Westminster? Well, I was uh, in Westminster this week, Karen Buck, great local uh, Labour MP. The Labour team there is working incredibly hard. Some of the wards, and Sir John will confirm this, the, the vote we'd have to overturn are humongous. But we were hearing people on the doorstep uh, promising to vote uh, Labour. And if they've come out today in Westminster and in Barnet, we could be seeing some gains in those two boroughs. It's too early to call either of those uh, seats. And also, of course, Croydon, they start counting tomorrow as well. And the reason why these seats are important and they are springboards is in Westminster, there are parliamentary seats we want to target at the next general election. In Barnet, of course, all three seats are Conservative MPs, which are marginal seats. We want to target those at the next general election. And in Croydon, of course, and we want to make sure we keep the two seats we gained in, in recent years, but also try and target the third uh, Tory seat as well. So it does matter. London, of course, currently has 73 members of parliament. That's increasing with the boundary changes. And what's really important is we build on the progress we've seen in Wandsworth tonight, hopefully in Westminster, hopefully in uh, Barnet. Let's see what happens in uh, Croydon, Harrow and elsewhere. Uh, so, so, so just to draw these strands together, um um, Mr. Khan, you, you, you're confident, or, well, I'm asking you, are you confident that this is a set of results so far, I mean, they're not all in, I know that, that point to some kind of hope of a Labour victory at the next general election? Oh, absolutely. Look, so, so John will confirm this. Four years ago, in 2018, uh, when Brexit was an issue, had many Tory Remainers voting for us. And in 2018, in London, uh, we secured the best results since 1974. We've trumped that tonight, we think, which would be quite remarkable in uh, at London. No complacency from us. We've got br brilliant Labour MPs in uh, London. We want even more. But we now have uh, even more brilliant uh, Labour councils, I hope, including ones that are behind me tonight as well. Sadiq, it's Laura here in the studio as well. Um, just when you look beyond London, though, and obviously you look absolutely cock a hoop with what's happening in your backyard. When you look beyond London, does it show, Laura? And when we when we look at the key wards that Sir John identifies for us as well, actually, Labour across the country looks like it's heading backwards a little bit. Do you really feel confident that outside London there's an enthusiasm for what the party's putting forward under Keir Starmer? Well, let's wait and see. I remember a year ago, people writing off Labour on uh, election night 
and then lo and behold, the next day, uh, the London results came in, the Wales result came in, the Manchester results came in, and uh, so forth. Let's wait and see, because many of the councils aren't being counted until tomorrow and the uh, day after. But I've got to see this, Laura. I was in Barnet this morning, and I've been in Barnet over the last few weeks. Barnet's a good example. Three Conservative members of Parliament and voters were flooding back to us because Keir Starmer's taken action on anti-Semitism, but also because they've got a bad Tory council and people are fed up with the government not taking action on the cost of living crisis, uh, on you know what's happening with uh, you know cuts from the government, but also the public are fed up with Boris Johnson. And I, I say this point with humility: Boris Johnson's good for Labour. It's in Labour's interest for him to stay, but it's in the national interest for him to go. Sadiq Khan, uh, it's uh, five to five in the morning, and uh, thank you so much for joining us from Wandsworth, um, and uh, probably need a bit of a kip. So thanks very much indeed. Uh, Mayor of London there, Sadiq Khan. Robert Jenrick, he was making a point about, um, you know, Labour's ability now to claw back some of the areas outside London, he was claiming that was, uh, that was being demonstrated to some extent. Um, and of course, that within London, Keir Starmer's managed to do uh, what predecessors have not managed to do. Uh, not least with Keir Starmer and Barnett with the, the anti-Semitism thing, that's one specific issue, but more generally, and that includes Wandsworth, and some people are even mentioning Westminster, as Laura was mentioning mm. earlier. You, you must be, you know, you must be concerned or unsettled by that. Well, the first thing to say, uh, this is my first time on your programme this morning, is I'm very sorry for all of the Conservative councillors that have lost their seats and uh, may do over the course of the day. There are some fantastic councils here. Wandsworth, above all, you know, this is a council that's delivered such low council tax, such good public services, and has not just done a fantastic service to the people of Wandsworth for 40 years, but to the whole country. As a former local government secretary, it has been one of the exemplar councils showing others what they can and, and should do. So, of course, there are some very disappointing results here. I don't think that Sadiq's uh, analysis is correct. You're seeing some good results for Labour in London. I don't see evidence of that across the rest of the country yet. Of course, it's, it's early in, in the morning. Um, but if you look at some of the results that have come through in North Tyneside, in Nuneaton, um, you're seeing Conservative gains in uh, you know, Angela Rayner's own council in Tameside, and there are many other examples. This doesn't feel to me at this stage as if this is going to be a set of results which suggests that people are flocking to Keir Starmer's banner and that the Labour Party is on course to win the next general election. I'm sure you've said this already over the course of your analysis, but, you know, this stage in the um, last Labour, in the, the, sorry, the last Conservative government in, uh, if you look to 1995, uh, Tony Blair was winning 1,800 seats at this point. And you've also got to remember that the Conservative Party going into this set of elections was the largest party of local government. We had 40% of all of the councillors. That's very unusual uh, 12 years into a government. At this stage in the last uh, Labour government, the Labour Party in government had about 20% of the seats. So you would expect a party which was really knocking on the door of Downing Street to be winning very large numbers of seats. I may be mistaken, it doesn't feel to me thus far as that's the case. And where people are unfortunately turning away from the Conservative Party, because we're mid-term, people want to make an understandable protest vote in the usual way, they seem to be going to Greens, to Independents, sometimes to Lib Dems, less so to the Labour Party, particularly out of London. Some mm. of your Conservative colleagues, though, we've heard on this programme tonight, have said it's not just the mid-term blues. Local leaders, a local leader in Cumbria, saying to us it was about Boris Johnson's integrity. The highly successful, as you said, council leader up until now, and ones were saying to us that Boris Johnson was raised again and again. There were other issues, but Boris Johnson's leadership. Now, are you confident, really, that you can brush that off as mid-term blues? Well, there are, there's always discontent with the sitting Prime Minister, particularly in a very difficult situation like the one we're facing now with an economic crisis that's affecting all of our daily lives. There were people on the doorstep, particularly in some of the places that we've been talking about, like in London and parts of the southeast, uh, where some of that criticism did come up, much less so, I would say, in the rest of the country. And mm -hmm. I suspect what the results will show is the continuing realignment of 
British politics so that uh, you're seeing you know, less fertile territory, perhaps for the Conservatives in uh, London, more so in other parts of the country. As I, I do not see any enthusiasm for Sir Keir Starmer and his leadership of the Labour Party in none of the doorsteps, you know, on none of the doorsteps I was knocking on in uh, parts of the Midlands and North did I see people saying that he was the man, he was an inspirational leader, he was the person they wanted uh, to be Prime Minister, that he had a better plan to get the country through what I think is going to be one of the most difficult years in any of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're heading at least, you know, teetering on the brink of a recession, you've got inflation at 10%. Nobody was saying that the Labour Party had a credible plan to tackle that. I suspect that's why you're seeing in those places what I think will be quite disappointing results for the Labour Party. Well, Robert, the idea that you'd come along here today and say, well, do you know people are queuing up to tell me that Labour had a credible plan? <laughs> I mean, that would be a stretching the imagination, I, I imagine, even though you're a man of impeccable honesty, I know. Um, Bridget, uh, the issue here is to do with, you know, whether Labour is where it is making gains, and we, we just be looking at Wandsworth, where that happens, that that is happening because people are impressed with Labour's case, yes, uh, certainly in somewhere like Wandsworth, where the picture is very interesting given the council's previous record of being pretty popular with people locally, given the factors we've discussed, or whether Labour is in London just picking up on a kind of, you know, anti-Boris trend, um, which may well be powerful for you, but it's not a pro Keir Starmer trend, which plays into what Robert was trying to, um, was outlining there. Which is it? And what is more important to you at this point? Is it that people actually are looking at a programme of government, even if it's local government, and thinking, well, if this is a party I want to see in power. This is a party I actively want to see running things, rather than I don't want to see them running things. Which one is it? Well, I think the results that we're seeing across the country, not just in London, but yes. in places like Cumberland, demonstrate that people are turning away from the government and coming back to Labour. And those will be key areas for us at the next general election. So it's not simply that we're just doing well in, in London, although obviously some of the results um, are unprecedented in London, but we are making progress in those kind of target seats for the next election. I mean, people are coming back to Labour and there is a positivity there that I have not seen for some time. You know, a couple of years ago, you know, the response on the doorstep, I can tell you, was very, very different. Mm. We're getting a warm response now. People are willing to listen to us. We have set out a clear plan around the cost of living in real contrast to the government. And people are absolutely desperate. Mm. You know, it's, it is a combination, I think, when people have been considering how to vote around the discreditable conduct of the Prime Minister. And people are really angry about that. I think people have high expectations, rightly, about how their Prime Minister should behave. And Boris Johnson has fallen far short of that. But alongside that, given what people are seeing around gas and electricity bills, uh, the cost of shopping, all of that, to be in a position where you've got a government not willing to act um, on those really pressing issues that people are facing. You know, we said that there should be a windfall tax on oil and gas companies to give people immediate relief now. We said there should be extra support around childcare. You know, we have set out a lot. And in contrast, the government, you know, seemed to expect people to be grateful for what they put in place during the pandemic. That doesn't cut it and that isn't going away. The situation is likely to worsen. And also the situation surrounding Boris Johnson is not going away. We've still got an active police investigation. There is more to come. So I think it's terrible for the country to be in a position where we've got a prime minister who brings the country so low. Um, but if the Conservatives want to press ahead and keep him in place, that's for them, really. I think, you know, he should go. Um, he's brought his office into disrepute. He's lost all moral authority. But he, his conduct does come up and that is not going anywhere. You don't want him to go, Robert, do you? Uh, no, I think he's the right person. I think the country, with all of the issues that it faces today, both domestically and internationally, would be, I don't think it could be in the national interest for us to go into a leadership contest and try to replace the Prime Minister. You only have to see the other day the welcome he was given in the Ukrainian parliament to see the way that he is performing on the international stage and is received in uh, many international capitals. So I think he has a lot of strengths. It's right that he stays. You know, I, I'm not one in politics who throws stones at other politicians. I, I do think that voters are seeing that Keir Starmer has been rather hypocritical, the way in which he's pursued the issues around so party gates. No, I resist I mean, doing it's, that. It's, but I, well, you no, just, I, you've I, just done it. No, no. So, what I mean, that I, is rubbish. No, that really I, is rubbish. It, rubbish. Isn't, it isn't, Bridget. What I'm saying is 
there's a high price to be paid for hypocrisy in politics. And if you go around spending months campaigning on party gain, then it's revealed that you had a not dissimilar party yourself. And it's revealed that the police have found that there isn't a case a to answer and there's position. nothing to investigate. And I think the public yeah. find that very disappointing. I think the public dislike mudslinging where there's no substance to it. Well, that's exactly and, what you know, the Labour Party's been doing for months. No. Unfortunately, the, no, Keir Starmer's the, the been Prime caught Minister out now because he was in a similar situation. The law. That's not mudslinging, that's a fact. And yet you want to throw well, around baseless accusations well, about, not, a not a matter, baseless. With, about a matter that respect, has been investigated with all due respect, by the it police. Isn't, it isn't baseless. And if the Labour Party was so confident of the position, it would have been honest about it. Well, I'm, I'm telling you well, what you the situation well, is. You didn't say that Angela Rayner was at the party. You didn't say that there was a £200 <sighs> bill for curry and beer and so on. Look, my point, the point I'm making... Prime, Prime Minister was fined. The point I'm making is... Keir Starmer's not is, been fined. Well, 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 we'll fine. have to wait and see what, well, what the happens. The police said they'd looked at it, didn't they? They have said that, yeah. but we don't know whether they'll choose to reopen it. I mean, I, I think there's mounting evidence that, that they should do. Well, but I think the, well, point, the point I'm making is that mm. you, it's very ill-advised to spend months throwing mud at other politicians when you've been in a situation which sounds as if it was I mean there really is no comparison I mean there, there were multiple parties at Downing Street they were literally wheeling in booze to have parties I mean there is just really no comparison let's pause Stephen Bush from the Financial Times has shown impeccable patience and waiting over an hour at least to talk to us um, uh, Stephen many thanks for joining us and um, could I ask you based on the results that you've seen so far what you'll be telling readers of the FT well, I think what I'll be telling readers of the FT is that we have basically got a similar set of results to what we saw in 2018. Two big parties making inroads into each other's traditional territory, neither looking like they have a particularly um, sound path to either holding on to their majority if they are the Conservatives or winning a majority if they are the Labour Party. Now, of course, the big difference is back then we knew that the Labour Party was going to have to make a very painful choice over Brexit, whereas now we know that um, the government is going to face some very painful challenges because it does look like we are heading back towards a stagflationary environment so when we have stagnant growth and high inflation and that is very difficult uh, for incumbent governments uh, particularly here where it now does look like uh, inflation has spread from energy to you know, become endemic within the within the UK economy. Where do you think uh, Labour's strengths and weaknesses are at the moment when you look at the performance in London and we've been talking about Wandsworth and Barnet and possibly Westminster uh, and then you look beyond London at areas where they've suffered a lot of damage in recent years. W what's your reading of Labour's uh, position now? I think in many ways Barnett sums up both uh, the strengths of Labour's current position and their weaknesses, right? Which is, in 2018, when these elections were last fought, Jeremy Corbyn inspired genuine enthusiasm in some parts of the country, but in other parts of the country he inspired real fear. And the reason why the Labour Party have won Barnett isn't uh, particularly among British, the British Jewish community, that real fear has gone away. And actually, when you were travelling covering this election, it was very rare to meet someone who was scared by Keir Starmer. But the problem for Labour was also not just very rare. I don't think anyone could say they have met someone who was excited by the possibility of Keir Starmer or a Labour government. And so what they really... So their hope, their, you know, the kind of hope might be to say, well, look, given the circumstances, perhaps we can win by default. But what they will hope they can do is that they can go from being a party which inspires neither fear nor enthusiasm to one which inspires enthusiasm but not fear. And your reading of the Conservative environment, uh, given that we've already had some uh, council, outgoing council leaders who are, you know, nursing some wounds and have been very critical of uh, the Prime Minister's influence on their local campaigns, what's your reading there? I mean, I think the Conservative picture is in some ways not that interesting, right? We have a, a, a government whose strategy to fight the inflation is for households to take the hit. That makes voters unhappy. We have a Prime Minister who has been fined for breaking some laws which were very difficult for most people to follow. That makes people unhappy. And people are reaching for the traditional lever they reach for in British politics when they're unhappy with the government, the Liberal Democrats. Um, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Stephen Bush there from the uh, Financial Times. Um, let's take a look at the uh, position in Barnet, which is the authority in uh, North London that we were talking about um, with uh, 26 to declare. Uh, Labour on 22, uh, the Tories on 15, 32 needed for a majority, still counting. Labour having made seven gains, the Tories uh, having 
lost seven. We were talking earlier to the uh, Labour leader in Barnet, but I think now we're in a position where we can talk to Daniel Thomas, who's the uh, Conservative uh, leader uh, in Barnet Council. Um, Mr Thomas, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, what's your assessment of where you are right now? I'm afraid we have lost control of the council. Um, we've not had all the results declared yet, but it's clear from um, the, the ballots being counted that unfortunately we have lost a council and we have lost a lot of very good councillors as a result. Well, c commiserations on, on the loss. Um, I'm bound to ask you what, what your analysis is of what's happened. W what are the factors here? I think it's a perfect storm. Um, you've had the cost of living crisis. Um, you've had 12 years of Conservative government. You've had um, some new ward boundaries uh, redrawn as well, which I think um, now the results have uh, come in the more favourable to the, to the Labour Party. Uh, so I think that perfect storm is why I'm here today, uh, no longer the leader of Barnet Council. Um, do you think that people on the doorstep were angry about central government or were they angry about what was happening on the ground? So Partygate came up um, very occasionally um, throughout the campaign, um, not all the time and um, there were some weeks when, when Partygate went quiet and uh, <laughs> nobody was bringing it up on the doorstep and when it came up again when there's a new revelation or fine or something like that then um, people would bring it up on the doorstep and it really was an issue I think that impacted us um, but I think even without that we were we were up against it as I say it's what 12 years of government cost of living crisis um, very recently people have had their pay slips and they've seen that their net pay has gone gone down slightly um, and I think all that adds up and hence our losses today when it comes to measures by uh, government, uh, Mr Thomas, let's take, for example, um, national insurance and things like that. How much of an impact have they had? I think, I think that did have an impact late in the day. I mean, people get their pay slips at the end of April. Um, polling day is only a few days after that. Um, cost of living, as we all know, is going up. Um, everything's gone up, petrol, food. Uh, so, yeah, that's going to uh, have an impact. And I think the whole mood of the country uh, with the cost of living, uh, with, with pay going down, uh, it, we have been punished for that this morning. It's interesting because a mid-term government facing economic pressure is in a pretty tricky spot. I mean, you've lost your position tonight. Do you feel that it's sort of recoverable, this situation? I mean, the general election is, you know, still some time away, but governments who've been in power for a long time, when things start to go wrong with the economy and people real, really start to feel the pinch, as you've outlined, getting back their momentum, getting back their political dominance is not an easy thing to do. Do you think they can? No, I think, I think this is a warning shot from Conservative supporters, and I think our loss today um, it's not only due to the fact, as I've just mentioned, um, but also a fair number of Conservative voters who just didn't go out to vote, um, stayed at home. Um, I don't think there's been a huge conversion to the Labour Party, and I, th I think the Labour Party has still got a way to go to win a general election. Um, but of course, this doesn't bode well, particularly for outer London seats. On the, on the wider picture, Daniel, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm just picking up on the uh, kind of wider Conservative performance. I know you're rightly focused on what's happened in Barnet. Um, but when you look beyond London, uh, what's been going on, um, are you confident that the party is prepared to live with the current leadership? Or are you thinking that maybe this is a time when turbulent scenarios such as yours could lead to demands for a change at the top? Do you have a view on that? Well, I've not seen the results outside of London. I know it's been a bad night um, for the Conservatives in London. We've lost colleagues across the capital. The London is a little bit different to the rest of the country. Um, but in Barnet, there are three Conservative uh, MPs. Uh, the result tonight does not bode well um, for them. And clearly, uh, you know, if Labour are to get a majority in Parliament, they need to win Barnet. They've, they've won the council. Um, if they win uh, our, our, our parliamentary constituencies as well, um, then, then it doesn't bode well for us to form a government in a future general election. But we, we've got time to fix that. I do genuinely believe we have got time to fix that. It was only um, a year ago that in, in this very borough we were winning 
um, council seats from Labour in by-elections. So um, I, think, I think a lot can change in a matter of, of months. Um, but this is a warning shot and the government does need to listen to her. Daniel Thomas, thanks very much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, it's good to talk to you. Daniel Thomas, uh, the Conservative leader in Barnet Council, who uh, is acknowledging that they have lost control there and that Labour is to take control of Barnet Council. And it's interesting there, you know, obviously a very experienced leader of the Conservatives and uh, the grassroots, very clearly and using the phrase several times, perhaps so that the national leadership hears that this, mm. this is a warning shot yes. for the National mm. Party. Clearly unhappy about the direction of some taxation. A lot of Conservatives have been unhappy about tax going up in the way that it has, acknowledging that there have been issues around Boris Johnson's personality or the Partygate allegations rather that have been raised on the doorstep. So politely saying to the bosses in Westminster, listen up, this is not necessarily going the right way. And if you things carried on on this trajectory, look, we are still, I mean, I know it feels like we've been up for 100 years, yeah. we are still quite early in this whole process. Mm. But if we carry on along this trajectory, what we'd be looking at is a win for Labour, mm. a narrow win, perhaps with only a few yeah. points in it, but that's what we are looking at. Now, will it be something that national polls have been suggested where Labour are up at sort of 39, 40%, the kind that could take them to a majority? Signs don't necessarily look like that, but if, if they carry on this trajectory, it would look like perhaps a, a Labour win, a narrow one, but a victory of sorts. Let's go to Southampton. We're going to talk to Satva Kaur, who is the uh, leader of the Labour group there, about to become council leader. Uh, Ms. Uh, it's good to talk to you, Satva. Uh, can you tell us what's happened there? So, um, Labour have taken control of the council, so I'll be becoming um, the new leader of the council. Labour's had a, a brilliant night here um, in the city. Well, congratulations to you, but we're bound to say that because it's clearly... Uh, uh, a cause for congratulation for you and your supporters. I'm looking at the uh, uh, figures here. Uh, Saturday is 26 seats to you in Labour, 21 for the Tories, one for the Lib Dems, and a majority of four. You made four gains. Labour made four gains. The Conservatives made four losses. Lib Dems up one. The Independents down one. Percentage share of the vote 46% to Labour. 36% to the Conservatives. So it's, um, and it's a four point uh, gain for you um, on last time since 2018. So what were the factors? What do you put it down to? So I think in um, local elections and definitely here in Southampton, people voted on a variety of different issues. Some of them were local and didn't feel as though the Conservative administration um, were delivering um, for Southampton residents. So I'm humbled that they're putting their trust in, in Labour this time. But also um, time and time again on the doorstep, people were really feeling let down by this Conservative government, um, whether it was over crime or the cost of living. They did want to send a message. Uh, when you say crime, you mean crime locally or what do you mean? So crime, whether it's antisocial behaviour, um, drug use, um, and you know, Hampshire has lost 700 police officers um, in recent years and we just haven't had that number back and you know, crime is, is really high in Southampton and people are just do not feel safe in their homes or their neighbourhoods and feel as though it has got worse under this Conservative government and under a Conservative PCC. On the cost of living, what were people saying to you there and uh, really what kind of help do people need or want that they're not getting? What are they saying? So you just hear the most heartbreaking stories from people um, talking to them on their doorsteps, from people having to decide between heating their homes or feeding their children. They can't put petrol to get to work. Um, you know, pensioners are, are really struggling and putting on extra cardigans um, just to just stay warm. And actually, they, they want the government um, to do more and, and feel as though they can, but are choosing not to. And fundamentally, trust in Boris Johnson has just completely dissipated. Uh, Saturday call. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I think they're packing up the hall behind you, so uh, we'd better let you get go or um, you'll be locked in for the rest of the day. So thanks very <laughs> thank much you. indeed. That was interesting. Uh, it wasn't in the sense of um, the blend there of local and national, yeah. but certainly in terms of, for example, cost of living issues. Um, 
what what for you has been the main feature of the campaign on that? We've talked about mm. Prime Minister and Partygate and we've had that discussion. Um, but on cost of living, what are people saying? I think it's pensioners I've heard a lot from mm. about the impact um, that all of this is having. Because, of course, many pensioners need to be at home more during the day. Um, the pension, the triple locks, not, um, has been scrapped um, and they are facing real pressure around their gas and electricity bills. But for families as well, impossible choices that they're being forced to make. You know, for many parents, they're, they're having to give up work because they can't afford childcare. The cost is going through the roof. I mean, Labour has set out clear plans around both that um, and the support that people will need to deal with gas and electricity bills. But I'm, I am absolutely delighted um, for Satvia and the Southampton team. I've been down there a couple of times campaigning. A lot of energy. Um, a brilliant local team and again one of those key target seats that we'll be focusing on next time around. You heard from um, the MP there, the Conservative MP earlier in Southampton Itchen, um, you know we're going to be focusing our efforts in places like that so making progress in Southampton at a council level really puts us in a strong position for the next general election so I'm del really delighted for Satvia. When you see um, Southampton going the way it has, what questions uh, does that raise for you in terms of the strategy that you have going forward, let's say, to the next election, let's say it's two, two years time or whatever it is. What work do you need to do that is clearly not being done right now? Well, I, I don't want to minimise the loss of council seats because losing a council, a good council like Southampton is extremely disappointing. It isn't unexpected to be losing councils at this point in an electoral cycle. Some of these councils like Southampton were very finely balanced. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at Wandsworth, there were 200 votes in it mm -hmm. last time. Some councils like Barnet have been you know, hanging in the balance for some time. And as uh, was said a moment ago, probably only stuck with the Conservative Party last time because of the disgust with anti-Semitism that uh, was rife in parts of the Labour Party at that moment. But I think what the government needs to do now to answer your question is to focus singularly on the cost of living right. and the economy. There's obviously a lot of other issues uh, out there in British politics as ever, but this is the overriding concern of the British public. It's going to be certainly for the whole of this year, probably for a couple of years to come. These are not factors that are all within the control of the government. These are global factors, some of which may be getting worse with continuing geopolitical problems in Ukraine, the lockdown in Shanghai, perhaps exacerbating the international supply chain problems. It's not going to be an easy year or two. The government needs to park other issues which may be important but are not as critical to the public and focus solely on this. I don't think that's easy because there are no simple solutions to this. It's a global problem that every major economy in the world is facing and British politics is no different to European or US politics right now. The public are asking governments to focus on this and try to do what we can to help people through this period. There's been a very substantial package of support already from the Chancellor. He's going to be considering what more he can no. do in August and September time when uh, the energy price cap gets reassessed and we'll be doing a budget in the autumn which may be an opportunity to take further measures. Well, why are you saying maybe an opportunity when you know full well that people are expecting you to take advantage of that opportunity? Well, I think it probably, it probably will help. be at the moment to do that, but he's got to tread extremely carefully because much as though we want to provide support for the most vulnerable in society, we've got to ensure we don't do anything that simply fuels inflation. Mm -hmm. The task here is rather like in the 1970s, it's to take some difficult decisions to get inflation down quickly. You've seen the rise in interest rates from the Bank of England. The big issue now is going to be tackling inflation, ensuring that this is something that passes through the economy. It's not going to pass quickly, but over a couple of years, rather than becomes a 1970s style issue, which lasts for many years to come. I know that's what the Prime Minister will be focusing on. The whole government needs to focus on the cost of living and the economy and how we can get economic growth going across the country again. Um, forgive me, I'm just going to pause for a second. I want to bring in Stephen Hammond, who's the Conservative MP for Wimbledon. Um, good morning, uh, Stephen. How are you? Hi, good morning, Hugh. Uh, I've been a long night at my count, <laughs> with, my council, count uh, with my local council count tonight. Well, what, or in news, the morning, all the way what news do you have? Well, we, um, it's been, we've had a number of very disappointing results in London. We've seen 
wonderful Conservative councillors lose their seats. And in Merton, um, the Conservatives look like they will have lost about uh, nine seats tonight uh, when they finally finish counting. Uh, we had 17. We were the major opposition party. Uh, we won't be that after tonight. And in the next door borough of Wandsworth, which has been a council that has provided good value for, good value for money services and low council tax, um, and has been a shining example to other Conservative councils across the country. As you know, we've lost that this evening. So uh, Conservatives in South West London are in uh, pretty poor heart this morning. Can I ask you about your analysis? You know, you've talked to so many people over the last uh, few weeks, and I'm just wondering uh, if you can help viewers by pinpointing what you think has uh, influenced voters in, in your area. What, how, what would your list uh, contain? Well, I think it would contain two or three things. Um, I, you've just been listening to my colleague, Robert Jenrick, uh, eloquently set out some of the problems that a number of us have heard time after time on the doorstep about uh, the cost of living crisis and the problems of inflation. And I think, uh, particularly also from people in my area, a lot of people who have, have small businesses, what are the Conservatives going to do for growth and growth in the economy? Uh, it is also clear that I'm afraid that the party gate factor has been a large influence on the voting. There was a lot of analysis done prior to these elections saying that you watch for the problems of the Conservative Party in these elections because of low turnout. Actually, what you've seen in a number of my wards tonight is high turnout. And unfortunately, it's uh, angry Tories turning out and voting uh, away from where they would normally do so. Uh, and that ought to be a clarion uh, bell ringing very loudly in number 10 Downing Street uh, to make sure that we are concentrating on uh, the cost of living crisis, make sure we're concentrating on growth in the economy, but also, I think, uh, bringing the widest talents of the uh, Conservative Party back into the government to make sure that we are uh, functioning on all cylinders rather than, le rather than less than all cylinders. You think that there are people who really would be of benefit to Boris Johnson in government who are not there? I mean, any government that doesn't have people like Greg Clark, Jeremy Hunt uh, and, and several others in them uh, clearly isn't using all the talents available to it. Uh, and I would have thought that that ought to be something the Prime Minister ought to be thinking about very carefully, because uh, so far, as, as I understand it, we've seen about half the results or slightly less than half the results in. Uh, and there are a number of disappointments not just in London. London has had a particularly difficult evening, but I understand that we've seen in other parts of the country as well. Um, we've seen some successes, but um, more more disappointments. Uh, and uh, we really need to we really need to concentrate on what is what is causing those uh, disappointments and putting that right very quickly. Uh, can I ask you just bluntly? Do you think that the prime minister's position is secure now or not? Well, I, I, as I say, I think he has to. Uh, prove that his government is concentrating what people really, uh, really want. I think he has to prove his integrity to the country again. And I think, as I say, we need as a Conservative Party to use all our talents. Uh, bear with us, Stephen, if you would. Th thanks. It's good to have you with us. Just bear with us a second. Robert, what's your direct response to that? The fact that there are people in government who possibly are not as good as people who are not in government. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that, you know, Partygate was, uh, as Stephen explains it there, um, you know, a pretty significant factor on the doorstep. Not everyone has said that, it's fair to say, mm -hmm. um, but he's saying it very clearly. So what's the response? Well, I think Stephen's right that the party needs to regain the trust of the electorate, demonstrate that it's competent, and you do that by focusing on the issue that's most important to the public, which is the cost of living and the economy. I know the Prime Minister understands that. That's what the whole government now needs to be focused around. Stephen is right that you've got to have the best possible team, and if that means bringing people in, then that's obviously a decision that the Prime Minister will have to take. I completely understand Stephen's concern because there's been some superb councillors who've lost their seats today. It isn't surprising at this point in an electoral cycle, as, as I've said repeatedly on the programme, I think in many respects you might imagine a more difficult night for the Conservatives than the one we've experienced. But to lose brilliant councils like Wandsworth, it is very disappointing. I mean, the point of comparison there is that in Stephen's local council, Merton, council tax is £900 more than in neighbouring formerly Conservative mm. Wandsworth. So you see the difference that 
uh, the Conservative local councils were providing. The government after this, I think, needs to regroup, focus on the economy and the cost of living and rebuild trust with the public. Stephen, how does that sound as a formula? Well, I think Robert and I are, broad, Robert and I are broadly agreeing that uh, we need to concentrate on what's important to people. We need to restore the trust in us. And Robert's right. And one of the things that really ought to be worrying us is up and down the country, Conservative councils have provided better value for money services, lower council tax, and yet we are losing councillors in a number of them. Robert's right that this is, you know, we are in a midterm He's right that so far this evening, uh, it probably isn't as bad as some of us were fearing it might have been at the very worst end of expectations. But we shouldn't dismiss this as apathy or com uh, and we shouldn't be complacent. We should take this as a warning call from the electorate to actually get back and regain their trust and get onto the issues that really they worry about rather than sometimes one or two of the issues that we as uh, the Conservative Party have become obsessed about. Uh, the trouble is, Stephen, is that, that, that you know, if people just say, well, it's a difficulty for a government that's been there for 12 years and that that should be understood in that context. It, it, it won't be seen as a warning. It won't be seen as a clarion call. So how do you make well, that I, more clear? Well, I don't think I've said that, Hugh, have I? I've made it pretty clear that uh, I accept that we're in the midterm, but it's, there are some fundamental factors in what's causing us to lose seats tonight that mm -hmm. are a bit, a, bit, a, a bit more basic and things that we need as a government to put right so that we govern in the best interests of the country. Leveling up is a noble conservative principle, the principle of offering opportunity, but we need to offer it to the whole country. We can't have left behind London uh, if you want to level up the whole country. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing things for the whole country. And I think that's a message that ought to be coming through as well. Uh, very good of you to join us, Stephen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Stephen Hammond there, the Conservative MP for Wimbledon. If it is a warning call, if it is a, well, clarion call or warning call, whichever way you want to put it, um, will it be heard in Downing Street? People who are critical of the Prime Minister say that he's not a good listener. He doesn't like to be criticised. So if it is a warning from the electorate, will he be listening? Yes, I'm sure he will be. Um, it, look, all governments need to look at their own performance and listen to the voters and much as though you could say this is midterm, uh, you would expect governments to be given a bit of a, a beating. We do need to think carefully about what are the root causes behind this and act accordingly. Um, I think that issues like Partygate are important, but you have to put them in the context of the challenge that people are facing with the economy. And as I said a number of times, mm -hmm. I really do feel that you've got to focus on that. That's the thing that's going to really concern members of the public. You've seen that already with the package of support the government's brought forward. The Prime Minister's directed the Cabinet to focus almost entirely now on how we can ensure that we don't make this more worse for people, no more increases in taxes, uh, no policies that are going to harm people's pocketbooks, and how we can try to get growth going in the economy. It's not an issue that's unique to this country, it's throughout the entire world, from China, the United States, to ourselves. But we want to make sure that the UK get through this. We will do. We get through this as well as we possibly can. There are many things that are going well in the economy. Employment, above all, we're very fortunate that we managed to get through the pandemic without seeing the very high levels of, of unemployment that many people feared. But it's going to be a difficult year, at least, with inflation. And that is the focus now of the government. Uh, many thanks, Robert. Thanks for joining us. I know Thank you've you. got to go and do some other calls now. Um, it's 25 to 6 in the morning. So uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Good Thank to have you, you with us. I don't know what you've done to deserve this, Bridget. You can't go anywhere. <laughs> yes, you are just, you know, you're a prisoner. I just basically. I just love being here. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could believe that. Uh, thank you very much. Stay with us. Robert, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so what I'd like to do now is join Rita again and uh, to see what Rita has in terms of the latest results that have come in with 66 councils now declared out of 146. Rita? Well, I thought it might be a good time to just catch up with some of the key results that we've had overnight. And there has been quite a bit of movement. Uh, perhaps the most notable is the Conservative loss of the London Borough of Wandsworth to Labour. Uh, Wandsworth has been uh, Conservative for over 40 years. It was Margaret Thatcher's favourite council. Well, that is a Labour gain overnight, as is Southampton. 
and Barnet, the uh, London borough of Barnet in North London, uh, although they are still counting there, the Conservative leader in Barnet has conceded on the air that the Conservatives have lost Barnet. Um, more bad news for the Conservatives in Worcester and in West Oxfordshire, where they've lost control of both counts, councils and they are now hung. And in Cumberland, this is a new unitary authority, a shadow authority. So it's actually only going to actually start work in a year's time. But the councillors have been elected. There was a notional Conservative um, the Conservatives were thought to be the largest party in that area, but actually that is a Labour win. And one other notable key result is in Kingston-upon-Hull, which was Labour, and that is a Liberal Democrat gain. So the Lib Dems now have a majority of one in Hull. Um, so this is the scoreboard, the state of the parties. Um, at the moment with 66 of 146 councils in England declared and as you can see the one party that is registering a net loss is the Conservatives on uh, n minus 99 councillors. Uh, Labour is ahead on plus 25 councillors but actually they're overshadowed by the Liberal Democrats who have gained 47 councillors and they're not that far ahead of the Greens who've gained 20 councillors uh, overnight. So we thought we'd have a look in a bit more detail at Labour's performance tonight. It'd be interesting to get Bridget's thoughts on this. Um, just take a look at this. So this is the change in the share of the vote since 2018 and 2018 is when these seats that are being contested tonight were last contested so just look at this part of the screen first of all so this is uh, for England the performance in England overall uh, where Labour's performance is up their share of the vote is up by one percent and the Conservatives as you can see down by four percent Lib Dems up by one percent and the Greens up by four now compare that to the Conservative and Labour marginals, which is where Labour would really like to be picking up support if it wants to get back into power. And there they've slipped slightly, uh, just down by 0.1%. The Conservatives are down more, and that is why Labour is picking up some councillors. But it's simply not doing as well as it wants to, as it would want to, or as it would need to, really. Peter, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to admit to you that I've just had a little bit of croissant. So, and I'm just finishing it, and I'm ashamed to say that, but there you go. It's um, 20 to 6 in the morning, and um, I've got to say that Bridget is still with me, minus a croissant. You've been very disciplined, yes? Very disciplined. I'm just wondering whether Sir John Curtis has been helping himself to French patisserie this no, morning I, I as was, he's chomping through his data. I was just about to say, Hugh, whether you're going to send them up to us because <laughs> we, they're certainly not reached here yet. I shall make a delivery at six o'clock, John. Thank okay? you There's very no much indeed. We shall look forward to it. Um, so now then, at six o'clock, when the world descends on you from other parts of the media to ask you exactly what's gone on overnight, what will you say to them in terms of, first of all, the Conservatives? Well, the Conservatives have suffered more or less the kind of loss of support that we might have anticipated given their current standing in the opinion polls. They are on average around four points down as compared with 2018, which was when most of the seats that we've been declaring overnight were last contested and they're actually down by rather more, by about six points as compared with their performance in last year's um, uh, local elections. And this is probably going to end up looking like one of the weaker Conservative performance performances since the party's been in power uh, since 2010, although not necessarily the worst of all. Um, so let's not forget the Conservatives have lost quite a lot. And in particular, even though we have not yet got quite as many as half of the English councils declared, we already have the Conservatives at or almost at 100 net losses. So it's probably going to be the case that, you know, their tally of net losses is going to be somewhere between two and 300, which was the kind of figure that many commentators suggested would be the kind of ballpark figure they would suffer if indeed um, their current position in the polls was to reflect the local election ballot box. I think it's just that 
uh, you know, as Rita's um, uh, presentation has just shown, this performance doesn't just necessarily produce enormous headlines in terms of councils gained and lost, although, of course, Wandsworth to some degree will make up with that. But that was always going to be the case. If you looked at the psychology of this election, even if Partygate and all the other uh, difficulties facing the Conservative Party were indeed to affect the party in the local ballot boxes in the way we anticipated this was not going to produce lots of Conservative losses for all sorts of boring technical reasons. Labour, what would you say about Labour's performance? I would say that Labour are probably somewhat disappointed. I think they would have want to have clearly registered um, that their vo vote was up on what it was four years ago. Actually, probably marginally, if you just look at those wards where Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrats fought, which as it were are the real litmus test, in those wards Labour very slightly down, doing a bit better in London, probably up a point or so there on 2018, but conversely therefore uh, actually doing a little bit worse uh, outside of London. Yes, Labour has certainly made progress as compared with last year, but last year was a very poor performance. So four points up on last year was not exactly surprising. Um, and I think, you know, the, therefore, this is certainly not a local election performance that in any sense indicates a party that is on course for winning a general election with an overall majority. Indeed, I'm not sure whether we could even say that at this point it's guaranteed or necessarily on course even to be the largest party in the next parliament. There is still an awful lot of work uh, for Labour to do, uh, not least perhaps in more Leave voting England. OK, well, well, we'll put those points to Bridget in a second. Um, uh, the Lib Dems, so we've, we've spoken to quite a few Lib Dems this, uh, this, over the course of the night, including um, Baroness uh, Kramer and others. Um, what would you say about the Lib Dems' performance? Well, the Liberal Democrats can, will certainly be very pleased in that so far, at least, they have picked up more seats than have Labour. Now, part of the reason for this is that their advance has been strongest in some of England's more rural and therefore smaller councils with smaller wards, and that helps to inflate their seat tally bit. But even so... Their vote is up a couple of points on what it was on 2018. Indeed, it's up a couple of points on last year. And it more or less matches what they achieved in the 2019 local elections, which you may remember occurred in the midst of the drama of Theresa May's difficulty in delivering uh, a Brexit. And when just a few weeks after the local elections, the Liberal Democrats came second in the European elections. Now, they don't have that backdrop of the Brexit row to lift their boat this time. So I think they can be pleased that they've made modest progress on you know, what ha one has to be said in 2018 was not, certainly by their historical standards in local elections, a particularly good performance. But you know, they can certainly, I think, say that their modest rise in the opinion polls is confirmed by this um, creditable performance in the local elections. Have they turned a corner? Well. That's difficult to tell, but I think certainly any, anything the Liberal Democrats managed to do to uh, enhance their local government base matters to the party, but they are because they are very dependent on activists to be able to get their message across, given they don't get that much coverage in the national media. Getting more councils is the best way of, all, of achieving activists. Um, and so to that extent, at least, it might help to lay the foundations for the party to make further progress in the course of this parliament. But of course, they're going to have to take up their political opportunities in order to achieve that. Uh, and just as you were speaking there, uh, John, there was uh, on one of the straps uh, a reminder of the gains that uh, the Greens have made in some parts yeah. of England. Um, uh, can, can we have your assessment of their performance? Well, the Greens um, getting 12% of the vote on average where they stood, and that's four points up on where they were in 2018. It's also rather better than what they did last year. It doesn't quite match their performance in 2019, um, which still stands as their best local election performance, at least on the results we've got declared so far. But certainly um, in the Greens, I think, will be pleased with this again. In particular, they've managed to convert gains of votes into gains of seats. 
um, and obviously for a party that's you know trying to begin to try to crack the Westminster Citadel beyond the one seat that Caroline Lucas currently occupies again getting activists getting councils is important um, so again it you know maybe maybe this is a further sign which has been there in the opinion polls that the Greens cannot simply be ignored at the next general election not because perhaps they're going to win much in the way of seats but um, insofar as they tend to fish rather more successfully in remain waters a reminder to both to the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party that their hold on the more remain end of Britain is potentially at some risk because they're going to get a bit of a challenge from the Greens. John, uh, really good to talk to you again. Thank you so much for taking us through the, uh, the four parties there. And um, we'll talk to you again later today, I have absolutely no doubt. But uh, thank you very much. Um, and I have to say, um, Bridget, I was looking at you there when uh, John was talking about Labour. Um, I mean, pretty blunt message, wasn't it? He was saying, yes, there are gains, but, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing. We're not talking about the kind of gains that make it look as if this is a potential general election winning level of support. He said, not even guaranteed to be the largest party in the next parliament on this kind of trend. Uh, I'm just wondering, do, do you either just think he's downplaying success or... Do you think that there's something more in Keir Starmer's tank that will take you, uh, you know, further than John seems to be suggesting? Um, and do you recognise actually that the results you've had overnight are, you know, they're all right, but they're not outstanding? I'm very happy with the results that we've seen so far, and obviously we haven't seen them all yet. I think uh, we had a very good set of results in 2018, um, but when you look at what we secured and the, the losses that we saw in 2019 and also... Uh, in 2021, we're seeing real improvement. And actually in those key battlegrounds for the next general election, we are making gains. Uh, so I think we have turned a corner. This is a turning point for the Labour Party. And I think under Keir Starmer, voters are coming back to us. Uh, they're far warmer in their reception. Of course, you know, we've got more to do and we will set out more closer to the election. But I'm really encouraged with the results that we're seeing this evening and the progress that we've made. And when I think back um, to where we were as a party very recently, um, I think it's remarkable progress. Uh, do you think Labour will get more good news in London, Laura? Well, a Labour source has just told me they're ready to say that they have won Westminster. Now, there was always an expectation that Labour would do well in London. That expectation has been baked in for quite some time. The Conservatives were not expecting to lose Westminster no. Borough. Labour was not expecting to win Westminster Borough. It's where the Prime Minister went off with Dylan the dog to go and vote himself this morning. Of course, it's where MPs like Bridget go to work every day. A Tory council, I think, since 1964. Uh, answers on a postcard if I'm wrong. I'm sure I'll be told on digital postcards within a few seconds. But that is a big result for the Labour Party. No mm. doubt about it. And just remember, yes, as Sir John was explaining, it's not the kind of advance so far that Labour is seeing to be sure of cruising into number 10. Far from it. But it would be if the trajectory continues as we expect it to, the first win a national election in terms of share of the vote for Labour for some years. And that's why we're going to hear Bridget and her colleagues, I think, yeah. again and again, saying this is a turning point. Maybe not a moment of jubilation, but, you know, fair to say that it's a turning point because they haven't won the national share for a long time. Well, Westminster would be quite a, quite a thing to report, wouldn't it? I think we're seeing great progress in London. I'm delighted that we look set to take Westminster. But I think what's really encouraging is we're making that progress in London, but actually we're making that progress across the country in those key battlegrounds too. So we're doing well, you know, right across England in the places where we need to make progress, where we've not been as strong or as competitive in recent years. So I think so far we're seeing a really encouraging set of results. Um, thanks very much. I'm just going to bring in Paula Surridge from Bristol University. Um, Paula, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to ask you how long you've been waiting to talk to us. So please don't tell, please don't tell us, but I'm just going to say to viewers, you've been waiting a long time, okay? And we're very grateful to you. You've shown a lot of, uh, a lot of patience. Um, first of all, um, le let's have your thoughts on where this election l leaves us so far. I mean, we've got lots to come. Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland, lots more English authorities as well. We've had 68 local authorities in uh, over England overnight uh, out of 146. So we're roughly kind of halfway. Um, what is the story so far for you? 
Well, I'll, I'll come to the story in a minute. I just want to make one kind of caveat on everything I say, and I think on everything that's that's been said so far through the evening. And that is in some places we're seeing very, very low turnout in these elections. You don't see it on, on most of the results as they come in, but, but one or two have shown turnout below one in five voters. So when we're starting to talk about the messages the electorate are sending, we might need to just be a little bit careful in that because most of the electorate haven't actually voted. But putting that to one side and looking at the results that we've got, I think what we're seeing is this kind of battle between the long-term restructuring around demographics, which um, the gentleman, no, the lady from Southampton was talking about, where we've seen this kind of change in demographics where those are more highly educated have, have turned to labor over time. And against that, we're seeing the kind of political weather, the, the cost of living crisis and the party gate um, issue battling against that. Now, in 2019, the, the political weather was moving in the same direction as that restructuring in that we want people wanted to get Brexit done. And um, there was a, a, an unpopular uh, Labour Party leader. And now we've got the political weather moving alongside it to a certain extent around the cost of living crisis and an unpopular Conservative leader. So I think that's what we're seeing play out. And obviously you get that in little stories in different places, um, Labour making some progress in some areas, but falling back in others as those two factors sort of battle it out um, within within the vote. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, th th thanks for that overview. And the caveats obviously are um, are important, in including the one on the on the turnout. Um, one thing, because you're in Gloucester, aren't you? And I, I'm just I know that you work at Bristol University. Um, there was that referendum uh, on the mayor, whether whether people in Bristol wanted to carry on with an elected mayor. Now, as I understand it, they voted against. Is that right? As, as I understand it as well. Yeah, obviously, I've only seen the, um, the kind of news coverage come in on that. But yeah, as I understand it with a a not desperately bad turnout. Yeah, they voted to um, scrap the city mayor and have decisions taken by more of a committee structure. Does that surprise you? Um, <laughs> people in Bristol do like committees, so so I don't think I think they like that more shared idea of democracy. It might be a better way of putting it. So no, I don't think it it necessarily surprises me. Although it does cut against some of the trends towards having more mayors in places so i think there's something there will be something interesting to unpack there um in the longer term about what local democracy means to people in the context of of devolution and leveling up uh paula it's good to talk to you and once again my apologies for keeping you waiting but uh you came on with a smile which we appreciate thanks very much indeed <laughs> Uh, Thank you. Paula Surridge there from Bristol University. Thanks, Paula. Uh, Katie Balls also waiting to talk to us, um, Deputy Political Editor of The Spectator. Katie, a very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've been discussing, um, uh, certainly, where this leaves Boris Johnson and the Conservatives, because there's been quite a bit of argument about, um, you know, the, the level of support for the Tories, not just in London, but elsewhere, uh, and what these results in London tell us as well about the, uh, the state of the Conservative Party. Um, what's your reading of things at, uh, at, at this time, given that I readily accept that we've got more than 70 councils to declare in England? Yes, as you say, we don't have the full picture yet, but we do know a few things, and that is that it's looking very grim for the Tories in London. Um, the Tories very downbeat about Westminster Council. I think if you also look at West Oxfordshire, it used to be Cameron's uh, you know, backyard, the fact the Tories have lost control there, I think that spells trouble and will raise concerns about the blue wall. And yes, the Tories have been trying to set very you know, low expectations, talking about 800 seat losses. No one believed that. And I think that at the very least, what these results are going to do is divide the party when it comes to that north-south divide and raise concerns that Boris Johnson is not doing enough when it comes to the threat of the Lib Dems and also in terms of cities um, such as London. What would be the response of the parliamentary party and is he going to come under more pressure? I think it's inevitable Boris Johnson will come under more pressure. I think the question is, is this the trigger? And we have seen time and time again that Tory MPs often talk about deposing the Prime Minister, but tend to find reasons to, de to delay that. Um, I think that if you look at those uh, Tory MPs who are already quite concerned, those who have Lib Dems as the second uh, you know, party in their seat, I think this is just going to add to their worries about Boris Johnson. And not just Boris Johnson, the leader, but also I think the current direction in number 10, which uh, they see with you know, policies such as the Rwanda policy, 
policy, uh, privatisation of Channel 4 as moving away from their demographic and obviously Partygate not helping there too. Um, and the hope in CCHQ is really there'd be enough in terms of the red wall to say, yes, we might be doing badly in these areas, but that realignment of politics is still happening. Now, there are some things to point to, but it's still a little bit of a mixed picture. I think the, the best hope is to say that ultimately Keir Starmer is not inspiring huge enthusiasm. And I think that's what um, they'll be trying to say to Tory MPs to say, you know, hang on in there. We'll, uh, we'll be talking a lot more about those themes as the day goes on, uh, Katie. Thanks very much. Katie Balls there, the Deputy Political Editor of The Spectator. Uh, we will be off air in just a few minutes, but uh, you'll be staying with us hopefully for BBC Breakfast uh, with Charlie and with Victoria. So before we go, let's join Rita once again for a quick update on where we are just at the end of this section of the broadcast. Rita? This is the state of play at the moment, with nearly half the councils declared. You can see that Labour has gained 29 councillors. The Conservatives have lost 108. The, the Liberal Democrats have had a healthy uh, night of it, although admittedly from a considerably lower base than Labour, but they've gained 53 councillors and the Greens have gained 19. And that's 19 of those, uh, 33 councillors in all, 19 of those tonight. What does that mean in terms of councils? Well, there you have it. Labour has uh, gained control of one council. The Conservatives have lost four, two of those in London. And uh, we know that there is more to come in London if what we're hearing from Westminster is correct. Uh, Rita, I'll see you uh, in a few hours' time. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for your company overnight. Uh, Rita and the team there with the, uh, the more detailed results. Um, uh, Bridget, in, I'm going to be very unfair and say to you, uh, in 20 seconds, uh, as we finish this broadcast, where are you on Labour's performance so far? A really strong set of results, making progress in the areas we need to for the next general election. I think a real turning point. People are looking at Labour, they're coming back to us, um, and real progress under Keir Starmer. So a turning point for us tonight, and hopefully more to come uh, as the night goes on. You think people will look back at this and think, well, that was the time things changed? I do. And when you consider where we've been as a party and where we are now, I think we've made big progress. But there's more to come, a lot more to do. We totally recognise that. Um, but I think, you know, we can be uh, satisfied with the results and, and happy with the results we've seen so far. Thanks for being with us, Bridget. Thanks very much indeed. And Laura, thank you for your company as well. Um, we'll see you a bit later on. Well, Thanks very much indeed. Cheers. Um, Joe Coburn will be here at nine on BBC Two and on the news channel. BBC Breakfast follows. But uh, from all of the team here, goodbye.